This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ana Sofia Simão de Portugal. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 43 The House at Otwill. Monte Cristo noticed, as they descended the staircase, that Petrucius signed himself in a Corsican manner that is, had formed the sign of the cross in the air with his thumb, and, as he seated himself in the carriage, muttered a short prayer. Anyone but a man, of exhaustless thirst for knowledge, would have had pity on seeing the steward's extraordinary repugnance for the Count's projected drive without the walls. But the Count was too curious to let Petruchio off from this little journey. In twenty minutes they were at Artwell. The steward's emotion had continued to augment as they entered the village. Rotuchu, crossed in the corner of the carriage, began to examine with a feverish anxiety every house they passed. Tell them to stop at Rue de la Fontaine, number 28, said the Count, fixing his eyes on the steward, to whom he gave this order. Rotuchu's forehead was covered with perspiration. However, he obeyed, and, leaning out of the window, he cried to the coachman, Rue de la Fontaine, number 28. Number 28 was situated at the extremity of the village. During the drive, night had set in, and darkness gave the surroundings the artificial appearance of a scene on the stage. The carriage stopped, the footman sprang off the box and opened the door. Well, said the Count, you do not get out, Monsieur Bertuccio? You are going to stay in the carriage, then? What are you thinking of this evening? Bertuccio sprang out and offered his shoulder to the Count, who, this time, leaned upon it as he descended the three steps of the carriage. Knock, said the Count, and announced me. Bertuccio knocked, the door opened, and the concierge appeared. What is it? asked he. It is your new master, my good fellow, said the footman, and he held out to the concierge to note the disorder. The house is sold, then? demanded the concierge. And this gentleman is coming to live here? Yes, my friend, returned the Count, and I will endeavor to give you no cause to regret your old master. Oh, monsieur, said the concierge, I shall not have much cause to regret him, for he came here but seldom. It is five years since he was here last, and he did well to sell the house, for it did not bring him in anything at all. What was the name of your old master? said Monte Cristo. The Marquis of Saint Merin. Ah, I'm sure he has not sold the house for what he gave for it. The Marquis of Saint Merin, returned the Count. The name is not unknown to me. The Marquis of Saint Merin. And he appeared to meditate. An old gentleman, continued the concierge, a stanch follower of the Bourbons. He had an only daughter who married Monsieur de Villefort, who had been the king's attorney at Nîmes and afterwards at Versailles. Monte Cristo glanced at Petruccio, who became wider than the wall against which he leaned to prevent himself from falling. And is not this daughter dead? demanded Monte Cristo. I fancy I have heard so. Yes, monsieur, one and twenty years ago, and since then we have not seen the poor Marquis three times. Thanks, thanks said Monte Cristo, judging from the steward's utter prostration that he could not stress the cord further without danger of breaking it. Give me a light. Shall I accompany you, monsieur? No, it is unnecessary. Patricia will show me a light. And Monte Cristo accompanied these words by the gift of two gold pieces, which produced a torrent of thanks and blessings from the concierge. Ah, monsieur! said he, after having vainly searched on the mantelpiece and the shelves. I have not got any candles. Take one of the carriage lamps, Bertuccio, said the Count, and show me the apartments. The steward obeyed in silence, but it was easy to see, from the manner in which the hand that held the lights trembled, how much it cost him to obey. They went over a tolerably large ground floor. A second floor consisted of a salon, a bathroom and two bedrooms. Near one of the bedrooms they came to a winding staircase that led down to the garden. Ah, here is a private staircase, said the Count. That is convenient. 
Light me, Monsieur Bertuccio, and go first. We will see where it leads to. Monsieur, replied Bertuccio, it leads to the garden. And pray, how do you know that? It ought to do so, at least. Well, let us be sure of that. Bertuccio sighed it, and went on first. The stairs did, indeed, lead to the garden. At the outer door, the steward paused. Go on, Monsieur Bertuccio, said the Count. But he was at rest, stood there, stupefied, bewildered, stunned. His eager eyes glanced around, as if in search of the traces of some terrible event, and with his clenched hands he seemed striving to shut out horrible recollections. Well, insisted the Count. No, no, cried Bertuccio, setting down the lantern at the angle of the interior wall. No, monsieur, it is impossible. I can go no further. What does this mean? demanded the irresistible voice of Monte Cristo. Why, you must see, your excellency, cried the steward, that this is not natural, that, having a house to purchase, you purchase it exactly at odd will, and that, purchasing it at odd will, this house should be number 28, Rue de la Fontaine. Oh, why did I not tell you all? I am sure you would not have forced me to come. I hoped your house would have been some other one than this, as if there was not another house at Otwill than that of the assassination. What? What? cried Monte Cristo, stopping suddenly. What words do you utter? Devil of a man, Corsican that you are, always mysteries or superstitions. Come, take the lantern and let us visit the garden. You are not afraid of ghosts with me, I hope. Bertuccio raised the lantern and obeyed. The door, as it opened, disclosed a gloomy sky, in which the moon strove vainly to struggle through a sea of clouds that covered her with billows of vapor, which she illuminated for an instant, only to sink into obscurity. The steward wished to turn to the left. No, no, monsieur, said Monte Cristo. What is the use of following the alleys? Here is a beautiful lawn. Let us go on straight forwards. Bertuccio wiped the perspiration from his brow, but obeyed. However, he continued to take the left hand. Monte Cristo, on the contrary, took the right hand. Arrived near a clump of trees, he stopped. The steward could not restrain himself. Move, monsieur. Move away, I entreat you. You are exactly in the spot. What spot? Where he fell. My dear monsieur Bertuccio, said Monte Cristo laughing. Control yourself. We are not at Sardinia or at court. This is not the Corsican armor, but an English garden. Badly kept, I own, but still you must not calumniate it for that. Monsieur, I implore you do not stay there. I think you are going mad, Bertuccio, said the Count coldly. If that is the case, I warn you, I shall have you put in a lunatic asylum. Ailes, Excellency returned Bustuccio, joining his hands and shaking his head in a manner that would have excited the Count's laughter had not thought of the superior interest occupied him and rendering him attentive to the least revelation of this timorous conscience. Ailes, Excellency, the evil has arrived. Monsieur Bertuccio, said the Count, I am very glad to tell you that, while you gesticulate, you wring your hands and roll your eyes like a man possessed by a devil who will not leave him. And I have always observed that the devil most obstinate to be expelled is a secret. I knew you were a Corsican, I knew you were gloomy and always brooding over some old history of the vendetta. And I overlooked that in Italy, because in Italy those things are thought nothing of. But in France they are considered in very bad taste. There are gendarmes who occupy themselves to such affairs, judges who condemn, and careful to with avenge. Bertuccio clasped his hands, and as, in all these evolutions, he did not let fall the lantern, the light showed his pale and altered countenance. Monte Cristo examined him with the same look that, at Rome, he had bent upon the execution of Andrea, and then, in a tone that made a shudder pass through the veins of the poor steward, the Abbe Bozzoni, then told me an untruth, said he, 
when, after a journey in France in 1829, he sent you to me with a letter of recommendation, in which he enumerated all your valuable qualities. Well, I shall write to the Abbey. I shall hold him responsible for his protégé's misconduct, and I shall soon know all about his assassination. Only I warn you that when I reside in a country, I conform to all its code, and I have no wish to put myself within the compass of the French laws for your sake. Oh, do not do that, Excellency. I have always served you faithfully, cried Bertuccio in despair. I have always been an honest man, and, as far as lay in my power, I have done good. I do not deny it, returned the Count. But why are you thus agitated? It is a bad sign. A quiet conscience does not occasion such paleness in the cheeks, and such fever in the hands of a man. But, Your Excellency, replied Bertuccio hesitantly. Did not the Abbe Buzzoni, who heard my confession in the prison at Nimes, tell you that I had a heavy burden upon my conscience? Yes, but as he said you would make an excellent steward, I concluded you had stolen. That was all. Oh, your excellency, returned Bertuccio in deep content. Or, as you are a Corsican, that you had been unable to resist the desire of making a stiff as you call it. Yes, my good master, cried Bertuccio, casting himself at the Count's feet. It was simply vengeance, nothing else. I understand that, but I do not understand what it is that galvanizes you in this manner. But, monsieur, it is very natural, returned Bertuccio, since it was in this house that my vengeance was accomplished. What? My house? Oh, your excellency, it was not yours, then. Whose, then? The Marquis de saint Miran, I think, the Corsiage said. What had it revenge on the Marquis de saint Miran? Oh, it was not on him, monsieur. It was on another. This is strange, returned the Count, seeming to yield to his reflections, that you should find yourself without any preparation in a house where the event happened that causes you so much remorse. Monsieur, said Stuart, it is fatality, I am sure. First, you purchase a house at Otwill. This house is the one where I have committed an assassination. You descend to the garden by the same staircase by which he descended. You stop at the spot where he received the blow, and two paces further is the grave in which he had just buried this child. This is not chance, for chance in this case is too much like providence. Well, amiable Corsican, let us suppose it is providence. I always suppose anything people please, and besides, you must concede something to diseased minds. Come, collect yourself and tell me all. I have related it but once, and that was to the Abbey Pozzoni. Such things, continued Bertuccio, shaking his head, are only related under the seal of confession. Then, said the Count, I refer you to your confessor. Turn chartreuse or trappist and relate your secrets, but, as for me, I do not like anyone who is alarmed by such phantasms and I do not choose that my servant should be afraid to walk in the garden of an evening. I confess I am not very desirous of a visit from the commissary of police, for in Italy justice is only paid when silent. In France she is paid only when she speaks. Peste, I thought you somewhat Corsican, a great deal smuggler and an excellent steward, but I see you have other strings to your bow. You are no longer at my service, Monsieur Bertuccio. Oh, your excellency, your excellency, cried the steward, struck a terror at this threat. If that is only reason I cannot remain in your service, I will tell all, for if I quit you, it will only be to go to the scaffold. That is different, replied Monte Cristo. But if you intend to tell an untruth, reflect it were better not to speak at all. No, monsieur, I swear to you, by my hopes of salvation, I will tell you all, for the Abbe Buzoni himself only knew a part of my secret. But, I pray you, go away from that plane tree. The moon is just bursting through the clouds, and there, standing where you do, and wrapped in that cloak that conceals your figure, you remind me of Monsieur de Villefort. What? cried Monte Cristo. It was Monsieur de Villefort? 
Your Excellency knows him? The former royal attorney at Nimes. Yes. Who married Marquis of saint Meran's daughter? Yes. Who enjoyed the reputation of being the most severe, the most upright, the most rigid magistrate on the bench. Well, monsieur, said Bertuccio, this man with his spotless reputation, well, was a villain. Bah, replied Monte Cristo, impossible. It is as I tell you. Ah, really, said Monte Cristo, have you proof of this? I had it. And you have lost it. How stupid. Yes, but by careful search it might be recovered. Really, returned the Count, relate it to me, for it begins to interest me. And the Count, humming an air from Lucia, went to sit down on a bench, while Bertuccio followed him, collecting his thoughts. Bertuccio remained standing before him. End of chapter 43「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruth Golding. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 43. The House at Auteuil. Monte Cristo noticed, as they descended the staircase, that Bertuccio signed himself in the Corsican manner, that is, had formed the sign of the cross in the air with his thumb, and, as he seated himself in the carriage, muttered a short prayer. Any one but a man of exhaustless thirst for knowledge would have had pity on seeing the steward's extraordinary repugnance for the Count's projected drive without the walls, but the Count was too curious to let Bertuccio off from this little journey. In twenty minutes they were at Auteuil. The steward's emotion had continued to augment as they entered the village. Bertuccio, crouched in the corner of the carriage, began to examine with a feverish anxiety every house they passed. "'Tell them to stop at Rue de la Fontaine, number twenty-eight said the Count, fixing his eyes on the steward to whom he gave this order. Bertuccio's forehead was covered with perspiration. However, he obeyed, and, leaning out of the window, he cried to the coachman, Rue de la Fontaine, number 28. Number 28 was situated at the extremity of the village. During the drive, night had set in and darkness gave the surroundings the artificial appearance of a scene on the stage. The carriage stopped. The footman sprang off the box and opened the door. Well, said the Count, you do not get out, Monsieur Bertuccio. You are going to stay in the carriage, then? What are you thinking of this evening? Bertuccio sprang out and offered his shoulder to the Count, who this time leaned upon it as he descended the three steps of the carriage. Knock, said the Count, and announce me. Bertuccio knocked, the door opened, and the concierge appeared. What is it? asked he. It is your new master, my good fellow, said the footman, and he held out to the concierge the notary's order. The house is sold, then? demanded the concierge. And this gentleman is coming to live here? Yes, my friend, returned the Count, and I will endeavour to give you no cause to regret your old master. Oh, monsieur, said the concierge, I shall not have much cause to regret him, for he came here but seldom. It is five years since he was here last, and he did well to sell the house, for it did not bring him in anything at all. "'What was the name of your old master?' said Monte Cristo. "'The Marquis of saint Meran. "'Ah, I am sure he has not sold the house for what he gave for it.' "'The Marquis of saint Meran, returned the Count. 
the name is not unknown to me the marquis of st meran and he appeared to meditate an old gentleman continued the concierge a staunch follower of the bourbons he had an only daughter who married monsieur de villefort who had been the king's attorney at nimes and afterwards at versailles monte cristo glanced at bertuccio who became whiter than the wall against which he leaned to prevent himself from falling and is not this daughter dead demanded monte cristo i fancy i have heard so yes monsieur one and twenty years ago and since then we have not seen the poor marquis three times thanks thanks said monte cristo judging from the steward's utter prostration that he could not stretch the cord further without danger of breaking it give me a light shall i accompany you monsieur no it is unnecessary bertuccio will show me a light and monte cristo accompanied these words by the gift of two gold pieces which produced a torrent of thanks and blessings from the concierge ah monsieur said he after having vainly searched on the mantelpiece and the shelves i have not got any candles take one of the carriage lamps bertuccio said the count and show me the apartments the steward obeyed in silence but it was easy to see from the manner in which the hand that held the light trembled how much it cost him to obey they went over a tolerably large ground floor a second floor consisted of a salon a bathroom and two bedrooms near one of the bedrooms they came to a winding staircase that led down to the garden ah here is a private staircase said the count that is convenient light me monsieur bertuccio and go first we will see where it leads to monsieur replied bertuccio it leads to the garden and pray how do you know that it ought to do so at least well let us be sure of that bertuccio sighed and went on first the stairs did indeed lead to the garden at the outer door the steward paused go on monsieur bertuccio said the count but he who was addressed stood there stupefied bewildered stunned his haggard eyes glanced around as if in search of the traces of some terrible event and with his clinched hands he seemed striving to shut out horrible recollections. Well, insisted the Count. No, no, cried Bertuccio, setting down the lantern at the angle of the interior wall. No, monsieur, it is impossible. I can go no farther. What does this mean? demanded the irresistible voice of Monte Cristo. Why, you must see, Your Excellency, cried the steward that this is not natural, that having a house to purchase, you purchase it exactly at Auteuil, and that purchasing it at Auteuil, this house should be number 28, Rue de la Fontaine. Oh, why did I not tell you all? I am sure you would not have forced me to come. I hoped your house would have been some other one than this, as if there was not another house at Auteuil than that of the assassination what what cried monte cristo stopping suddenly what words do you utter devil of a man corsican that you are always mysteries or superstitions come take the lantern and let us visit the garden you are not afraid of ghosts with me i hope bertuccio raised the lantern and obeyed the door as it opened disclosed a gloomy sky in which the moon strove vainly to struggle through a sea of clouds that covered her with billows of vapour which she illumined for an instant only to sink into obscurity the steward wished to turn to the left no no monsieur said monte cristo what is the use of following the alleys 
here is a beautiful lawn let us go on straight forwards bertuccio wiped the perspiration from his brow but obeyed however he continued to take the left hand monte cristo on the contrary took the right hand arrived near a clump of trees he stopped the steward could not restrain himself move monsieur move away i entreat you you are exactly in the spot what spot where he fell my dear monsieur bertuccio said monte cristo laughing control yourself we are not at sartena or at corte this is not a corsican arbor but an english garden badly kept i own but still you must not calumniate it for that monsieur i implore you do not stay there i think you are going mad bertuccio said the count coldly if that is the case i warn you i shall have you put in a lunatic asylum alas excellency returned bertuccio joining his hands and shaking his head in a manner that would have excited the count's laughter had not thoughts of a superior interest occupied him and rendered him attentive to the least revelation of this timorous conscience alas excellency the evil has arrived monsieur bertuccio said the count i am very glad to tell you that while you gesticulate you wring your hands and roll your eyes like a man possessed by a devil who will not leave him and i have always observed that the devil most obstinate to be expelled is a secret i knew you were a corsican i knew you were gloomy and always brooding over some old history of the vendetta and i overlooked that in italy because in italy those things are thought nothing of but in france they are considered in very bad taste there are gendarmes who occupy themselves with such affairs judges who condemn and scaffolds which avenge bertuccio clasped his hands and as in all these evolutions he did not let fall the lantern the light showed his pale and altered countenance monte cristo examined him with the same look that at rome he had bent upon the execution of andrea and then in a tone that made a shudder pass through the veins of the poor steward the abbe busoni then told me an untruth said he when after his journey in france in eighteen twenty nine he sent you to me with a letter of recommendation in which he enumerated all your valuable qualities well i shall write to the abbe i shall hold him responsible for his protege's misconduct and i shall soon know all about this assassination only i warn you that when i reside in a country i conform to all its code and i have no wish to put myself within the compass of the french laws for your sake oh do not do that excellency i have always served you faithfully cried bertuccio in despair i have always been an honest man and as far as lay in my power i have done good i do not deny it returned the count but why are you thus agitated it is a bad sign a quiet conscience does not occasion such paleness in the cheeks and such fever in the hands of a man but your excellency replied bertuccio hesitatingly did not the abbe busoni who heard my confession in the prison at nimes tell you that i had a heavy burden upon my conscience yes but as he said you would make an excellent steward i concluded you had stolen that was all oh your excellency returned bertuccio in deep contempt or as you are a corsican that you had been unable to resist the desire of making a stiff as you call it 
"'Yes, my good master,' cried Bertuccio, casting himself at the Count's feet. "'It was simply vengeance, nothing else.' "'I understand that, but I do not understand what it is that galvanizes you in this manner.' "'But, monsieur, it is very natural,' returned Bertuccio, "'since it was in this house that my vengeance was accomplished.' "'What?' my house oh your excellency it was not yours then whose then the marquis de saint meran i think the concierge said what had you to revenge on the marquis de saint meran oh it was not on him monsieur it was on another this is strange returned monte cristo seeming to yield to his reflections that you should find yourself without any preparation in a house where the event happened that causes you so much remorse monsieur said the steward it is fatality i am sure first you purchase a house at auteuil this house is the one where i have committed an assassination you descend to the garden by the same staircase by which he descended you stop at the spot where he received the blow, and two paces farther is the grave in which he had just buried his child. This is not chance, for chance in this case is too much like providence. Well, amiable Corsican, let us suppose it is providence. I always suppose anything people please and besides you must concede something to diseased minds come collect yourself and tell me all i have related it but once and that was to the abbe busoni such things continued bertuccio shaking his head are only related under the seal of confession then said the count i refer you to your confessor turn chartreux or trappist and relate your secrets but as for me i do not like any one who is alarmed by such phantasms and i do not choose that my servants should be afraid to walk in the garden of an evening i confess i am not very desirous of a visit from the commissary of police for in italy justice is only paid when silent in france she is paid only when she speaks pest i thought you somewhat corsican a great deal smuggler and an excellent steward but i see you have other strings to your bow you are no longer in my service monsieur bertuccio oh your excellency your excellency cried the steward struck with terror at this threat if that is the only reason i cannot remain in your service i will tell all for if i quit you it will only be to go to the scaffold that is different replied monte cristo but if you intend to tell an untruth reflect it were better not to speak at all no monsieur i swear to you by my hopes of salvation i will tell you all for the abbe busoni himself only knew a part of my secret but i pray you go away from that plane tree the moon is just bursting through the clouds and there standing where you do and wrapped in that cloak that conceals your figure you remind me of monsieur de villefort what cried monte cristo it was monsieur de villefort your excellency knows him the former royal attorney at nîmes yes who married the marquis de saint Meron's daughter yes who enjoyed the reputation of being the most severe the most upright the most rigid magistrate on the bench well monsieur said bertuccio this man with this spotless reputation well was a villain bah replied monte cristo impossible it is as i tell you 
Ah, really, said Monte Cristo. Have you proof of this? I had it. And you have lost it. How stupid. Yes, but by careful search it might be recovered. Really, returned the Count. Relate it to me, for it begins to interest me. And the Count, humming an air from Lucia, went to sit down on a bench, while Bertuccio followed him, collecting his thoughts. Bertuccio remained standing before him. End of chapter 43「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ana Sofia Simão de Portugal. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 44. The Vendetta. At what point shall I begin my story, Your Excellency? asked Bertuccio. Where you please, returned Monte Cristo. Since I know nothing at all of it, I thought that Evi Bosoni had told your excellency some particulars, doubtless, but that is seven or eight years ago, and I have forgotten them. Then I can speak without fear of charring your excellency. Go on, Bertuccio. You will supply the want of the evening papers. The story begins in eighteen fifteen. Ah, said Monte Cristo. 1815 is not yesterday. No, monsieur, and yet I recollect all things as clearly as if they had happened but then. I had a brother, an elder brother, who was in service of the emperor. He had become lieutenant in a regiment composed entirely of Corsicans. This brother was my only friend. We became orphans, I at five, he at eighteen. He brought me up as if I had been his son, and in 1814 he married. When the emperor returned from the island of Elba, my brother instantly joined the army, was slightly wounded at Waterloo, and retired with the army behind the lawyer. But that is the history of the Hundred Days, Monsieur Pertuccio, said the Count. Unless I am mistaken, it has been already written. Excuse me, Excellency, but these details are necessary, and you promise to be patient. Go on, I'll keep my word. One day we received a letter. I should tell you that we lived in the little village of Rogliano, at the extremity of Cape Corso. This letter was for my brother. He told us that the army was disbanded, and that he should return by Chateaurox, Clermont Ferrand, Le Puy, and Nimes. And, if I had any money, he prayed me to leave it for him at Nimes, with an innkeeper with whom I had dealings. In the smuggling line? said Monte Cristo. Hey, Your Excellency, everyone must live. Certainly. Go on. I loved my brother tenderly, as I told Your Excellency, and I resolved not to send money, but to take it to him myself. I possess a thousand francs. I left five hundred with Assunta, my sister-in-law, and with the other five hundred I set off for Nimes. It was easy to do so, and as I had my boat and the landing to take it and see, everything favored my project. But, after we had taken in our cargo, the wind became contrary, so that we were four or five days without being able to enter the Rhone. At last, however, we succeeded and worked up to Arles. I left the boat between the Bellegarde and Beaucaire and took the road to Nimes. We are getting to the story now. Yes, Your Excellency. Excuse me, but... As you'll see, I only tell you what is absolutely necessary. Just at this time, the famous massacres took place in south of France. Three brigands, called Dresdelon, Trophemy and Graffin, publicly assassinated everybody whom they suspected of Bonapartism. You have doubtless heard of these massacres, Your Excellency. Vaguely, I was far from France at that period. Go on. As I entered Nimes, I literally waded in blood. At every step you encountered dead bodies and bands of murderers, who killed, plundered, and burned. At sight of this slaughter and devastation, I became terrified, not for myself, for I, a simple Corsican fisherman, have nothing to fear, 
On the contrary, that time was most favorable for us smugglers. But for my brother, a soldier of the Empire, returning from the army of the lawyer, with his uniform and his epaulets, there was everything to apprehend. I hastened to the innkeeper. My misgivings had been but too true. My brother had arrived the previous evening at Nîmes, and, at the very door of the house where he was about to demand hospitality, he had been assassinated. I did all in my power to discover the murderers, but no one durst tell me their names, so much were they dreaded. I then thought of that French justice of which I had heard so much, and which feared nothing, and I went to the king's attorney. And this king's attorney was named Villefort asked Monte Cristo carelessly. Yes, Your Excellency. He came from Marseilles, where he had been deputy procureur. His zeal had procured him advancement, and he was said to be one of the first who had informed the government of the departure from the island of Elba. Then, said Monte Cristo, you went to him. Monsieur, I said, my brother was assassinated yesterday in the streets of Nîmes, I know not by whom, but it is your duty to find out. You are the representative of justice here, and it is for justice to avenge those she has been unable to protect. Who was your brother? asked he. A lieutenant in the Corsican battalion. A soldier of the usurper, then. A soldier of the French army. Well, replied he, he has smitten with the sword, and he has perished by the sword. You are mistaken, monsieur, I replied. He has perished by the poniard. What do you want me to do? asked the magistrate. I have already told you. Avenge him. On whom? On his murderers. How should I know who they are? Order them to be sought for. Why, your brother has been involved in a quarrel and killed in a duel. All these old soldiers commit excesses which were tolerated in the time of the Emperor, but which are not suffered now, for the people here do not like soldiers of such disorderly conduct. Monsieur, I replied, it is not for myself that I entreat your interference. I should grieve for him or avenge him, but my poor brother had a wife, and were anything to happen to me, the poor creature would perish from want, for my brother's pay alone kept her. Pray, try and obtain a small government pension for her. Every revolution has its catastrophes, returned Monsieur de Villefort. Your brother has been the victim of this. It is a misfortune, and government owes nothing to his family. If we are to judge by all the vengeance that followers of the usurper exercise on the partisans of the king, when, in their turn, they were in power, your brother would be today, in all probability, condemned to death. What has happened is quite natural, and in conformity with law of reprisals. What? cried I. Do you, a magistrate, speak thus to me? All these Corsicans are mad, on my honor, replied Monsieur de Villefort. They fancy that their countryman is still emperor. You have mistaken the time. You should have told me this two months ago. It is too late now. Go now at once, or I shall have you put out. I looked at him an instant to see if there was anything to hope from further entreaty. But he was a man of stone. I approached him and said in a low voice, Well, since you know the Corsican so well, you know that they always keep their word. You think that this was a good deed to kill my brother, who was a Bonapartist, because you are a royalist. Well, I, who am a Bonapartist also, declare one thing to you, which is, that I will kill you. From this moment I declare the vendetta against you, so protect yourself as well as you can, for the next time we meet, your last hour has come. And before he had recovered from his surprise, I opened the door and left the room. Well, well, said Monte Cristo. Such an innocent-looking person as you are to do those things, Monsieur Bertuccio, and to a king's attorney at that. But did he know what was meant by the terrible word vendetta? He knew so well that from that moment he shut himself in his house and never went out unattended, seeking me high and low. Fortunately, I was so well concealed that he could not find me. Then he became alarmed 
and dare not stay any longer at Nimes, so he solicited a change of residence, and, as he was in reality very influential, he was nominated to Versailles. But, as you know, a Corsican who has sworn to avenge himself cares not for distance, so his carriage, fast as it went, was never above half a day's journey before me, who followed him on foot. The most important thing was not to kill him only, for I had an opportunity of doing so a hundred times, but to kill him without being discovered, at least without being arrested. I no longer belonged to myself, for I had my sister-in-law to protect and provide for. For three months I watched Monsieur de Villefort, for three months he took not a step out of doors without my following him. At length I discovered that he went mysterious to what you will. I followed him thither, and I saw him enter the house where we now are, only, instead of entering by the great door that looks into the street, he came on horseback, or in his carriage, left one or the other at little inn, and entered by the gate you see there. Monte Cristo made a sign with his head to show that he could discern in the darkness the door to which Bertuccio alluded. As I had nothing more to do with Versailles, I went to what you will, and gained all the information I could. If I wished to surprise him, it was evident it was the spot to lie in wait for him. The house belonged, as the concierge informed you, Excellency, to Monsieur de saint Merin, Villefort's father-in-law. Monsieur de saint Merin lived at Marseilles, so that this country house was useless to him, and it was reported to be led to a young widow, known only by the name of the Baroness. One evening, as I was looking over the wall, I saw a young and handsome woman who was walking alone in the garden, which was not overlooked by any windows, and I guessed that she was awaiting Monsieur de Villefort. When she was sufficiently near for me to distinguish her features, I saw she was from eighteen to nineteen, tall and very fair. As she had the loose muslin dress on, and as nothing concealed her figure, I saw she would here long before become a mother. A few moments after, the little door was opened and a man entered. The young woman hastened to meet him. They drew themselves into each other's arms, embraced tenderly, and returned together to the house. The man was Monsieur de Villefort. I fully believed that when he went out in the night he would be forced to traverse the whole of the garden alone. And, asked the Count, did you ever know the name of this woman? No, Excellency, returned Bertuccio. You will see that I had no time to learn it. Go on. That evening, continued Bertuccio, I could have killed the procureur, but as I was not sufficiently acquainted with the neighborhood, I was fearful of not killing him on the spot, and that if his cries were overheard, I might be taken. So I put it off until the next occasion, and in order that nothing should escape me, I took a chamber looking into the street border by the wall of the garden. Three days after, about seven o'clock in the evening, I saw a servant on horseback leave the house at full gallop and take the road to Sèvres. I concluded that he was going to Versailles, and I was not deceived. Three hours later, the man returned covered with dust, his errand was performed, and two minutes after, another man on foot, muffled in a mantle, opened the little door of the garden, which he closed after him. I descended rapidly. Although I had not seen Villefort's face, I recognized him by the beating of my heart. I crossed the street, and stopped at a post placed at the angle of the wall, and by means of which I had once before looked into the garden. This time I did not content myself with looking, but I took my knife out of my pocket, felt that the point was sharp, and sprang over the wall. My first care was to run to the door. He had left the key in it, taking the simple precaution of turning it twice in the lock. Nothing then, preventing my escape by these means, I examined the ground. The garden was long and narrow. A stretch of smooth turf extended down the middle, and at the corners were clumps of trees with thick and massy foliage that made a background for the shrubs and flowers. In order to grow from the door to the house, or from the house to the door, Monsieur de Villefort would be obliged to pass by one of these clumps of trees. It was the end of September. The wind blew violently. The faint glimpses of the pale moon, 
hidden momentarily by masses of dark clouds that were sweeping across the sky, witnessed the gravel walks that led to the house, but were unable to pierce the obscurity of the thick shrubberies in which a man could conceal himself without any fear of discovery. I hid myself in the one nearest to the path Villefort must take, and scarcely was I there when, amidst the gust of wind, I fancied I heard groans. But you know, or rather you do not know, Your Excellency, that he who is about to commit an assassination fancies that he hears low cries perpetually ringing in his ears. Two hours passed thus, during which I imagined I heard moans repeatedly. Midnight struck. As last stroke died away, I saw a faint light shine through the windows of the private staircase by which we had just descended. The door opened, and the man in the mantle reappeared. The terrible moment had come, but I had so long been prepared for it that my heart did not fail in the least. I drew my knife from my pocket again, opened it, and made ready to strike. The man in the mantle advanced towards me, but as he drew near, I saw that he had a weapon in his hand. I was afraid, not of a struggle, but of a failure. When he was only a few paces from me, I saw that what I had taken for a weapon was only a spade. I was still unable to divine for what reason Monsieur de Villefort had his spade in his hand. When he stopped close to the thicket where I was, glanced round, and began to dig a hole in the earth. I then perceived that he was hiding something under his mantle, which he laid on the grass in order to dig more freely. Then, I confess, curiosity mingled with hatred. I wished to see what Villefort was going to do there, and I remained motionless, holding my breath. Then an idea crossed my mind, which was confirmed when I saw the procureur lift from under his mantle a box, two feet long and six or eight inches deep. I let him place the box in the hole he had made, then, while he stamped with his feet to remove all traces of his occupation, I rushed on him and plunged my knife into his breast, exclaiming, I am Giovanni Bertuccio, thy death for my brothers, thy treasure for his widow. Thou seest that my vengeance is more complete than I had hoped. I know not if he heard these words. I think he did not, for he fell without a cry. I felt his blood gush over my face, but I was intoxicated, I was delirious, and the blood refreshed instead of burning me. In a second I had disinterred the box. Then, that it might not be known I had done so, I filled up the hole, threw the spade over the wall, and rushed through the door, which I double-locked, carrying off the key. Ah, said Monte Cristo, it seems to me this was nothing but murder and robbery. No, Your Excellency, returned Bertuccio, it was a vendetta followed by restitution. And was the sum a large one? It was not money. Ah, I recollect replied the Count. Did you not say something of an infant? Yes, Excellency. I hastened to the river, sat down on the bank, and with my knife forced open the lock of the box. In a fine linen cloth was wrapped a newborn child. Its purple visage and its violet-colored hands showed that it had perished from suffocation, but it was not yet cold. I hesitated to throw it in the water that ran at my feet. After a moment, I fancied that I felt a slight pulsation of the heart, and as I had been assistant at the hospital at Bastia, I did what the doctor would have done. I inflated the lungs by blowing air into them, and at the expiration of a quarter of an hour, it began to breathe, and cried feebly. In my turn, I uttered a cry, but a cry of joy. God has not cursed me then, I cried since he permits me to save the life of a human creature, in exchange for the life I have taken away. And what did you do with the child? asked Monte Cristo. It was an embarrassing load for a man seeking to escape. I had not for a moment the idea of keeping it, but I knew that at Paris there was an asylum where they received such creatures. As I passed the city gates, I declared that I had found the child on the road, and I inquired where the asylum was. The box confirmed my statement, the linen proved the infant belonged to wealthy parents, the blood with which I was covered might have proceeded from the child as well as from anyone else. 
no objection was raised, but they pointed out the asylum, which was situated at the upper end of the Rue d'Enfer, and after having taken the precaution of cutting the linen into pieces, so that one of the tuileries which marked it was on the piece wrapped around the child, while the other remained in my possession, I rang the bell and fled with all speed. A fortnight after, I was at Trogliano, and I said to Assunta, Console thyself, sister. Israel is dead, but he is avenged. She demanded what I meant, and when I told her all, Giovanni, said she, you should have brought this child with you. You would have replaced the parents it has lost, have called it Benedetto, and then, in consequence of this good action, God would have blessed us. In reply I gave her the half of the linen I had kept in order to reclaim him if he became rich. What letters were marked on the linen? said Monte Cristo. An H and an N, surmounted by a baron's coronet. By heaven, Monsieur Bertuccio, you make use of heraldic terms. Where did you study heraldic? In your service, Excellency, where everything is learned. Go on, I am curious to know two things. What are they, Your Excellency? What became of this little boy? For I think you told me it was a boy, Monsieur Bertuccio. No, Excellency, I do not recollect telling you that. I thought you did. I must have been mistaken. No, you were not, for it was in reality a little boy. But Your Excellency wished to know two things. What was the second? The second was the crime of which you were accused when you asked for a confessor, and the Abbe Bozzoni came to visit you at your request in the prison at Nimes. The story will be very long, Excellency. What matter? You know I take but little sleep, and I do not suppose you are very much inclined for it either. Retusio bowed and resumed his story. Partly to drown the recollections of the past that haunted me, partly to supply the wants of the poor widow, I eagerly returned to my trade of smuggler, which had become more easy since that relaxation of the laws which always follows a revolution. The southern districts were ill-watched in particular, in consequence of the disturbances that were perpetually breaking out in Avignon, Nimes or Uses. We profited by this respite on the part of the government to make friends everywhere. Since my brother's assassination in the streets at Nimes, I had never entered the town. The result was that the innkeeper with whom we were connected, seeing that we would no longer come to him, was forced to come to us and had established a branch to his inn, on the road from Bellegarde to Beaucaire at the sign of the Pont du Gard. We had thus, at Tex Mortes, Martix, or Boc, a dozen places where we left our goods, and where, in case of necessity, we concealed ourselves from gendarmes and custom house officers. Smuggling is a profitable trade, when a certain degree of vigor and intelligence is employed. As for myself, brought up in the mountains, I have a double motive for fearing the gendarmes and custom house officers, as my appearance before the judges would cause an inquiry, and an inquiry always looks back into the past. And in my past life they might find something far more grave than the selling of smuggled cigars or barrels of brandy without a permit. So, preferring death to capture, I accomplished most astonishing deeds, and which, more than once, showed me that to great care we take of our bodies is the only obstacle to the success of those projects which require rapid decision and vigorous and determined execution. In reality, when you have once devoted your life to your enterprises, you are no longer the equal of other men, or rather, other men are no longer your equals, and whosoever has taken this resolution feels his strength and resources doubled. Philosophy, Monsieur Bertuccio, interrupted the Count. You have done a little of everything in your life. Oh, Excellency. No, no, but philosophy at half past ten at night is somewhat late. Yet I have no other observation to make, for what you say is correct, which is more than can be said for all philosophy. My journeys became more and more extensive and more productive. Assunta took care of all, and our little fortune increased. One day, as I was setting off, on an expedition. Go, said she, 
At your return I will give you a surprise. I questioned her, but in vain. She would tell me nothing, and I departed. Our expedition lasted nearly six weeks. We had been to Lucca to take in oil, to Leghorn for English cottons, and we ran our cargo without opposition, and returned home full of joy. When I entered the house, the first thing I beheld in the middle of a Suntas chamber was a cradle that might be called sumptuous compared with the rest of the furniture, and in it a baby seven or eight months old. I uttered a cry of joy. The only moments of sadness I had known since the assassination of the procureur were caused by the recollection that I had abandoned this child. For the assassination itself I had never felt any remorse. Poor Assunta had guessed all. She had profited by my absence, and furnished with half of the linen, and having written down the day and hour at which I had deposited the child at the asylum, had set off for Paris and had reclaimed it. No objection was raised, and the infant was given up to her. Ah, I confess, your excellency, when I saw this poor creature sleeping peacefully in its cradle, I felt my eyes filled with tears. Ah, Assunta, cried I, you are an excellent woman, and heaven will bless you. This, said Monte Cristo, is less correct than your philosophy. It is only faith. Halas, your excellency is right, replied Bertuccio, and God made this infant the instrument of our punishment. Never did a perverse nature declare itself more prematurely, and yet it was not owing to any fault in its bringing up. He was the most lovely child, with large blue eyes, of that deep color that harmonizes so well with the blonde complexion. Only his hair, which was too light, gave his face a most singular expression, and added to the vivacity of his look and the malice of his smile. Unfortunately, there is a proverb which says that red is either altogether good or altogether bad. The proverb was but too correct as regarded Benedetto, and even in his infancy he manifested the worst disposition. It is true that the indulgence of his foster mother encouraged him. This child, for whom my poor sister would go to the town, five or six leagues off, to purchase the earliest fruits and the most tempting sweetmeats, prefers to palma grapes or genuine preserves, the chestnuts stolen from a neighbor's orchard, or the dried apples in his loft, when he could eat as well of the nuts and apples that grew in my garden. One day, when Benedetto was about five or six, our neighbor Vasilio, who, according to the custom of the country, never locked up his purse or his valuables, for, as your excellency knows, there are no thieves in Corsica, complained that he had lost a Louis out of his purse. We thought he must have made a mistake in counting his money, but he persisted in the accuracy of this statement. One day, Benedetto, who had been gone from the house since morning, to our great anxiety, did not return until late in the evening, dragging a monkey after him, which he said he had found chained to the foot of a tree. For more than a month past, the mischievous child, who knew not what to wish for, had taken it to his head to have a monkey. A boatman, who had passed by Rogliano, and who had several of these animals, whose tricks had greatly diverted him, had, doubtless, suggested this idea to him. Monkeys are not found in our woods chained to trees, said I. Confess how you obtained this animal. Benedetto maintained the truth of what he had said, and accompanied it with details that did more honor to his imagination than to the, his veracity. I became angry. He began to laugh. I threatened to strike him, and he made two steps backwards. You cannot beat me, said he. You have no right, for you are not my father. We never knew who had revealed this fatal secret, which he had so carefully concealed from him. However, it was this answer, in which the child's whole character revealed itself, that almost terrified me, and my arm fell without touching him. The boy triumphed, and his victory rendered him so audacious that all the money of Assunta, whose affection for him seemed to increase as he became more unworthy of it, was spent in caprices she knew not how to contain the guest, and follies she had not courage to prevent. When I was at Rogliano, everything went on properly. 
but no sooner was my back turned than Benedetto became master, and everything went hill. When he was only eleven, he chose his companions from among the young men of eighteen or twenty, the worst characters in Bastia, or indeed in Corsica, and they had already, for some mischievous pranks, been several times threatened with the prosecution. I became alarmed, as any prosecution might be attended with serious consequences. I was compelled, at this period, to leave Corsica on an important expedition. I reflected for a long time, and with the hope of averting some impending misfortune, I resolved that Benedetto should accompany me. I hoped that the active and laborious life of a smuggler, with severe discipline on board, would have a salutary effect on his character, which was now well nigh, if not quite, corrupt. I spoke to Benedetto alone, and proposed to him to accompany me, endeavor him to attempting by all the promises most likely to dazzle the imagination of a child of twelve. He heard me patiently, and when I had finished, burst out laughing. Are you mad, uncle? He called me by this name when he was in good humor. Do you think I am going to change the life I live for your mode of existence? My agreeable indolence for the hard and precarious toil you impose on yourself, exposed to the bitter frost at night, and scorching heat by day, compelled to conceal yourself, and when you are perceived, receive a volley of bullets, all to earn a paltry sum. Why, I have as much money as I want. Mother Assunta always furnishes me when I ask for it. You see that I should be a fool to accept your offer. The arguments and his audacity perfectly stupefied me. Benedetto rejoiced his associates, and I saw him from a distance point me out to them as a fool. Sweet child, murmured Monte Cristo. Oh, had he been my own son, replied Bertuccio, or even my nephew, I would have brought him back to the right road, for the knowledge that you are doing your duty gives you strength. But the idea that I was striking a child whose father I had killed made it impossible for me to punish him. I give my sister, who constantly defended the unfortunate boy, good advice, and as she confessed that she had several times missed money to a considerable amount, I showed her a safe place in which to conceal our little treasure for the future. My mind was already made up. Bernadetto could read, write, and cipher perfectly, for when the feet seized him, he learned more in a day than others in a week. My intention was to enter him in a clerk in some ship, and without letting him know anything of my plan, to convey him some morning on board. By this means, his future treatment would depend upon his own conduct. I set off for France, after having fixed up on the plan. Our cargo was to be landed in the Gulf of Lyons, and this was a difficult thing to do, because it was the year 1829. The most perfect tranquility was restored, and the vigilance of the custom house officers was redoubled, and their strictness was increased at this time, in consequence of the fair at Beaucaire. Our expedition made a favorable beginning. We anchored our vessel, which had a double hold, where our goods were concealed, amidst a number of other vessels that bordered the banks of the Rhone from Beaucaire to Arles. On our arrival, we began to discharge our cargo in the night, and to convey it into the town, by the help of the innkeeper with whom we were connected. Whether success rendered us imprudent, or whether we were betrayed, I know not. But one evening, about five o'clock, our little cabin boy came breathlessly to inform us that he had seen a detachment of custom house officers advancing in our direction. It was not their proximity that alarmed us, for detachments were constantly patrolling along the banks of the Rhone, but the care, according to the boy's account, that they looked to avoid being seen. In an instant we were on the alert, but it was too late. Our vessel was surrounded, and amongst the custom house officers I observed several gendarmes, and, as terrified at the sight of their uniforms as I was brave at the sight of any other, I sprang into the hold, opened the port, and dropped into the river, dived, and only rose at intervals to breathe, until I reached a ditch that had recently been made from the Rhone to the canal that runs from Beaucaire to Aix Mortes. I was now safe, for I could swim along the ditch without being seen, and I reached the canal in safety. I had decidedly taken this direction. 
I have already told Her Excellency of an innkeeper from Nimes who had set up a little tavern on the road from Belagar to Beaucaire. Yes, said Monte Cristo. I perfectly recollect him. I think he was your colleague. Precisely, answered Bertuccio. But he had, seven or eight years before this period, sold his establishment to a tailor at Marseilles, who, having almost ruined himself in his old trade, wished to make his fortune in another. Of course, we made the same arrangement with the new landlord that we had with old, and it was of this man that I intended to ask shelter. What was his name? inquired the Count, who seemed to become somewhat interested in Bertuccio's story. Gaspard Caderousse. He had married a woman from the village of Carcon, and whom he did not know by any other name than that of her village. She was suffering from malarial fever and seemed dying by inches. As for her husband, he was a strapping fellow of forty or five and forty, who had more than once, in time of danger, given ample proof of his presence of mind and courage. And you say, interrupted Monte Cristo, that this took place towards the year 1829, Your Excellency. In what month? June. The beginning or the end? The evening of the third. Ah, said Monte Cristo. The evening of the third of June, 1829. Go on. It was from Caderousse that I attended the Manning's shelter, and, as we never entered by the door that opened onto the road, I resolved not to break through the rule, so climbing over the garden edge, I crept among the olive and wild fig trees, and fearing that Caderousse might have some guests, I entered a kind of shed in which I had often passed night, and which was only separated from the inn by a partition, in which holes had been made in order to enable us to watch an opportunity of announcing our presence. My intention was, if Caderousse was alone, to acquaint him with my presence, finish the meal the custom house officers had interrupted, and profit by the threatened storm to return to the Rome, and to certain the state of our vessel its crew. I stepped into the shed, and it was fortunate I did so, for at that moment Caderousse entered with the stranger. I waited patiently, not to overhear what they said, but because I could do nothing else. Besides, the same thing had occurred often before. The man who was with Caderousse was evidently a stranger to the south of France. He was one of those merchants who come to sell jewelry at Beaucaire Fair, and who during the month the fair lets, and during which there is so great an influx of merchants and customers from all parts of Europe, often have dealings to the amount of an hundred thousand to a hundred and fifty thousand francs. Caderousse entered hastily. Then, seeing that room was, as usual, empty and only guarded by the dog, he called to his wife. Hello, Carcont, said he. The worthy priest has not deceived us. The diamond is real. An exclamation of joy was heard, and the staircase cracked beneath a feeble step. What do you say? asked his wife, pale as death. I say that the diamond is real, and that this gentleman one of the first jewelers of Paris will give us fifty thousand francs for it. Only, in order to satisfy himself that it really belongs to us, he wishes us to relate to him, as I have done already, the miraculous manner in which the diamond came into our possession. In the meantime, please sit down, monsieur, and I will fetch you some refreshment. The jeweler examined attentively the interior of the inn, and the apparent poverty of persons who were about to sell him a diamond that seemed to have come from the casket of a prince. Relate your story, madame, said he, wishing, no doubt, to profit by the absence of the husband, so that later could not influence the wife's story, to see if the recitals tell it. Oh, returned she, it was a gift of heaven. My husband was a great friend, in 1814 or 1815, of a sailor named Edmond Dantes. This poor fellow, whom Caderousse had forgotten, had not forgotten him, and at his death he bequeathed this diamond to him. But how did he obtain it? asked the jeweler. Had he it before he was in prison? No, monsieur, 
but it appears that in prison he made the acquaintance of a rich Englishman, and as in prison he fell sick, and Dante took the same care of him as if he had been his brother, the Englishman, when he was set free, gave this turn to Dante, who, less fortunate, died, and in his turn left it to us, and charged the excellent Abby, who was here this morning, to deliver it. The same story, muttered the jeweler, and improbable as it seemed at first, it may be true. There is only the price we are not agreed about. How not agreed about? said Caderousse. I thought we agreed for the price I asked. That is, replied the jeweler, I offered forty thousand francs. Forty thousand, cried La Carconte. We will not part with it for that sum. The Abbey told us it was worth fifty thousand without setting. What was the Abbey's name? asked the indefectible questioner. The Abbey Buzoni, said La Carconte. He was a foreigner? An Italian, from the neighborhood of Mantua, I believe. Let me see this diamond again, replied the jeweler. The first time you are often mistaken as to the value of a stone. Cadrus took from his pocket a small case of black chagrin, opened, and gave it to the jeweler. At sight of the diamond, which was as large as a hazelnut, Lagargon's eyes sparkled with cupidity. And what did you think of this fine story? Heaves dropper, said Monte Cristo. Did you credit it? Yes, Your Excellency. I did not look on Caderousse as a bad man, and I thought him incapable of committing a crime or even a theft. That did more honor to your heart and to your experience, Monsieur Bertuccio. Had he known this Edmond Dantes of whom they spoke? No, Your Excellency. I had never heard of him before, and never but once afterwards, and that was from the Abbe Buzoni himself when I saw him in the prison at Nimes. Go on. The jeweler took the ring, and drawing from his pocket a pair of steel pliers and a small set of cobbler's scales, he took the stone out of its setting and weighted it carefully. I'll give you forty-five thousand, said he, but not a soul more. Besides, and that is the exact value of the stone, I brought just that sum with me. Oh, that's no matter, replied Caderousse. I'll go back with you to fetch the other five thousand francs. No, returned the jeweler, giving back the diamond and the ring to Caderousse. No, it is worth no more, and I am sorry I offered so much, for the stone has a flaw in it, which I had not seen. However, I will not go back on my word, and I will keep forty-five thousand. At least replace the diamond in the ring, said La Carconte sharply. Ah, true, replied the jeweler, and he reset the stone. No matter, observed Caderousse, replacing the box in his pocket. Someone else will purchase it. Yes, continued the jeweler, but someone else will not be so easy as I am, or content himself with the same story. It is not natural that a man like you should possess such a diamond. He will inform against you. You will have to find the Abbe Buzoni, and Abbeys who give diamonds worth two thousand louis are rare. The law would seize it and put you in prison. If at the end of three or four months you are set at liberty, the ring will be lost, or a false stone worth three francs will be given you, instead of a diamond worth fifty thousand, or perhaps fifty-five thousand francs from which you must allow that one runs considerable risk in purchasing. Caderousse and his wife looked eagerly at each other. No, said Caderousse, we are not rich enough to lose five thousand francs. As you please, my dear sir, said the jeweler. I have, however, as you see, brought you the money in bright coin. And he drew from his pocket a handful of gold and held it sparkling before the dazzled eyes of the innkeeper, and in the other hand he held a pocket of banknotes. There was evidently a severe struggle in the mind of Caderousse. It was plain that the small chagrin case, which he turned over and over in his hand, did not seem to him commensurate in value to the enormous sum which fascinated his gaze. He turned towards his wife. 
What do you think of this? He asked in a low voice. Let him have it. Let him have it, she said. If he returns to Bouquet without the diamond, he will inform against us, and, as he says, who knows if we shall ever again see the Abbe Buzoni. In all probability we shall never see him. Well then, so I will, said Caderousse, so we may have the diamond for forty-five thousand francs. But my wife wants a gold chain, and I want a pair of silver buckles. The jeweler drew from his pocket a long, flat box, which contained several samples of the articles demanded. Here, he said, I am very straightforward in my dealings. Take your choice. The woman selected a gold chain worth about five louis, and the husband a pair of buckles worth perhaps fifteen francs. I hope you'll not complain now, said the jeweler. The Abbe told me it was worth fifty thousand francs, muttered Cadruz. Come, come, give it to me. What a strange fellow you are, said the jeweler, taking the diamond from his hand. I give you forty-five thousand francs, that is, two thousand five hundred livres of income, a fortune such as which I have myself, and you are not satisfied. And five and forty thousand francs? inquired Cadarose in a hoarse voice. Where are they? Come, let us see them. Here they are, replied the jeweler, and he counted out upon the table fifty thousand francs in gold and thirty thousand francs in banknotes. Wait while I light the lamp, said La Carcon. It is growing dark and there may be some mistake. In fact, Night had come on during this conversation, and with night the storm which had been threatening for the last half hour. The thunder growled in the distance, but it was apparently not heard by the jeweler, Cadrus or Lacarconte, absorbed as they were all three with the demon of gain. I myself felt a strange kind of fascination at the sight of all this gold and all these banknotes. It seemed to me that I was in a dream, and, as it always happens in a dream, I felt myself reverted to the spot. Cadruz counted and again counted the golden notes, then handed them to his wife, who counted and quanted them again in her turn. During this time, the jeweler made the diamond play and sparkle in the lamplight, and the gem threw out jets of light which made him unmindful of those which, precursors of the storm, began to play in it at the windows. Well, inquired the jeweler, is the cash all right? Yes, said Cadruz. Give me the pocket book, La Carconte, and find the bag somewhere. La Carconte went to a cupboard and returned with an old leather pocket book and a bag. From the former she took some greasy letters and put in their place the banknotes, and from the bag took two or three crowns of six livres each, which, in all probability, formed the entire fortune of the miserable couple. There, said Cadrus, and now, although you have wronged us perhaps ten thousand francs, will you have supper with us? I invite you with good will. Thank you, replied the jeweler. I must be getting late, and I must return to Beaucaire. My wife will be getting uneasy. He drew out his watch and exclaimed, Morbleu, nearly nine o'clock. Why, I shall not get back to Beaucaire before midnight. Good night, my friends. If the Abbe Busoni should by any accident return, think of me. In another week you'll have left Beaucaire, remarked Cadarus, for the fair ends in a few days. True, but that makes no difference. Write to me at Paris, to Monsieur Joannes, in the Palais Royal, Arcade Pierre, number 45. I will make the journey on purpose to see him, if it is worth while. At this moment there was a tremendous clap of thunder, accompanied by a flash of lightning so vivid that it quite eclipsed the light of the lamp. See here, exclaimed Cadarus, you cannot think of going out in such weather as this. Oh, I'm not afraid of thunder, said the jeweler. And then there are robbers, said La Carconte. The road is never very safe during fair time. Oh, as to the robbers, said Joannes, here is something for them. And he drew from his pocket a pair of small pistols loaded to the muzzle. 
Here, said he, are dogs who bark and bite at the same time. They are for the two first who shall have a longing for your diamond, friend Cadarus. Cadarus and his wife again interchanged a meaning look. It seemed as though they were both inspired at the same time with some horrible thought. Well then, a good journey to you, said Cadarus. Thanks, replied the jeweler. He then took his cane, which he had placed against an old cupboard, and went out. At the moment when he opened the door, such a gush of wind came in that the lamp was nearly extinguished. Ho, oh, said he. This is very nice weather and two leagues to go in such a storm. Remain, said Cadarus. You can sleep here. Yes, do stay, added Lagarconte in a tremulous voice. We'll take every care of you. No, I'm a sleepable care. So, once more, good night. Cadarus followed him slowly to the threshold. I can see neither heaven nor earth said the jeweler, who was outside the door. Do I turn to the right or to the left hand? To the right, said Cadarus. You cannot go wrong. The road is bordered by trees on both sides. Good. All right, said the voice, almost lost in the distance. Close the door, said La Carconte. I do not like open doors when it thunders. Particularly when there is money in the house, hey? answered Cadarus, double-locking the door. He came into the room, went to the cupboard, took out the bag and pocketbook, and both began, for the third time, to count their gold and banknotes. I never saw such an expression of cupidity at the flickering lamp revealed in those two countenances. The woman specially was hideous. Her usually feverish tremulous was intensified. Her countenance had become livid and her eyes resembled burning coals. Why? she inquired in a hoarse voice. Did you invite him to sleep here tonight? Why? said Cadarus with a shudder. Why? That he might not have the trouble returning to Beaucaire. Ah! responded the woman with an expression impossible to describe. I thought it was for something else. Woman, woman! Why do you have such ideas? cried Cadarus. Or, if you have them, why don't you keep them to yourself? Well, said La Carconte after a moment's pause, you are not a man. What do you mean? added Cadarus. If you had been a man, you would not have let him go from here. Woman! Or else you should have not have reached for care. Woman! The road takes a turn is obliged to follow it, while alongside of the canal there is a shorter road. Woman, you offend the good God. There, listen. And at this moment there was a tremendous peal of thunder, while the livid lighting illuminated the room, and thunder, rolling away in the distance, seemed to withdraw unwillingly from the cursed abode. Mercy, said Cadarus, crossing himself. At the same moment, and in the midst of the terrifying silence which usually follows the clap of thunder, they heard a knocking at the door. Cadarus and his wife started and looked aghast at each other. Who's there? cried Cadarus, rising, and drawing up in a heap the golden notes scattered over the table, and which he covered with his two hands. It is I, shouted a voice. And who are you? Her, uh, por Dieu, Joanne's the jeweler. Well, and you said I offended the good God, said La Carconte with a horrid smile. Why, the good God sends him back again. Cadre will sink pale and breathless into his chair. La Carconte, on the contrary, rose, and going with a firm step towards the door, opened it, saying as she did so, Come in, dear Monsieur Joanne's. Ma foi, said the jeweler, drenched with rain. I am not destined to return to Beaucaire tonight. The shortest fall is our best, my dear Cadarus. You offered me hospitality and I accept it, and I have returned to sleep beneath your friendly roof. Cadarus stammered out something, while he wiped away the sweat that started to his brow. 
like our count double locked the door behind the jeweler. End of chapter 43《Chapter 44 of the Count of Monte Cristo》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 44 The Vendetta. At what point shall I begin my story, Your Excellency? asked Petruchio. Will you please return, Monte Cristo, since I know nothing at all of it? I thought the Abbe Busoni had told your Excellency. Some particulars, doubtless, but that is seven or eight years ago, and I have forgotten them. <laughs> Then I can speak without fear of tiring your Excellency. Go on, Monsieur Patricio, you will supply the want of the evening papers. The story begins in 1815. Ah, said Monte Cristo, 1815 is not yesterday. No, monsieur, and yet I recollect all things as clearly as if they had happened but then. I had a brother, an elder brother, who was in the service of the emperor. He had become a lieutenant in a regiment composed entirely of Corsicans. This brother was my only friend. We became orphans, I at five, he at eighteen. He brought me up as if I had been his son, and in eighteen fourteen he married. When the emperor returned from the island of Elba, my brother instantly joined the army, was slightly wounded at Waterloo, and retired with the army beyond the Loire. But that is the history of the hundred days, Monsieur Batissier, said the Count. Unless I am mistaken, it has been already written. Excuse me, Excellency, but these details are necessary, and you promise to be patient. Go on, I will keep my word. One day we received a letter. I should tell you that we lived in the little village of Vogliano, at the extremity of Cape Corso. This letter was from my brother. He told us that the army was disbanded, and that he should return via Chateau, Clermont Ferrand, Le Puy, and Nimes. And if I had any money, he prayed me to leave it for him at Nimes with an innkeeper with whom I had dealings. In the smuggling line, said Monte Cristo. Now, hey, Your Excellency, every one must live. Certainly, go on. I loved my brother tenderly, as I told Your Excellency, and I resolved not to send the money to, to take it to him myself. I possessed a thousand francs. I left five hundred with a son to my sister in law, and with the other five hundred I set off for Nimes. It was easy to do so, and as I had my boat and a lading to take in at sea, everything favoured my project. But after we had taken in our cargo, the wind became contrary, so that we were four or five days without being able to enter the Rhone. At last, however, we succeeded, and worked up to Arles. I left the boat between Bellegarde and Beaucaire, and took the road to Nimes. We are getting to the story now. Yes, Your Excellency, excuse me, but as you will see, I only tell you what is absolutely necessary. Just at this time, the famous massacres took place in the south of France. Three brigands, called Castellian, Trefani, and Graffan, publicly assassinated everybody whom they suspected of Bonapartism. You have doubtless heard of these massacres, Your Excellency. Vaguely, I was far from France at that period. Go on. As I entered Nimes, I literally waded in blood at every step you encountered dead bodies and bands of murderers who killed, plundered, and burned. At the sight of this slaughter and devastation, I became terrified, not for myself, for I, a simple Corsican fisherman, had nothing to fear, on the contrary, that time was most favourable for us smugglers. But for my brother, a soldier of the Empire, returning from the army of the Loire, with his uniform and his epaulets, there was everything to apprehend. I hastened to the innkeeper. My misgivings had been but too true. My brother had arrived the previous evening at Enemes, and at the very door of the house where he was about to demand hospitality, he had been assassinated. I did all in my power to discover the murderers, 
but no one durst tell me their names, so much were they dreaded. I then thought of that French justice of which I had heard so much, and which feared nothing, and I went to the king's attorney. And this king's attorney was named Villefort, asked Monte Cristo carelessly. Yes, Your Excellency, he came from Marseilles, where he had been deputy procurer. His zeal had procured him advancement, and he was said to be one of the first who had informed the government of the departure from the island of Elba. Then, said Monte Cristo, you went to him. Monsieur, I said, my brother was assassinated yesterday in the streets of Nimes. I know not by whom, but it is your duty to find out. You are the representative of justice here, and it is for justice to avenge those you had been unable to protect. Who was your brother? asked he. A lieutenant in a Corsican battalion. A soldier of the usurper, then? A soldier of the French army. Well, replied he, he has smitten with the sword, and he hath perished by the sword. You are mistaken, monsieur, I replied. He has perished by the poniard. "'What do you want me to do?' asked the magistrate. "'I have already told you. Avenge him. On whom? On his murderers. "'How should I know who they are? Order them to be sought for. "'Why, your brother has been involved in a quarrel and killed in a duel. "'All these old soldiers commit excesses which were tolerated at the time of the Emperor, "'but which are not suffered now, for the people here do not like soldiers of such disorderly conduct.' "'Monsieur,' I replied, it is not for myself that I entreat your interference. I should grieve for him, or avenge him. But my poor brother has a wife, and were anything to happen to me, a poor creature would perish from want, for my brother's pay alone kept her. Pray try and obtain a small government pension for her. Every revolution has its catastrophes, returned Monsieur de Villefort. Your brother has been the victim of this. It is a misfortune, and the government owes nothing to his family. If I were to judge all by the vengeance that the followers of the usurper exercised on the partisans of the king, when in their turn they were in power, your brother would today, in all probability, be condemned to death. What has happened is quite natural, and in conformity with the law of reprisals. What? cried I. Do you, a magistrate, speak thus to me? "'All these Corsicans are mad on my honour, replied Monsieur de Villefort. "'They fancy that their countryman is still emperor. "'You have mistaken the time. "'You should have told me this two months ago. "'It is too late now. "'Go now at once, or I shall have you put out.' "'I looked at him an instant to see if there was anything to hope from further entreaty. "'But he was a man of stone. "'I approached him and said in a low voice, well, since you know the Corsicans so well, you know that they always keep their word. You think that it was a good deed to kill my brother, who was a Bonapartist, because you are a royalist. Well, I, who am a Bonapartist also, declare one thing to you, which is, that I will kill you. From this moment I declare the vendetta against you, so protect yourself as well as you can, for the next time we meet your last hour has come and before he had recovered from his surprise, I opened the door and left the room. "'Well, well,' said Monte Cristo, "'such an innocent-looking person as you are to do these things, Monsieur Petitio. "'And to a king's attorney at that. "'But did he know what was meant by the terrible word vendetta? "'He knew so well that from that moment he shut himself in his house "'and never went out unattended, seeking me high and low.' Fortunately, I was so well concealed that he could not find me. Then he became alarmed, and dared not stay any longer at Nimes. So he solicited a change of residence, and as he was in reality very influential, he was nominated to Versailles. But as you know, a Corsican who has sworn to revenge himself cares not for the distance. So his carriage, fast as it went, was never above half a day's journey before me, who followed him on foot. The most important thing was, not to kill him only, for I had an opportunity of doing so a hundred times, but to kill him without being discovered, at least without being arrested. I no longer belonged to myself, for I had my sister-in-law to protect and provide for. 
For three months I watched Monsieur de Villefort. For three months he took not a step out of doors without my following him. At length I discovered that he went mysteriously to Ote. I followed him thither, and saw him enter the house where we are now. Only instead of entering by the great door that looks into the street, he came on horseback, or in his carriage, left the one or the other at the little inn, and entered by the gate you see there. Monte Cristo made a sign with his head to show that he could discern in the darkness the door to which Petruchio alluded. As I had nothing more to do at Versailles, I went to Otto, and gained all the information I could. If I wished to surprise him, it was evident that this was the spot to lie and wait to him. The house belonged, as the concierge informed your excellency, to Monsieur de Saint-Marin, Villefort's father-in-law. Monsieur de Saint-Marin lived at Marseille, so that this country house was useless to him, and it was reported to be let to a young widow, known only by the name of the Baroness. One evening, as I was looking over the wall, I saw a young and handsome woman who was walking alone in that garden, which was not overlooked by any window, and I guessed that she was awaiting Monsieur de Villefort. When she was sufficiently near for me to distinguish her features, I saw that she was from eighteen to nineteen, tall and very fair. As she had a loose muslin dress on, and as nothing concealed her figure, I saw that she would ere long become a mother. A few minutes after, the little door was open, and the man entered. The young woman hastened to meet him. They threw himself into each other's arms, embraced tenderly, and returned together to the house. The man was Monsieur de Villefort. I fully believed that when he went out in the night he would be forced to traverse the whole of the garden alone. And, asked the Count, did you ever know the name of this woman? No, Excellency, returned Batisio. You will see that I had no time to learn it. Go on. That evening, continued Batisio, I could have killed the procurer, but as I was not sufficiently acquainted with the neighbourhood, I was fearful of not killing him on the spot, and that if his cries were overheard I might be taken. So I put it off till the next occasion and in order that nothing should escape me, I took a chamber looking into the street bordered by the wall of the garden. Three days after, about seven o'clock in the evening, I saw a servant on horseback leave the house at full gallop and take the road to Sevres. I concluded that he was going to Versailles, and I was not deceived. Three hours later, the man returned covered with dust. His errand was performed and two minutes after, another man on foot, muffled in a mantle, opened the little door of the garden, which he closed after him. I descended rapidly, although I had not seen Villefort's face. I recognized him by the beating of my heart. I crossed the street and stopped at a post placed at the angle of the wall, and by means of which I had once before looked into the garden. This time I did not content myself with looking, but I took my knife out of my pocket, felt that the point was sharp, and sprang over the wall. My first care was to run to the door. He had left the key in it, taking the simple precaution of turning it twice in the lock. Nothing then preventing my escape by this means, I examined the ground. The garden was long and narrow, a stretch of smooth turf extended down the middle, and at the corners were clumps of trees with thick and massy foliage that made a background for the shrubs and flowers. In order to go from the door to the house, or from the house to the door, Monsieur de Villefort would be obliged to pass by one of these clumps of trees. It was the end of September, the wind blew violently. The faint glimpses of the pale moon, hidden momentary by masses of dark clouds that were sweeping across the sky, whitened the gravel walks that led to the house, but were unable to pierce the obscurity of the thick shrubberies, in which a man could conceal himself without any fear of discovery. I hid myself in the one nearest to the path Villefort must take, and scarcely was I there when, amidst the gust of wind, I fancied I heard groans. But you know, or rather you do not know, Your Excellency, 
that he who is about to commit an assassination fancies that he hears low cries perpetually ringing in his ears. Two hours passed thus, during which I imagined I heard moans repeatedly. Midnight struck. As the last stroke died away, I saw a faint light shine through the windows of the private staircase by which we have just descended. The door opened, and the man in the mantle reappeared. The terrible moment had come, but I had so long been prepared for it that my heart did not fail in the least. I drew my knife from my pocket again, opened it, and made ready the strike. The man in the mantle advanced towards me, but as he drew near I saw that he had a weapon in his hand. I was afraid not of a struggle, but of a failure. When he was only a few paces from me, I saw that what I had taken for a weapon was only a spade. I was still unable to divine for what reason M. de Villefort had this spade in his hands, when he stopped close to the thicket where I was, glanced around, and began to dig a hole in the earth. I then perceived that he was hiding something under his mantle, which he laid on the grass in order to dig more freely. Then, I confess, curiosity mingled with hatred. I wished to see what Villefort was going to do there, and I remained motionless, holding my breath. Then an idea crossed my mind, which was confirmed when I saw the procurer lift from under his mantle a box two feet long and six or seven inches deep. I let him place the box in the hole he had made, then, while he stamped with his feet to remove all traces of his occupation, I rushed on him and plunged my knife into his breast, exclaiming, I am Giovanni Batticcio, thy death for my brothers, thy treasure for his widow. Thou seest my vengeance is more complete than I had hoped. I know not if he heard these words, I think he did not, for he fell without a cry. I felt his blood gush over my face, but I was intoxicated, I was delirious, and the blood refreshed instead of burning me. In a second I had disinterred the box, then, that it might not be known what I had done, I filled up the hole, threw the spade over the wall, and rushed through the door, which I had double locked, carrying off the key. Ah, says Monte Cristo, it seems to me this was nothing but murder and robbery. No, Your Excellency, returned Patricia, it was a vendetta followed by restitution. And was the sum a large one? It was not money. Ah, I recollect, replied the Count. Did you not say something of an infant? Yes, Excellency. I hastened to the river, sat down on the bank, and with my knife forced open the lock of the box. In a fine linen cloth was wrapped a newborn child. Its purple visage and its violet-coloured hands showed that it had perished from suffocation, but as it was not yet cold, I hesitated to throw it in the water that ran at my feet. After a moment I fancied that I felt a slight pulsation of the heart, and as I had been assistant at the hospital at Bastia, I did what a doctor would have done. I inflated the lungs by blowing air into them, and in the expiration of a quarter of an hour it began to breathe and cried feebly. In my turn I uttered a cry, but a cry of joy. God has not cursed me then, I cried, since he permits me to save the life of a human creature in exchange for the life I have taken away. And what did you do with the child? asked Monte Cristo. It was an embarrassing load for a man seeking to escape. I had not for a moment the idea of keeping it, but I knew that at Paris there was an asylum where they received such creatures. As I passed the city gates, I declared that I had found the child on the road, and I inquired where the asylum was. The box confirmed my statement. The linen proved that the infant belonged to wealthy parents. The blood with which I was covered might have proceeded from the child as well as from any one else. No objection was raised, but they pointed out the asylum, which was situated at the upper end of the Rue d'Enfer, and after having taken the proportion of cutting the linen in two pieces, 
so that one of the two letters which marked it was on the piece wrapped round the child, while the other remained in my possession, I rang the bell and fled with all speed. A fortnight after I was at Guagliano, and I said to a santa, Console thyself, sister, Israel is dead, but he is avenged. She demanded what I meant, and I had told her all. Giovanni, she said, you should have brought this child with you. We would have replaced the parents that had lost, have called it Benedetto, and then, in consequence of this good action, God would have blessed us. In reply, I gave her the half of the linen I had kept in order to reclaim him if we became rich. "'What letters were marked on the linen?' said Monte Cristo. "'An H and an N surmounted by a baron's coronet. "'By heaven, Monsieur Patricia, you make use of heraldic terms. "'Where did you study heraldry?' "'In your service, Excellency, where everything is learned. "'Go on. I am curious to know two things. "'What are they, Your Excellency?' "'What became of this little boy? "'For I think you told me it was a boy, Monsieur Batessier. "'No, Excellency, I do not recollect telling you that. "'I thought you did. I must have been mistaken. "'No, you are not, for it was in reality a little boy. "'But Your Excellency wished to know two things. "'What was the second? "'The second was the crime of which you were accused "'when you asked for a confessor.' and the Abbe Bassani came to visit you at your request in the prison at Nimes. The story will be a very long one, Excellency. What matter? You know I take but little sleep, and I do not suppose you are much inclined for it either. Mercutio bowed and resumed his story. Partly to drown the recollections of the past that haunted me, Partly to supply the wants of the poor widow, I eagerly returned to my trade of smuggler, which had become more easy since that relaxation of the laws which always follows a revolution. The southern districts were ill-watched in particular, in consequence of the disturbances which were perpetually breaking out in Avignon, Nîmes, or Ouse. We profited by this respite on the part of the government to make friends everywhere. Since my brother's assassination in the street of Nimes, I had never entered the town. The result was that the innkeeper with whom we were connected, seeing that we would no longer come to him, was forced to come to us, and had established a branch to his inn on the road from Bellegarde to Beaucaire, at the sign of the Pont de Garde. We had thus at Aigues-Mortes, Martiques, or Bouc, a dozen places where we left our goods and where, in the case of necessity, we concealed ourselves from the gendarmes and custom-house officers. Smuggling is a profitable trade, where a certain degree of vigour and intelligence is employed. As for myself, brought up in the mountains, I had a double motive for fearing the gendarmes and the custom-house officers, as my appearance before the judges would cause an inquiry, and an inquiry always looks back into the past and in my past life they might find something more grave than the selling of smuggled cigars or barrels of brandy without a permit. So, preferring death to capture, I accomplished the most astonishing deeds, and which more than once showed me that the too great care we take of our bodies is the only obstacle to the success of those projects which require rapid decision and vigorous and determined execution. In reality, once you have once devoted your life to your enterprises, you are no longer the equal of other men, or rather, other men are no longer your equals, and whosoever has taken this resolution feels his strength and resources double. Philosophy, Monsieur Bocasio, interrupted the Count, you have done a little of everything in your life. Oh, Excellency! No, no, but philosophy at half-past ten at night is somewhat late. Yet I have no other observation to make, for what you say is correct, which is more than can be said for all philosophy. My journeys became more and more extensive and more productive. Asanta took care of it all, and our little fortune increased. One day, as I was setting off on an expedition, Go, said she, at your return I will give you a surprise. 
I questioned her, but in vain. She would tell me nothing, and I departed. Our expedition lasted nearly six weeks. We had been to Lucca to take in oil, to Leghorn for English cottons, and we ran our cargo without opposition, and returned home full of joy. When I entered the house, the first thing I beheld in the middle of a sumptuous chamber was a cradle that might have been called sumptuous, compared with the rest of the furniture, and in it a baby seven or eight months old. I uttered a cry of joy, the only moment of sadness I had known since the assassination of the procurer was caused by the recollection that I had abandoned this child. For the assassination itself I had never felt any remorse. Poor Santa had guessed all. She had profited by my absence, and furnished with half of the linen, and having written down the day and hour at which I had deposited the child at the asylum, had set off for Paris, and had reclaimed it. No objection was raised, and the infant was given up to her. Ah, I confess, Your Excellency, when I saw this poor creature sleeping peacefully in its cradle, I felt my eyes filled with tears. Ah, Santa, cried I, you are an excellent woman, and heaven will bless you. This, said Monte Cristo, is less correct than your philosophy. It is only faith. Alas, your excellency is right, replied Bertuccio, and God made this infant the instrument of our punishment. Never did a perverse nature declare itself more prematurely, and yet it was not owing to any fault in his bringing up. He was a most lovely child, with large blue eyes of that deep colour that harmonises so well with the blonde complexion. Only his hair, which was too light, gave his face a most singular expression, and added to the vivacity of his look and the malice of his smile. Unfortunately, there is a proverb which says that red is either altogether good or altogether bad. The proverb was but too correct, as regarded Benedetto and even in his infancy he manifested the worst disposition. It is true that the indulgence of his foster mother encouraged him. This child, for whom my poor sister would go into the town, five or six leagues off, to purchase the earliest fruits and the most tempting sweetmeats, preferred to Parma grapes or Genoese preserves, the chestnuts stolen from a neighbour's orchard, or the dried apples in his loft, when he could eat as well of the nuts and apples that grew in my garden. One day, when Benedetto was about five or six, a neighbour, Vasilio, who, according to the custom of the country, never locked up his purse or his valuables, for, as your excellency knows, there are no thieves in Corsica, complained that he had lost a louis out of his purse. We thought he must have made a mistake in counting his money, but he persisted in the accuracy of his statement. One day Benedetto, who had been gone from the house since morning, to our great anxiety, did not return till late in the evening, dragging a monkey after him, which he said he had found chained to the foot of a tree. For more than a month past, the mischievous child, who knew not what to wish for, had taken into his head to have a monkey. A boatman who had passed by Rogliano, and who had several of these animals, whose tricks had greatly diverted him, had doubtless suggested this idea to him. Monkeys are not found in our woods changed to trees, said I. Confess how you obtained this animal. Benedetto maintained the truth of what he had said, and accompanied it with details that did more honour to his imagination than to his veracity. I became angry, he began to laugh, I threatened to strike him, and he made two steps backward. You cannot beat me, said he, you have no right, for you are not my father. We never knew who had revealed this fatal secret, which we had so carefully concealed from him. However, it was this answer, in which the child's whole character revealed itself, that almost terrified me, and my arm fell without touching him. The boy triumphed, and this victory rendered him so audacious, that all the money of Asunta, whose affection for him seemed to increase as he became more unworthy of it, was spent in caprices she knew not how to contend against, and follies she had not the courage to prevent. 
When I was at Rogliano, everything went on properly, but no sooner was my back turned than Benedetto became master and everything went ill. When he was only eleven, he chose his companions from amongst the young men of eighteen or twenty, the worst characters in Bastia, or indeed in Corsica, and they had already, for some mischievous pranks, been several times threatened with a prosecution. I became alarmed, as any prosecution might be attended with serious consequences. I was compelled at this period to leave Corsica on an important expedition. I reflected for a long time, and with the hope of averting some impending misfortune, I resolved that Benedetto should accompany me. I hoped that the active and laborious life of a smuggler, with the severe discipline on board, would have a salutary effect on his character, which was now well nigh, if not quite, corrupt. I spoke to Benedetto alone, and proposed to him to accompany me, endeavouring to tempt him by all the promises most likely to dazzle the imagination of a child of twelve. He heard me patiently, and when I had finished, burst out laughing. I am mad, uncle, he called me by this name when he was in a good humour. Do you think I am going to change the life I lead for your mode of existence? My agreeable indolence for the hard and precarious toil you impose on yourself, exposed to the bitter frost at night and the scorching heat by day, compelled to conceal yourself, and when you are perceived, receive a volley of bullets, all to earn a paltry sum, why, I have as much money as I want. Mother Asanta always furnishes me when I ask for it. You see that I should be a fool to accept your offer. The arguments and his audacity perfectly stupefied me. Benedetto rejoined his associates, and I saw him from a distance point me out to them as a fool. Sweet child, murmured Monte Cristo. Oh, had he been my own son, replied Bertuccio, or even my nephew, I'd have brought him back to the right road. For the knowledge that you are doing your duty gives you strength. But the idea that I was striking a child whose father I had killed made it impossible for me to punish him. I gave my sister, who constantly defended the unfortunate boy, good advice and as she confessed that she had several times missed money to a considerable amount, I showed her a safe place in which to conceal our little treasure for the future. My mind was already made up. Benedetto could read, write, and cipher perfectly, for when the fit seized him he learnt more in a day than the others in the week. My intention was to enter him as a clerk in some ship, and without letting him know anything of my plan, to convey him some morning on board, by this means his future treatment would depend upon his own conduct. I set off for France after having fixed upon the plan. Our cargo was to be landed at the Gulf of Lyons, and this was a difficult thing to do, because it was then the year 1829. The most perfect tranquillity was restored, and the vigilance of the Custom House officers was redoubled, and their strictness was increased at this time in consequence of the fair at Beaucaire. Our expedition made a favourable beginning. We anchored our vessel, which had a double hold where our goods were concealed, amidst a number of other vessels that bordered the banks of the Rhone from Beaucaire to Arles. On our arrival we began to discharge our cargo in the night, and to convey it into the town by the help of the innkeeper with whom we were connected. Whether success rendered us imprudent, or whether we were betrayed, I know not. But one evening, about five o'clock, our little cabin boy came breathlessly to inform us that he had seen a detachment of custom house officers advancing in our direction. It was not their proximity that alarmed us, for detachments were constantly patrolling along the banks of the Rhone, but the care, according to the boy's account, that they took to avoid being seen. In an instant we were on the alert, but it was too late, our vessel was surrounded, and amongst the custom house officers I observed several gendarmes, and as terrified at the sight of their uniforms as I was as brave at the sight of any other, I sprang into the hold, opened a port, and dropped into the river, 
dived, and only rose at intervals to breathe until I had reached a ditch that had recently been made from the Rhone to the canal that runs from Beaucaire to Aix-Mortz. I was now safe, for I could swim along the ditch without being seen, and I reached the canal in safety. I had designedly taken this direction. I have already told your Excellency of an innkeeper from Nimes who had set up a little tavern on the road from Belgarde de Beaucaire. Yes, said Monte Cristo, I perfectly recollect him. I think he was your colleague. Precisely, answered Petuchio. But he had, seven or eight years before this period, sold his establishment to a tailor at Marseilles, who, having almost ruined himself in his own trade, wished to make his fortune in another. Of course, we made the same arrangement with the new landlord as we had had with the old, and it was of this man that I intended to ask for shelter. What was his name? inquired the Count, who seemed to become somewhat interested in Petuchio's story. Gaspard Gazarus. He had married a woman from the village of Carconte, and whom we did not know by any other name than that of her village. She was suffering from malarial fever, and seemed dying by inches. As for her husband, he was a strapping fellow of forty or five and forty, who had more than once, in time of danger, given ample proof of his presence of mind and courage. And you say, interrupted Monte Cristo, that this took place toward the end of the year 1829, Your Excellency. In what month? June. The beginning or the end? The evening of the third. Ah, said Monte Cristo, the evening of the third of June, 1829. Go on. It was from Calarus that I intended demanding shelter. And as we never entered by the door that opened onto the road, I resolved not to break through the rule. So, climbing over the garden hedge, I crept among the olive and wild fig trees, and fearing that Caderousse might have some guest, I entered a kind of shed in which I had often passed the night, and which was only separated from the inn by a petition, in which holes had been made in order to enable us to watch the opportunity of announcing our presence. My attention was, if Caderousse was alone, to acquaint him with my present, finish the meal a custom house officers had interrupted, and profit by the threatened storm to return to the Rhone, and ascertain the state of our vessel and its crew. I stepped into the shed, and it was fortunate that I did so, for at that moment Caderousse entered with a stranger. I waited patiently, not to overhear what they said, but because I could do nothing else. Besides, the same thing had occurred often before. The man who was with Caderousse was evidently a stranger to the south of France. He was one of those merchants who come to sell jewellery at the Beaucaire Fair, and during the month the fair lasts, and during which there is so great an influx of merchants and customers from all parts of Europe, often having dealings the amount of a hundred thousand to a hundred and fifty thousand francs. Caderousse entered hastily. Then, seeing that the room was as usual empty, and only guarded by the dog, he called to his wife. "'Hello, Carconte," said he. "'The worthy priest has not deceived us. The diamond is real.' An exclamation of joy was heard, and the staircase creeped beneath a feeble step. "'What did you say?' asked his wife, pale as death. "'I say that the diamond is real, and that this gentleman, one of the first jewellers of Paris, will give us fifty thousand francs for it. Only, in order to satisfy himself that it really belongs to us, he wishes you to relate to him, as I have done already, the miraculous manner in which the diamond came into our possession. In the meantime, please to sit down, monsieur, and I will fetch you some refreshment. The jeweller examined attentively the interior of the inn, and the apparent poverty of the persons who were about to sell him a diamond that seemed to come from a casket of a prince. Relate your story, madam, said he, wishing no doubt to profit by the absence of the husband, so that the latter could not influence the wife's story, to see if two recitals tallied. Oh, returned she, it was a gift of heaven. 
My husband was a great friend in 1814 or 1815 of a sailor named Edmond Dantes. This poor fellow, whom Count de Russe had forgotten, had not forgotten him, and at his death he bequeathed this diamond to him. But how did he obtain it? asked the jeweller. Had he it before he was in prison? No, monsieur, but it appears that in prison he made the acquaintance of a rich Englishman, and as in prison he felt sick and Dantes took the same care of him as if he had been his brother, the Englishman, who when he was set free, gave this stone to Dantes, who, less fortunate, died and in his turn left it to us, and charged the excellent abbe, who was here this morning, to deliver it. The same story, muttered the jeweller, and improbable as it seemed at first, it may be true. There's only the price we are not agreed about. How not agreed about, said Caderousse, I thought we agreed for the price I asked. That is, replied the jeweller, I offered forty thousand francs. Forty thousand, cried La Cacotent. We will not part with it for that sum. The abbot told us it was worth fifty thousand without the setting. What was the abbey's name? asked the indefatigable questioner. The abbe Bussoni said La Caconte. He was a foreigner, an Italian from the neighbourhood of Mantua, I believe. Let me see this diamond again, replied the jeweller. The first time you are often mistaken as to the value of a stone. Caderus took from his pocket a small case of black chagrin, opened it, and gave it to the jeweller. At the sight of the diamond, which was as large as a hazelnut, La Caconte's eyes sparkled with cupidity. And what did you think of this fine story, eavesdropper? said Monte Cristo. Did you credit it? Yes, Your Excellency, I did not look upon Caderus as a bad man and I thought him incapable of committing a crime or even a theft. That did more honour to your heart than your experience, Monsieur Batacchio. Had you known this Edmund Dantes of whom they spoke? No, Your Excellency, I had never heard of him before, and never but once after, and that was when from the Abbey Busson himself, when I saw him in the prison in Nîmes. Go on. The jeweller took the ring, and drawing from his pocket a pair of steel pliers and a small set of copper scales, he took the stone out of its setting and weighed it carefully. "'I will give you forty-five thousand, said he, "'but not a sou more. "'Besides, if that is the exact value of the stone, "'I brought just that sum with me.' "'Oh, that's no matter,' replied Caderousse. "'I will go back with you to fetch the other five thousand francs.' "'No,' returned the jeweller, giving back the diamond and the ring to Caderousse. "'No, it is worth no more, and I'm sorry I offered so much, "'for the stone has a flaw in it which I had not seen. "'However, I will not go back on my word, and I will give forty-five thousand. "'At least replace the diamond in the ring,' said La Caconte sharply. "'Ah, true,' replied the jeweller, and he reset the stone.' No matter, observed Caderousse, replacing the box in his pocket. Someone else will purchase it. Yes, continued the jeweller, but someone else will not be so easy as I am, or content himself with the same story. It is not natural that a man like you should possess such a diamond. He will inform against you. You will have to find the Abbey Bassoni, and abbeys who give diamonds worth a thousand louis are rare. The law would seize it and put you in prison, and if at the end of three or four months you are set at liberty, the ring will be lost, or a false stone worth three francs will be given to you instead of a diamond worth fifty thousand, or perhaps fifty-five thousand francs, from which you must allow that one runs considerable risk in purchasing. Caderousse and his wife looked eagerly at each other. No, said Caderousse, we are not rich enough to lose five thousand francs. "'As you please, my dear sir,' said the jeweller. "'I had, however, as you see, bought the money in bright coin, "'and he drew from his pocket a handful of gold, "'and held it sparkling before the dazzled eyes of the innkeeper, "'and in the other hand he held a packet of banknotes. 
There was evidently a severe struggle in the mind of Caderousse. It was plain that the small chagrin case, which he had turned over in his hand, did not seem to him commensurate in value to the enormous sum which fascinated his gaze. He turned towards his wife. "'What do you think of this?' he asked in a low voice. "'Let him have it, let him have it,' she said. "'If he returns to Beaucaire without the diamond, he will inform against us. "'And as he says, who knows if we shall ever again see the Abbey Busoni? "'In all probability he will never see him.' "'Well, then, so I will,' says Caderousse. "'So you may have the diamond for forty-five thousand francs. "'But my wife wants a gold chain, and I want a pair of silver buckles.' "'The jeweller drew from his pocket a long flat box, "'which contained several samples of the articles demanded. "'Here,' he said, "'I am very straightforward in my dealing. "'Take your choice.' "'The woman selected a gold chain worth about five louis.' and the husband a pair of buckles worth perhaps fifteen francs. I hope you will not complain now, said the jeweller. The abbe told me it was worth fifty thousand francs, muttered Caderousse. Come on, give it to me. What a strange fellow you are, said the jeweller, taking the diamond in his own hand. I give you forty-five thousand francs. That is two thousand five hundred livres of income. "'a fortune such as I wish I had myself, "'and you are not satisfied.' "'Then the five and forty thousand francs,' "'inquired Caderousse in a hoarse voice. "'Where are they? Come, let us see them.' "'Here they are,' replied the jeweller, "'and he counted out upon the table fifteen thousand francs in gold "'and thirty thousand francs in banknotes. "'Wait while I light the lamp,' said La Caconte. It is growing dark, and there may be some mistake. In fact, night had come on during this conversation, and with night the storm which had been threatening for the last half hour. The thunder growled in the distance, but it was apparently not heard by the jeweller, Caderousse, or La Caconte, absorbed as they all three were with the demon of game. I myself felt a strange kind of fascination at the sight of all this gold and all these banknotes. It seemed to me that I was in a dream, and, as it always happens in a dream, I felt myself riveted to the spot. Caderousse counted and again counted the gold and the notes, then handed them to his wife, who counted and counted them again in her turn. During this time the jeweller made the diamond play and sparkle in the lamplight, and the gem threw out jets of light which made him unmindful of those which precursors of the storm, began to play at the window. "'Well,' inquired the jeweller, "'is the cash all right?' "'Yes,' said Caderousse. "'Give me the pocket-book, la caconte, "'and find a bag somewhere.' La caconte went to a cupboard and returned with an old leathern pocket-book and a bag. From the former she took some greasy letters and put in their place the bank-notes and from the bag took two or three crowns of six livres each, which in all probability formed the entire fortune of the miserable couple. There, said Caderousse, and now, although you have wronged us of perhaps ten thousand francs, will you have your supper with us? I invite you with good will. Thank you, replied the jeweller. It must be getting late, and I must return to Beaucaire. My wife will be getting uneasy. He drew out his watch and exclaimed, "'Mon bleu! Nearly nine o'clock! Why, I shall not get back to Beaucaire before midnight. Good night, my friends. If the Abbe Bassani should by any vile accident return, think of me.' "'In another week you will have left Beaucaire,' remarked Caderousse, "'for the fair ends in only a few days.' "'True, but that makes no difference. Write to me at Paris.' To Monsieur Jeannes, in the Palais Royal, Arcade Pierre, number 45. I will make the journey on purpose to see him, if it is worth while. At this moment there was a tremendous clap of thunder, accompanied by a flash of lightning, so vivid that it quite eclipsed the light of the lamp. See here, exclaimed Caderousse, you cannot think of going out in such weather as this. Oh, I am not afraid of thunder, said the jeweller. "'And then there are robbers,' said La Caracon. 
"'The road is never very safe during fair time.' "'Oh, as to the robbers,' said Joanne, "'here is something for them.' "'And he drew from his pocket a pair of small pistols loaded to the muzzle. "'Here,' said he, "'are dogs who bark and bite at the same time. "'They are for the first two who shall have a longing for your diamond, friend Caderousse. Caderousse and his wife again interchanged the meaningful look. It seemed as though they were both inspired at the same time with some horrible thought. "'Well, then, a good journey to you,' said Caderousse. "'Thanks,' replied the jeweller. He took his cane, which he had placed against an old cupboard, and went out. The moment when he opened the door, such a gust of wind came in that the lamp was nearly extinguished. "'Oh,' said he, "'this is very nice weather, and two leaks to go in such a storm.' Remain, said Caderousse, you can sleep here. Yes, do stay, added La Cacon in a tremulous voice. We'll take every care of you. No, I must sleep at Beaucaire. So once more, good night. Caderousse followed him slowly to the threshold. I can see neither heaven nor earth, said the jeweller who was outside the door. Do I turn to the right or to the left hand? To the right said Caderousse, you cannot go wrong. The road is bordered by trees on both sides. Good, all right, said a voice, almost lost in the distance. Close the door, said La Caconte. I do not like open doors when it thunders. Particularly when there was money in the house, eh? answered Caderousse, double-locking the door. He came into the room, went to the cupboard, took out the bag and pocket-book, and both began, for the third time, to count their golden bank-notes. I never saw such an expression of cupidity as the flickering lamp revealed in those two countenances. The woman, especially, was hideous. Her usual feverish tremulousness was intensified, her countenance had become livid, and her eyes resembled burning coals. "'Why?' she inquired in a hoarse whisper. "'Why did you invite him to sleep here to-night?' "'Why?' said Caderousse with a shudder. "'Why, that he might not have the trouble of returning to Beaucaire?' "'Ah,' responded the woman, with an expression impossible to describe. "'I thought it was for something else.' "'Woman, woman, why do you have such ideas?' it cried Caderousse. "'Or well, if you have them, why don't you keep them to yourself?' "'Well,' said La Caconte, after a moment's pause, "'you are not a man.' "'What do you mean?' added Caderousse. "'If you had been a man, you would not have let him go from here.' "'Woman. "'Or else he should not have reached Beaucaire. "'Woman. "'The road takes a turn. "'He is obliged to follow it, "'while alongside of the canal there is a shorter road. "'Woman. You offend the good God there. Listen. And at this moment there was a tremendous peal of thunder, while the livid lightning illumined the room, and the thunder rolling away at the distance seemed to withdraw unwillingly from the cursed abode. Mercy, said Caderousse, crossing himself. At the same moment, and in the midst of the terrifying silence which usually follows a clap of thunder, they heard a knocking at the door. Caderousse and his wife started and looked aghast at each other. "'Who's there?' cried Caderousse, rising and drawing up in a heap the golden notes scattered over the table, which he covered with his two hands. "'It is I,' shouted a voice. "'And who are you?' "'Oh, pas de Joanne's the jeweller. "'Well, and you said I offended the good God.' said Cacont with a horrible smile. Why, the good God sends him back again. Caderousse sank pale and breathless into his chair. La Cacont, on the contrary, rose and going with a firm step toward the door, opened and sang as she did so, Come in, dear Monsieur Joanne. Ma foi, said the jeweller, drenched with rain, I am not destined to return to Beauclair tonight. The shortest follies are the best, my dear Caderousse. You offered me hospitality, and I accept it, and have returned to sleep beneath your friendly roof. Caderousse stumbled out something, while he wiped away the sweat that started to his brow. La Cacon double-locked the door behind the jeweller. End of chapter 44
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ana Sofia Simão de Portugal. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 45 The Reign of Blood. As the jeweler returned to the apartment, he cast around him a scrutinizing glance. But there was nothing to excite suspicion if it did not exist, or to confirm it if it were already awakened. Caderousse's hand still grasped the gold and banknotes, and, like Arconte, called up her sweetest smiles while welcoming the reappearance of their guest. "'Well, well,' said the jeweler, "'you seem, my good friends, to have had some fears respecting the accuracy of your money, by counting it over so carefully directly as I was gone.' "'Oh, no,' answered Caderousse. That was not my reason, I can assure you. But circumstances by which we have become possessed of this wealth are so unexpected as to make us scarcely credit our good fortune, and it is only by placing the actual proof of our riches before our eyes that we can persuade ourselves that all affairs is not a dream. The jeweler smiled. Have you any other guests in your house? inquired he. Nobody but ourselves, replied Caderousse. The fact is, we do not lodge travellers. Indeed, our tavern is so near the town that nobody would think of stopping here. Then I am afraid I shall very much inconvenience you. Inconveniences? Not at all, my dear sir, said like our count in her most gracious manner. Not at all, I assure you. But where will you manage to stow me? In the chamber overhead? Surely, that is where you yourself sleep. Never mind that. We have had a second bed in the adjoining room. Caderousse stared at his wife with much astonishment. The jeweler, meanwhile, was humming a song as he stood warming his back at fire like our count had kindled to dry the wet garments of her guest. And this done, she next occupied herself in arranging his supper by spreading a napkin at the end of the table and placing on it slender remains of their dinner, to which she added three or four fresh laid eggs. Caderousse had once more parted with his treasure. The banknotes were replaced in the pocket book, the gold put back into the bag, and hole carefully locked in the cupboard. He then began pacing the room with a pensive and gloomy air, glancing from time to time at the jeweler who stood drinking with steam from his wet clothes, and merely changing his place on the warm earth, to enable the whole of his garments to be dried. There, said La Carconte, as she placed a bottle of wine on the table. Supper is ready whenever you are. And you? asked Joannes. I don't want any supper, said Caderousse. We dine so very late hastily interposed La Carconte. Then it seems I am to eat alone, remarked the jeweler. Oh, we shall have the pleasure of waiting upon you, answered La Carconte, with an eager attention she was not accustomed to manifest even to guests who paid for what they took. From time to time, Caderousse darted on his wife keen, searching glances, but rapid as lightning flash. The storm still continued. There, there, said La Carconte. Do you hear that? Upon my word, you did well to come back. Nevertheless, replied the jeweler, if by the time I have finished my supper the tempest has at all abated, I shall make another start. It's the mistral, said Cadrus, and it will be sure to last till tomorrow morning. He sighed heavily. Well, said the jeweler, as he placed himself at table. All I can say is, so much the worse for those who are abroad. Yes, chimed in like our count. They will have a wretched night of it. The jeweler began eating his supper, and the woman, who was ordinarily so careless and indifferent to all who approached her, was suddenly transformed into the most smiling and attentive hostess. Had the unhappy man on whom she lavished her assiduities been previously acquainted with her, 
so sudden an alteration might well have excited suspicion in his mind, or at least have greatly astonished him. Cadarus, meanwhile, continued to place the room in gloomy silence, seriously avoiding the sight of his guests. But as soon as the stranger had completed his repast, the agitated innkeeper went eagerly to the door and opened it. "'I believe the storm is over,' said he. But, as if to contradict this statement, at that instant a violent clap of thunder seemed to shake the house to its very foundation, while a sudden gust of wind, mingled with rain, extinguished the lamp he held in his hand. Trembling and awe struck, Caderousse hastily shut the door and returned to his guest, while like Arconte lighted the candle by the smoldering ashes that glimmered on the earth. "'You must be tired,' said she to the jeweler. I have sprayed a pair of white sheets on your bed. Go up when you are ready and sleep well. Joanne stayed for a while to see whether the storm seemed to abate in its fury, but the brief space of time sufficed to assure him that, instead of diminishing, the violence of the rain and thunder momentarily increased. Resigning himself, therefore, to what seemed inevitable, he bade his host good night and mounted the stairs. He passed over my head and I heard the flooring creak beneath his footsteps. The quick, eager glance of La Carconte followed him as he ascended, while Cadarus, on the contrary, turned his back and seemed most anxiously to avoid even glancing at him. All the circumstances did not strike me as painfully at the time as they have since done. In fact, all that had happened, with the exception of the story of the diamond which certainly did wear an air of improbability, appeared natural enough, and called for neither apprehension nor mistrust. But, worn out as I was with fatigue, and fully proposing to proceed onwards directly the tempest abated, I determined to obtain a few hours' sleep. Overhead I could actually distinguish every movement of the jeweler, who, after making the best arrangements in his power for passing a comfortable night, threw himself on his bed and I could hear it break and groan beneath his weight. Insensibly my eyelids grew heavily. Deep sleep stole over me, and having no suspicion of anything wrong, I sought not to shake it off. I looked at the kitchen once more, and saw Caderousse sitting by the side of a long table upon one of the low wooden stools, which in country places are frequently used instead of chairs. His back was turned towards me, so that I could not see the expression of his countenance. Neither should I have been able to do so had he been placed differently, as his head was buried between his two hands. Lacarconte continued to gaze on him for some time, then, shrugging her shoulders, she took her seat immediately opposite to him. At this moment the expiring embers threw up a fresh flame from the kindling of a piece of wood that lay near, and a bright light flashed over the room. La Carconte still kept her eyes fixed on her husband, but, as he made no sign of changing his position, she extended her hard, bony hand and touched him on the forehead. Cadreus shuddered. The woman's lips seemed to move, as though she were talking, but because she merely spoke in an undertone, or my senses were dulled by sleep, I did not catch a word she uttered. Confused sights and sounds seemed to float before me, and gradually I fell into a deep, heavy slumber. How long I had been in this unconscious state I know not, when I was suddenly aroused by the report of a pistol, followed by a fearful cry. Weak and chattering footsteps resounded across the chamber above me, and next instant at all, heavy weights seemed to fall powerless on the staircase. I had not yet fully recovered consciousness when again I heard groans, mingled with half stiff cries, as if from persons engaged in a deadly struggle. A cry more prolonged than the others, and ending in a series of groans, effectually rose me from my drowsy lethargy. Hastily raising myself on one arm, I looked around, but all was dark, and it seemed to me as if the rain must have penetrated through the flooring of the room above, for some kind of moisture appeared to fall, drop by drop, upon my forehead and when I passed my hand across my brow, I felt that it was wet and clammy. To the fearful noises that had awakened me had succeeded the most perfect silence. 
unbroken, save by the footsteps of a man walking about in the chamber above. The staircase creaked, he descended into the room below, approached fire and lit a candle. The man was Caderous. He was pale and his shirt was all blood. Having obtained the light, he hurried upstairs again, and once more I heard his rapid and uneasy footsteps. A moment later he came down again, holding in his hand a small shagrin case which he opened to assure himself it contained the diamond. Seemed to hesitate as to which pocket he should put it in, then, as if dissatisfied with the security of the inner pocket, he deposited it in his red handkerchief, which he carefully rolled round his head. After this, he took from his cupboard the banknotes and the gold he had put there, thrust one into the pocket of his trousers and the other into that of his waistcoat, hastily tied up a small bundle of linen, and rushing towards the door, disappeared in the darkness of the night. Then all became clear and manifest to me, and I reproached myself with what had happened, as though I myself had done the guilty deed. I fancied that I still heard faint moans, and imagining that the unfortunate jeweler might not be quite dead, I determined to go to his relief by way of atoning in some slight degree, not for the crime I had committed, but for that which I had not endeavored to prevent. For this purpose, I applied all the strength I possessed to force an entrance from the cramped spot in which I lay to the adjoining room. The poorly fastened boards, which alone divided me from it, yelled to my efforts, and I found myself in the house. Hastily snatching up the lighted candle, I hurried to the staircase. About midway, a body was lying across the stairs. It was that of La Carconte. The pistol I had heard had doubtless been fired at her. The shot had frightfully lacerated her throat, leaving two gaping wounds from which, as well as the mouth, the blood was pouring in floods. She was stone dead. I strode past her and descended into the sleeping chamber, which presented an appearance of the wildest disorder. The furniture had been knocked over in the deadly struggle that had taken place there, and the sheets, to which the unfortunate jewelry had doubtless clung, were dragged across the room. The murdered man lay on the floor, his head leaning against the wall, and about him was a pool of blood which poured forth from three large wounds in his breast. There was a fourth gash, in which a long table knife was plunged up to the handle. I stumbled over some object. I stopped to examine. It was the second pistol, which had not gone off, probably from the powder being wet. I approached the jeweler who was not quite dead, and at the sound of my footsteps and the creaking of the door, he opened his eyes, fixed them on me with an anxious and inquiring gaze, moved his lips, as though trying to speak, then, overcome by the effort, fell back and expired. This appealing sight almost bereft me of my senses, and finding that I could no longer be of service to anyone in the house, my only desire was to fly. I rushed towards the staircase, clutching my hair and uttering a groan of horror. Upon reaching the room below, I found five or six custom house officers and two or three gendarmes, all heavily armed. They threw themselves upon me. I made no resistance. I was no longer master of my senses. When I strove to speak, a few inarticulate sounds alone escaped my lips. As I noticed the significant manner in which the old party pointed to my blood-stained garments, I involuntarily surveyed myself, and then I discovered that the thick warm drops that had so bedwetted me as I lay beneath the staircase must have been the blood of La Carconte. I pointed to the spot where I had concealed myself. What does he mean? asked the gendarme. One of the officers went to the place I had directed. He means, replied the man upon his return that he got in that way, and he showed all I had made when I broke through. Then I saw that they took me for the assassin. I recovered force and energy enough to free myself from the hands of those who held me, while I managed to stammer forth. I did not do it. Indeed, indeed I did not. A couple of gendarmes held the muzzles of their carbines against my breast. Stubborn a step, said they. And you are a dead man. Why should you threaten me with death? cried I. 
when I have already declared my innocence. Tush, tush, cried the man. Keep your innocent stories to tell to the judge at Nimes. Meanwhile, come along with us, and the best advice we can give you is to do so unresistingly. Alice resisted was far from my thought. I was utterly overpowered by surprise and terror, and without a word I suffered myself to the handcuffed and tied to a horse's tail, and thus they took me to Nimes. I had been tracked by a customs officer, who had lost sight of me near the tavern. Feeling certain that I intended to pass the night there, he had returned to summon his comrades, who just arrived in time to hear the report of the pistol, and to take me in the midst of such circumstantial proofs of my guilt, and rendered all hopes of proving my innocence utterly futile. One only chance was left me. That of beseeching the magistrate before whom I was taken to cause every inquiry to be made from the Abbey Busoni, who had stopped at the inn of the pond to guard us that morning. If Cadderwolf had invented the story relative to the diamond, and there existed no such person as the Abbey Busoni, then, indeed, I was lost past redemption, or at least my love hung upon the feeble chance of Cadderwolf himself being apprehended and confessing the old truth. Two months have passed away in hopeless expectation on my part, while I must do the magistrate justice to say that he used every means to obtain information of the person I declared could exculpate me if he could. Cadderwood still evaded all pursuit, and I had resigned myself to what seemed my inevitable fate. My trial was to come on at the approaching assizes, when, on the 8th of September, that is to say, Precisely three months and five days after the events which had perilled my life, the Abbe Busoni, whom I never ventured to believe I should see, presented himself at the prison doors, saying he understood one of the prisoners wished to speak to him. He added that, having learned at Marseilles particulars of my imprisonment, he hastened to comply with my desire. You may easily imagine with what eagerness I welcomed him and how minutely I related the whole of what I had seen and heard. I felt some degree of nervousness as I entered upon the history of the diamond, but, to my inexpressible astonishment, he confirmed it in every particular, and to my equal surprise, he seemed to place entire belief in all I said. And then it was that, won by his mild charity, seeing that he was acquainted with all the habits and customs of my own country, and considering also that pardon for the only crime of which I was really guilty might come with a double power from lips so benevolent and kind, I besought him to receive my confession, under the seal of which I recounted the Ottawil affair in all its details, as well as every other transaction of my life. That which I had done by the impulse of my best feelings produced the same effect as though it had been the result of calculation. My voluntary confession of the assassination at Artwell proved to him that I had not committed that of which I stood accused. When he quitted me, he bade me of good courage, and to rely upon his doing all in his power to convince my judges of my innocence. I get speedy proofs that the excellent Abby was engaged in my behalf, for the rigors of my imprisonment were alleviated by many trifling, though acceptable indulgences, and I was told that my trial was to be postponed to the assizes following those now being held. In the interim, it pleased Providence to cause the apparition of Cadrus, who was discovered in some distant country, and brought back to France, where he made a full confession, refusing to make the fact of his wife's having suggested and arranged murder an excuse for his own guilt. The wretched man was sentenced to the gladness for life, and I was immediately set at liberty. And then it was, I presume, said Monte Cristo, that you came to me as the bearer of a letter from Abbe Busoni. It was, Your Excellency. The benevolent Abbe took an evident interest in all that concerned me. Your mode of life as a smuggler, said he to me one day, will be the ruin of you. If you get out, don't take it up again. But how, inquired I, am I to maintain myself and my poor sister? A person, whose confessor I am, replied he, and who entertains a high regard for me, 
apply to me a short time since to procure him a confidential servant. Would you like such a post? If so, I'll give you a letter of introduction to him. Oh, father, I exclaimed, you are very good. But you must swear solely that I shall never reason to repent my recommendation. I extended my hand and was about to pledge myself by any promise he would detect, but he stopped me. It is unnecessary for you to bind yourself by any vow, said he. I know and admire the Corsican nature too well to fear you. Here, take this, continued he, after rapidly writing a few lines I brought to your excellency, and upon receipt of which you deign to receive me into your service, and proudly I ask whether your excellency has ever had cause to repent having done so. No, replied the count. I take pleasure in saying that you have served me faithfully, Bertuccio, but you might have shown more confidence in me. I, your excellency? Yes, you. How comes it that having both a sister and an adopted son, you have never spoken to me of either? Alas, I have still to recount the most distressing period of my life. Anxious as you might suppose I was to behold and comfort my dear sister, I lost no time in hastening to Corsica. But when I arrived at Rogliano, I found a house of mourning, the consequences of a scene so horrible that neighbors remember and speak of it to this day. Acting by my advice, my poor sister had refused to comply with the unreasonable demands of Benedetto, who was continually tormenting her for money, as long as he believed there was a soul left in her possession. One morning that he had demanded money, threatening her with the severest consequences if she did not supply him with what he desired, he disappeared and remained away all day, leaving the kind heart of the Sunta, who loved him as if he were her own child, to ebb over his conduct and bewail his absence. Evening came, and still, with all the patient solicitude of a mother, she watched for his return. As the eleventh hour struck, he entered the swaggering air, attended by two of the most dissolute and reckless of his boon companions. She stretched out her arms to him, but they seized hold of her, and one of the three, none other than the accursed Benedetto, exclaimed, Put her to torture, and she'll soon tell us where her money is. It unfortunately happened that our neighbor, Vasilio, was at Bastia, leaving no person in his house but his wife. No human creature beside could hear or see anything that took place within our dwelling. Two held for the Sunta, who, unable to conceive that any harm was intended to her, smiled in the face of those who were soon to become her executioners. The third proceeded to barricade the doors and windows, then returned, and the three, united in stifling the cries of terror incited by the sight of these preparations, and then dragged the sun to feet foremost towards the brazier, expecting to wring from her an avowal of where her supposed treasure was secreted. In the struggle, her clothes caught fire, and they were obliged to let go their hold in order to preserve themselves from sharing the same fate. Covered with flames, Asunta rushed wildly to the door, but it was fastened. She flew to the windows, but they were also secured. Then the neighbors heard frightful shrieks. It was Asunta calling for help. The cries died away in groans, and next morning, as soon as Basilio's wife could muster up courage to venture abroad, she caused the door of our dwelling to be opened by the public authorities, when Asunta, although dreadfully burned, was found still breathing. Every drawer and closet in the house had been forced open, and money stolen. Benedetto never again appeared at Rogliano, neither have I since that day either seen or heard anything concerning him. It was subsequently to this dreadful event that I waited on Your Excellency, to whom it would have been folly to have mentioned Benedetto, since all trace of him seemed entirely lost, or of my sister since she was dead. And in what light did you view the occurrence? inquired Monte Cristo. As a punishment for the crime I had committed, answered Bertuccio. Oh, those Villeforts are an accursed race. Truly they are, murmured the Count in a lugubrious tone. And now, resumed Bertuccio, your Excellency may, perhaps, be able to comprehend that this place, 
which I revisit for the first time, this garden, the actual scene of my crime, must have given rise to reflections of no very agreeable nature, and produced that gloom and repression of spirit which excited the notice of your excellency, who was pleased to express a desire to know the cause. At this instant a shudder passes over me as I reflect that, possibly, I am now standing on the very grave in which lies Monsieur de Villefort, by whose hand the ground was dug to receive the corpse of his child. Everything is possible, said Monte Cristo, rising from the bench on which he had been sitting. Even, he added in an inaudible voice, even that the procureur be not dead. The Edibusone did right to send you to me. He went on in his ordinary tone. And you have done well in relating to me the whole of your history, as it will prevent my forming any erroneous opinion concerning you in future. As for that Benedetto, who so grossly bellied his name, have you never made any effort to trace out whither he has gone, or what has become of him? No. Far from wishing to learn whither he has betaken himself, I should shun the possibility of meeting him as I would a wild beast. Thank God, I have never heard his name mentioned by any person, and I hope and believe he is dead. Do not think so, Petruccio, replied the Count for the wicked are not so easily disposed of, for God seems to have them under his special watch care, to make of them instruments of his vengeance. So be it, responded Bertuccio. All I ask of heaven is that I may never see him again. And now, Your Excellency, he added, bowing his head, you know everything, you are my judge on earth, as the Almighty is in heaven. Have you for me no words of consolation? My good friend, I can only repeat the words addressed to you by the Abbe Bosoni. Villefort merited punishment for what he had done to you, and perhaps to others. Benedetto, if still living, will become the instrument of divine retribution in some way or other, and then be dully punished in his turn. As far as you yourself are concerned, I see but one point in which you are really guilty. Ask yourself, wherefore, after rescuing the infant from its living grave, you did not restore it to its mother. There was a crime, Bertuccio. That was where you became really culpable. True, Excellency, that was a crime, the real crime, for in that I acted like a coward. My first duty, directly I had succeeded in recalling the babe to life, was to restore it to its mother. But, in order to do so, I must have made close and careful inquiry, which would, in our probability, have led to my own apprehension. And I clung to life, partly on my sister's account, and partly from that feeling of pride inborn in our hearts of desire to come off untouched and victorious in the execution of our vengeance. Perhaps, too, the natural and instinctive love of life made me wish to avoid endangering my own. And then, again, I am not as brave and courageous as was my poor brother. Bertuccio hid his face in his hands as he uttered these words, while Monte Cristo fixed on him a look of inscrutable meaning. After a brief silence, rendered still more solemn by the time and place, the Count said, in a tone of melancholy, wholly unlike his usual manner, in order to bring this conversation to a fitting termination, the last we shall ever hold upon this subject, I will repeat to you some words I have heard from the lips of the Abbe Bosoni. For all evils, there are two remedies, time and silence. And now leave me, Monsieur Bertuccio, to walk alone here in the garden. The very circumstances which inflict on you, as a principal in this tragic scene enacted here, such painful emotions, are to me, on the contrary, a source of something like contentment and serve but to enhance the value of this dwelling in my estimation. The chief beauty of trees consists in the deep shadow of their embroidered bots, while fancy pictures of moving multitude of shapes and forms flitting and passing beneath that shade. Here I have a garden laid out in such a way as to afford the fullest scope of the imagination, and furnish with thick ground trees, beneath whose leafy scream a visionary like myself may conjure up phantoms at will. 
this to me, who expected but to find a blank enclosure surrounded by a straight wall, is, I assure you, a most agreeable surprise. I have no fear of ghosts, and I have never heard it said that so much harm had been done by the dead during six thousand years as it wrought by the living in a single day. Retire within, Bertuccio, and tranquilize your mind. Should your confessor be less indulgent to you in your dying moments than you found the Abbe Pozzoni, send for me, if I am still on earth, and I will soothe your ears with words that shall effectually calm and soothe your parting soul, here it goes forth to traverse the ocean called eternity. Bertuccio bowed respectfully and turned away, sighing heavily. Monte Cristo, left alone, took three or four steps onwards and murmured, Here, beneath this plain tree, must have been where the infant's grave was dug. There is little door opening to the garden. At this corner is a private staircase communicating with sleeping apartment. There will be no necessity for me to make a note of these particulars, for there, before my eyes, beneath my feet, all around me, I have the plan sketch with all the living reality of truth. After making the tour of the garden a second time, the Count re-entered his carriage, while Bertuccio, who perceived the thoughtful expression of his master's features, took his seat beside the driver without uttering a word. The carriage proceeded rapidly towards Paris. That same evening, upon reaching his abode in Champs Elysees, the Count of Monte Cristo went over the old building with the air of one long acquainted with its nook or corner. Nor, although preceding the party, did he once mistake one door for another, or commit the smallest error when choosing any particular corridor or staircase to conduct him to a place or suit of rooms he desired to visit. Ali was his principal attendant during this nocturnal survey. Having given various orders to Bertuccio, relative to the improvements and alterations he desired to make in the house, the Count, drawing out his watch, said to the attentive Nubian, It is half past eleven o'clock. Heidi will soon be here. Had the fresh attendants been summoned to await her coming? Ali extended his hands towards the apartments destined for the fair Greek, which were so effectually concealed by means of a tapestried entrance that it would have puzzled most curious to have divined their existence. Ali, having pointed to the apartments, held up three fingers of his right hand, and then, placing it beneath his head, shut his eyes, and feigned to sleep. I understand, said Monte Cristo, well acquainted with Alice Pantomime. You mean to tell me that three female attendants await their new mistress in her sleeping chamber? Ali, with considerable animation, made a sign in the affirmative. Madame will be tired tonight, continued Monte Cristo, and will, no doubt, wish to rest. Desired fresh attendants not to worry her with questions, but merely to pay their, their respectful duty and retire. You will also see that the Greek servants hold no communication with those of this country. He bowed. Just at that moment, voices were heard hailing the concierge. The gate opened, a carriage rolled down the avenue and stopped at steps. The Count hastily descended, presented himself at the already opened carriage door, and held out his hand to a young woman, completely enveloped in a green silk mantle heavily embroidered with gold. She raised the hand extended towards her to her lips, and kissed it with a mixture of love and respect. Some few words passed between them in that sonorous language in which Homer makes his gods converse. The young woman spoke with an expression of deep tenderness, while the Count replied with an air of gentle gravity. Preceded by Ali, who carried the rose-colored flambeau in his hand, the newcomer, who was no other than the lovely Greek who had been Monte Cristo's companion in Italy, was conducted to her apartments, while the Count retired to the pavilion reserved for himself. In another hour every light in the house was extinguished, and it might have been thought that all its inmates slept. End of chapter 45「Chapter 45 of The Count of Monte Cristo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Forty Five: The Reign of Blood. As the jeweller returned to the apartment, he cast round him a scrutinizing glance, but there was nothing to excite suspicion if it did not exist, or to confirm it if it were already awakened. Caderousse's hands still grasped the gold and banknotes, and La Carconte called up her sweetest smiles while welcoming the reappearance of their guest. "'Well, well,' said the jeweller, "'you seem, my good friends, to have had some fears respecting the accuracy of your money, by counting it over so carefully directly I was gone.' "'Oh, no,' answered Caderousse, "'that was not my reason, I can assure you. But the circumstances by which we have become possessed of this wealth are so unexpected as to make us scarcely credit our good fortune, and it is only by placing the actual proof of our riches before our eyes that we can persuade ourselves that the whole affair is not a dream." The jeweller smiled. "'Have you any other guests in your house?' inquired he. "'Nobody but ourselves,' replied Caderousse. "'The fact is, we do not lodge travellers. Indeed, our tavern is so near the town that nobody would think of stopping here. Then I am afraid I shall very much inconvenience you." "'Inconvenience us? Not at all, my dear sir,' said La Carconte, in her most gracious manner. "'Not at all, I assure you. But where will you manage to stow me? In the chamber overhead. Surely that is where you yourself sleep.' "'Never mind that. We have a second bed in the adjoining room. Caderousse stared at his wife with much astonishment. The jeweller, meanwhile, was humming a song as he stood warming his back at the fire La Carconte had kindled to dry the wet garments of her guest, and this done she next occupied herself in arranging his supper, by spreading a napkin at the end of the table and placing on it the slender remains of their dinner, to which she added three or four fresh-laid eggs. Caderousse had once more parted with his treasure. The banknotes were replaced in the pocket-book, the gold put back into the bag, and the whole carefully locked in the cupboard. He then began pacing the room with a pensive and gloomy air, glancing from time to time at the jeweller who stood reeking with the steam from his wet clothes, and merely changing his place on the warm hearth to enable the whole of his garments to be dried. "'There,' said La Carconte, as she placed a bottle of wine on the table, "'supper is ready whenever you are.' "'And you?' asked Johannes. "'I don't want any supper,' said Caderousse. "'We dined so very late,' hastily interposed La Carconte. "'Then it seems I am to eat alone,' remarked the jeweller. "'Oh, we shall have the pleasure of waiting upon you,' answered La Carconte, with an eager attention she was not accustomed to manifest, even to guests who paid for what they took. From time to time Caderousse darted on his wife keen, searching glances, but rapid as the lightning flash. The storm still continued. "'There, there,' said La Carconte. "'Do you hear that? Upon my word, you did well to come back.' "'Nevertheless,' replied the jeweller, "'if by the time I have finished my supper the tempest has at all abated, I shall make another start.' "'It's the Mistral,' said Caderousse and it will be sure to last till to-morrow morning." He sighed heavily. "'Well,' said the jeweller, as he placed himself at the table, "'all I can say is so much the worse for those who are abroad.' "'Yes,' chimed in La Carconte, "'they will have a wretched night of it.' The jeweller began eating his supper, and the woman, who was ordinarily so querulous and indifferent to all who approached her, was suddenly transformed into the most smiling and attentive hostess. Had the unhappy man on whom she lavished her assiduities been previously acquainted with her, so sudden an alteration might well have excited suspicion in his mind, or at least have greatly astonished him. Caderousse, meanwhile, continued to pace the room in gloomy silence, sedulously avoiding the sight of his guest. But as soon as the stranger had completed his repast, the agitated innkeeper went eagerly to the door and opened it. "'I believe the storm is over,' said he but as if to contradict his statement, at that instant a violent clap of thunder seemed to shake the house to its very foundation, while a sudden gust of wind, mingled with rain, 
extinguished the lamp he held in his hand. Trembling and awestruck, Caderousse hastily shut the door and returned to his guest, while La Carconte lighted a candle by the smouldering ashes that glimmered on the hearth. "'You must be tired,' said she to the jeweller. "'I have spread a pair of white sheets on your bed. Go up when you are ready, and sleep well.' Johannes stayed for a while, to see whether the storm seemed to abate in its fury, but a brief space of time sufficed to assure him that, instead of diminishing, the violence of the rain and thunder momentarily increased. Resigning himself, therefore, to what seemed inevitable, he bade his host good-night, and mounted the stairs. He passed over my head, and I heard the flooring creak beneath his footsteps. The quick, eager glance of La Carconte followed him as he ascended, while Caderousse, on the contrary, turned his back, and seemed most anxiously to avoid even glancing at him. All these circumstances did not strike me as painfully at the time as they have since done. In fact, all that had happened, with the exception of the story of the diamond, which certainly did wear an air of improbability, appeared natural enough, and called for neither apprehension nor mistrust. But, worn out as I was with fatigue, and fully purposing to proceed onwards directly the tempest abated, I determined to obtain a few hours' sleep. Overhead I could accurately distinguish every movement of the jeweller, who, after making the best arrangements in his power for passing a comfortable night, threw himself on his bed, and I could hear it creak and groan beneath his weight. Insensibly my eyelids grew heavy, deep sleep stole over me, and having no suspicion of anything wrong, I sought not to shake it off. I looked into the kitchen once more, and saw Caderousse sitting by the side of a long table, upon one of the low wooden stools which in country places are frequently used instead of chairs. His back was turned towards me, so that I could not see the expression of his countenance. Neither should I have been able to do so had he been placed differently, as his head was buried between his two hands. La Carconte continued to gaze on him for some time, then, shrugging her shoulders, she took her seat immediately opposite to him. At this moment the expiring embers threw up a fresh flame from the kindling of a piece of wood that lay near, and a bright light flashed over the room. La Carconte still kept her eyes fixed on her husband, but as he made no sign of changing his position, she extended her hard, bony hand and touched him on the forehead. Caderousse shuddered. The woman's lips seemed to move as though she were talking, but because she merely spoke in an undertone, or my senses were dulled by sleep, I did not catch a word she uttered. Confused sights and sounds seemed to float before me, and gradually I fell into a deep, heavy slumber. Confused sights and sounds seemed to float before me, and gradually I fell into a deep, heavy slumber. How long I had been in this unconscious state, I know not, when I was suddenly aroused by the report of a pistol, followed by a fearful cry. Weak and tottering footsteps resounded across the chamber above me, and the next instant a dull, heavy weight seemed to fall powerless on the staircase. I had not yet fully recovered consciousness when again I heard groans, mingled with half-stifled cries, as if from persons engaged in a deadly struggle. A cry more prolonged than the others, and ending in a series of groans, effectually roused me from my drowsy lethargy. Hastily raising myself on one arm, I looked around, but all was dark, and it seemed to me as if the rain must have penetrated through the flooring of the room above, for some kind of moisture appeared to fall drop by drop upon my forehead, and when I passed my hand across my brow I felt that it was wet and clammy. To the fearful noises that had awakened me had succeeded the most perfect silence, unbroken, save by the footsteps of a man walking about in the chamber above. The staircase creaked. He descended into the room below, approached the fire, and lit a candle. The man was Caderousse. He was pale, and his shirt was all bloody. Having obtained the light, he hurried upstairs again, and once more I heard his rapid and uneasy footsteps. A moment later he came down again, holding in his hand the small chagrin case, which he opened to assure himself it contained the diamond, seemed to hesitate as to which pocket he should put it in, then, 
as if dissatisfied with the security of either pocket, he deposited it in his red handkerchief, which he carefully rolled round his head. After this he took from his cupboard the bank-notes and gold he had put there, thrust the one into the pocket of his trousers, and the other into that of his waistcoat, hastily tied up a small bundle of linen, and rushing towards the door, disappeared into the darkness of the night. Then all became clear and manifest to me, and I reproached myself with what had happened, as though I myself had done the guilty deed. I fancied that I still heard faint moans, and, imagining that the unfortunate jeweller might not be quite dead, I determined to go to his relief, by way of atoning in some slight degree, not for the crime I had committed, but for that which I had not endeavoured to prevent. For this purpose I applied all the strength I possessed to force an entrance from the cramped spot in which I lay to the adjoining room. The poorly fastened boards which alone divided me from it yielded to my efforts, and I found myself in the house. Hastily snatching up the lighted candle, I hurried to the staircase. About midway a body was lying quite across the stairs. It was that of La Carcante. The pistol I had heard had doubtless been fired at her. The shot had frightfully lacerated her throat, leaving two gaping wounds, from which, as well as the mouth, the blood was pouring in floods. She was stone dead. I strode past her, and ascended to the sleeping chamber, which presented an appearance of the wildest disorder. The furniture had been knocked over in the deadly struggle that had taken place there, and the sheets, to which the unfortunate jeweller had doubtless clung, were dragged across the room. The murdered man lay on the floor, his head leaning against the wall, and about him was a pool of blood which poured forth from three large wounds in his breast. There was a fourth gash, in which a long table-knife was plunged up to the handle. I stumbled over some object. I stooped to examine. It was the second pistol, which had not gone off, probably from the powder being wet. I approached the jeweller, who was not quite dead, and at the sound of my footsteps and the creaking of the floor, he opened his eyes, fixed them on me with an anxious and inquiring gaze, moved his lips as though trying to speak, then, overcome by the effort, fell back and expired. This appalling sight almost bereft me of my senses, and finding that I could no longer be of service to anyone in the house, my only desire was to fly. I rushed towards the staircase, clutching my hair and uttering a groan of horror. Upon reaching the room below, I found five or six custom-house officers, and two or three gendarmes, all heavily armed. They threw themselves upon me. I made no resistance. I was no longer master of my senses. When I strove to speak, a few inarticulate sounds alone escaped my lips. As I noticed the significant manner in which the whole party pointed to my blood-stained garments, I involuntarily surveyed myself and then I discovered that the thick warm drops that had so bedewed me as I lay beneath the staircase must have been the blood of La Carcante. I pointed to the spot where I had concealed myself. "'What does he mean?' asked a gendarme. One of the officers went to the place I directed. "'He means,' replied the man upon his return, "'that he got in that way, and showed the hole I had made when I broke through.' Then I saw that they took me for the assassin. I recovered force and energy enough to free myself from the hands of those who held me, while I managed to stammer forth, I, I did not do it. Indeed, indeed I did not. A couple of gendarmes held the muzzles of their carbines against my breast. Stir but a step, said they, and you are a dead man. Why should you threaten me with death, cried I, when I have already declared my innocence? "'Tush, tush!' cried the men. "'Keep your innocent stories to tell to the judge at Nîmes. "'Meanwhile come along with us, "'and the best advice we can give you is to do so unresistingly.' "'Alas! Resistance was far from my thoughts. "'I was utterly overpowered by surprise and terror, "'and without a word I suffered myself to be handcuffed "'and tied to a horse's tail, "'and thus they took me to Nîmes. 
I had been tracked by a customs officer who had lost sight of me near the tavern. Feeling certain that I intended to pass the night there, he had returned to summon his comrades, who had just arrived in time to hear the report of the pistol, and to take me in the midst of such circumstantial proofs of my guilt as rendered all hopes of proving my innocence utterly futile. One only chance was left me, that of beseeching the magistrate before whom I was taken to cause every inquiry to be made for the Abbe Bussoni, who had stopped at the inn of the Pont du Gard on that morning. If Caderousse had invented the story relative to the diamond, and there existed no such person as the Abbe Bussoni, then, indeed, I was lost past redemption, or at least my life hung upon the feeble chance of Caderousse himself being apprehended and confessing the whole truth. Two months passed away in hopeless expectation on my part, while I must do the magistrate the justice to say that he used every means to obtain information of the person I declared could exculpate me if he would. Caderousse still evaded all pursuit, and I had resigned myself to what seemed my inevitable fate. My trial was to come on at the approaching assizes, when, on the 8th of September, that is to say, precisely three months and five days after the events which had perilled my life, the Abbe Bussoni, whom I never ventured to believe I should see, presented himself at the prison doors, saying he understood one of the prisoners wished to speak to him. He added that, having learned at Marseilles the particulars of my imprisonment, he hastened to comply with my desire. You may easily imagine with what eagerness I welcomed him, and how minutely I related the whole of what I had seen and heard. I felt some degree of nervousness as I entered upon the history of the diamond, but to my inexpressible astonishment he confirmed it in every particular, and to my equal surprise he seemed to place entire belief in all I said. And then it was that, won by his mild charity, seeing that he was acquainted with all the habits and customs of my own country, and considering also that pardon for the only crime of which I was really guilty might come with a double power from lips so benevolent and kind, I besought him to receive my confession, under the seal of which I recounted the Auteuil affair in all its details, as well as every other transaction of my life. That which I had done by the impulse of my best feelings produced the same effect as though it had been the result of calculation. My voluntary confession of the assassination at Auteuil proved to him that I had not committed that of which I stood accused. When he quitted me, he bade me be of good courage, and to rely upon his doing all in his power to convince my judges of my innocence. I had speedy proofs that the excellent abbé was engaged in my behalf, for the rigours of my imprisonment were alleviated by many trifling though acceptable indulgences, and I was told that my trial was to be postponed to the assizes following those now being held. In the interim it pleased Providence to cause the apprehension of Caderousse, who was discovered in some distant country, and brought back to France where he made a full confession refusing to make the fact of his wife's having suggested and arranged the murder any excuse for his own guilt. The wretched man was sentenced to the galleys for life, and I was immediately set at liberty. "'And then it was, I presume,' said Monte Cristo, "'that you came to me as the bearer of a letter from the Abbe Bussoni. "'It was, Your Excellency. "'The benevolent Abbe took an evident interest in all that concerned me.' "'Your mode of life as a smuggler,' said he to me one day, "'will be the ruin of you. "'If you get out, don't take it up again.' "'But how,' inquired I, "'am I to maintain myself and my poor sister?' "'A person whose confessor I am,' replied he, "'and who entertains a high regard for me, "'applied to me a short time since "'to procure him a confidential servant. "'Would you like such a post?' If so, I will give you a letter of introduction to him. Oh, father, I exclaimed, you are very good. But you must swear solemnly that I shall never have reason to repent my recommendation. I extended my hand and was about to pledge myself by any promise he would dictate, but he stopped me. It is unnecessary for you to bind yourself by any vow, said he. I know and admire the Corsican nature too well to fear you. 
Here, take this, continued he, after rapidly writing the few lines I brought to your excellency, and upon receipt of which you deign to receive me into your service, and proudly I ask whether your excellency has ever had cause to repent of having done so. No, replied the count. I take pleasure in saying that you have served me faithfully, Bertuccio. But you might have shown more confidence in me. I, Your Excellency? Yes. How comes it that, having both a sister and an adopted son, you have never spoken to me of either? Alas! I have still to recount the most distressing period of my life. Anxious, as you may suppose I was, to behold and comfort my dear sister, I lost no time in hastening to Corsica. But when I arrived at Rogliano, I found a house of mourning, the consequences of a scene so horrible that the neighbours remember and speak of it to this day. Acting by my advice, my poor sister had refused to comply with the unreasonable demands of Benedetto, who was continually tormenting her for money as long as he believed there was a sou left in her possession. One morning, that he had demanded money, threatening her with the severest consequences if she did not supply him with what he desired, he disappeared, and remained away all day, leaving the kind-hearted Assunta, who loved him as if he were her own child, to weep over his conduct and bewail his absence. Evening came, and still, with all the patient solicitude of a mother, she watched for his return. As the eleventh hour struck, he entered, with a swaggering air, attended by two of the most dissolute and reckless of his boon companions. She stretched out her arms to him, but they seized hold of her, and one of the three, none other than the accursed Benedetto, exclaimed, "'Put her to torture, and she'll soon tell us where her money is.' It unfortunately happened that our neighbour, Vasilio, was at Bastia, leaving no person in his house but his wife. No human creature beside could hear or see anything that took place within our dwelling. Two held poor Assunta, who, unable to conceive that any harm was intended to her, smiled in the face of those who were soon to become her executioners. The third proceeded to barricade the doors and windows, then returned, and the three united in stifling the cries of terror incited by the sight of these preparations, and then dragged Assunta feet foremost towards the brazier, expecting to wring from her an avowal of where her supposed treasure was secreted. In the struggle her clothes caught fire, and they were obliged to let go their hold in order to preserve themselves from sharing the same fate. Covered with flames, Asunta rushed wildly to the door, but it was fastened. She flew to the windows, but they were also secured. Then the neighbours heard frightful shrieks. It was Asunta calling for help. The cries died away in groans, and next morning, as soon as Vasilio's wife could muster up courage to venture abroad, she caused the door of our dwelling to be opened by the public authorities. When Assunta, though dreadfully burnt, was found still breathing. Every drawer and closet in the house had been forced open, and the money stolen. Benedetto never again appeared at Rogliano. Neither have I since that day either seen or heard anything concerning him. It was subsequent to these dreadful events that I waited on Your Excellency, to whom it would have been folly to have mentioned Benedetto since all trace of him seemed entirely lost, or of my sister, since she was dead. And in what light did you view the occurrence? inquired Monte Cristo. As a punishment for the crime I had committed, answered Bertuccio. Oh, those Villefors are an accursed race! Truly they are murmured the Count, in a lugubrious tone. "'And now,' resumed Bertuccio, "'Your Excellency may perhaps be able to comprehend that this place, which I revisit for the first time, this garden, the actual scene of my crime, must have given rise to reflections of no very agreeable nature, and produced that gloom and depression of spirits which excited the notice of Your Excellency, 
who was pleased to express a desire to know the cause. At this instant a shudder passes over me as I reflect that possibly I am now standing on the very grave in which lies M. de Villefort, by whose hand the ground was dug to receive the corpse of his child. "'Everything is possible,' said Monte Cristo, rising from the bench on which he had been sitting. "'Even,' he added in an inaudible voice, "'even that the procureur be not dead. "'The Abbé Busoni did right to send you to me,' he went on in his ordinary tone, "'and you have done well in relating to me the whole of your history, "'as it will prevent my forming any erroneous opinions concerning you in future.' As for that Benedetto, who so grossly belied his name, have you never made any effort to trace out whither he has gone, or what has become of him? No, far from wishing to learn whither he has betaken himself, I should shun the possibility of meeting him as I would a wild beast. Thank God I have never heard his name mentioned by any person, and I hope and believe he is dead." "'Do not think so, Bertuccio,' replied the Count, "'for the wicked are not so easily disposed of. "'For God seems to have them under his special watch-care "'to make of them instruments of his vengeance.' "'So be it,' responded Bertuccio. "'All I ask of heaven is that I may never see him again. "'And now, Your Excellency,' he added, bowing his head, "'you know everything.' You are my judge on earth, as the Almighty is in heaven. Have you for me no words of consolation? My good friend, I can only repeat the words addressed to you by the Abbe Bussoni. Villefort merited punishment for what he had done to you, and perhaps to others. Benedetto, if still living, will become the instrument of divine retribution in some way or other and then be duly punished in his turn. As far as you yourself are concerned, I see but one point in which you are really guilty. Ask yourself, wherefore, after rescuing the infant from its living grave, you did not restore it to its mother? There was the crime, Bertuccio. That was where you became really culpable." True, Excellency, that was the crime, the real crime, for in that I acted like a coward. My first duty, directly I succeeded in recalling the babe to life, was to restore it to its mother. But in order to do so I must have made close and careful inquiry which would in all probability have led to my own apprehension, and I clung to life, partly on my sister's account, and partly from that feeling of pride inborn in our hearts, of desiring to come off untouched and victorious in the execution of our vengeance. Perhaps, too, the natural and instinctive love of life made me wish to avoid endangering my own. And then, again, I am not as brave and courageous as was my poor brother. Bertuccio hid his face in his hands as he uttered these words, while Monte Cristo fixed on him a look of inscrutable meaning. After a brief silence, rendered still more solemn by the time and place, the Count said, in a tone of melancholy wholly unlike his usual manner, "'In order to bring this conversation to a fitting termination, the last we shall ever hold upon this subject, I will repeat to you some words I have heard from the lips of the Abbe Busoni. For all evils there are two remedies, time and silence. And now leave me, Monsieur Bertuccio, to walk alone here in the garden. The very circumstances which inflict on you, as a principal in the tragic scene enacted here, such painful emotions, are to me, on the contrary, a source of something like contentment, and serve but to enhance the value of this dwelling in my estimation. The chief beauty of trees consists in the deep shadows of their umbrageous boughs, while fancy pictures a moving multitude of shapes and forms flitting and passing beneath that shade. Here I have a garden laid out in such a way as to afford the fullest scope for the imagination. 
and furnished with thickly grown trees, beneath whose leafy screen a visionary like myself may conjure up phantoms at will. This to me, who expected but to find a blank enclosure surrounded by a straight wall, is, I assure you, a most agreeable surprise. I have no fear of ghosts, and I have never heard it said that so much harm has been done by the dead during six thousand years as is wrought by the living in a single day. Retire within, Bertuccio, and tranquillize your mind. Should your confessor be less indulgent to you in your dying moments than you found the Abbe Busoni, send for me, if I am still upon earth, and I will soothe your ears with words that shall effectually calm and soothe your parting soul ere it goes forth to traverse the ocean called eternity. Bertuccio bowed respectfully and turned away, sighing heavily. Monte Cristo, left alone, took three or four steps onwards, and murmured, Here, beneath this plane tree, must have been where the infant's grave was dug. There is the little door opening into the garden. At this corner is the private staircase communicating with the sleeping apartment. There will be no necessity for me to make a note of these particulars, for there, before my eyes, beneath my feet, all around me I have the plan sketched with all the living reality of truth. After making the tour of the garden a second time, the Count re-entered his carriage, while Bertuccio, who perceived the thoughtful expression of his master's features, took his seat beside the driver without uttering a word. The carriage proceeded rapidly towards Paris. That same evening, upon reaching his abode in the Champs-Élysées, the Count of Monte Cristo went over the whole building with the air of one long acquainted with each nook or corner. Nor, though preceding the party, did he once mistake one door for another, or commit the smallest error when choosing any particular corridor or staircase to conduct him to a place or suite of rooms he desired to visit. Ali was his principal attendant during this nocturnal survey. Having given various orders to Bertuccio relative to the improvements and alterations he desired to make in the house, the Count, drawing out his watch, said to the attentive Nubian, "'It is half-past eleven o'clock. Aide will soon be here. Have the French attendants been summoned to await her coming?' Ali extended his hand towards the apartments destined for the fair Greek which were so effectually concealed by means of a tapestried entrance that it would have puzzled the most curious to have divined their existence. Ali, having pointed to the apartments, held up three fingers of his right hand, and then, placing it beneath his head, shut his eyes and feigned to sleep. "'I understand,' said Monte Cristo, well acquainted with Ali's pantomime. You mean to tell me that three female attendants await their new mistress in her sleeping chamber? Ali, with considerable animation, made a sign in the affirmative. Madame will be tired tonight, continued Monte Cristo, and will no doubt wish to rest. Desire the French attendants not to weary her with questions, but merely to pay their respectful duty and retire. You will also see that the Greek servants hold no communication with those of this country." He bowed. Just at that moment voices were heard hailing the concierge. The gate opened. A carriage rolled down the avenue and stopped at the steps. The Count hastily descended, presented himself at the already opened carriage door, and held out his hand to a young woman, completely enveloped in a green silk mantle heavily embroidered with gold. She raised the hand extended towards her to her lips, and kissed it with a mixture of love and respect. Some few words passed between them in that sonorous language in which Homer makes his gods converse. The young woman spoke with an expression of deep tenderness, while the Count replied with an air of gentle gravity. Preceded by Ali, who carried a rose-coloured flambeau in his hand, the newcomer, who was no other than the lovely Greek who had been Monte Cristo's companion in Italy, was conducted to her apartments, while the Count retired to the pavilion reserved for himself. 
In another hour every light in the house was extinguished, and it might have been thought that all its inmates slept. End of chapter 45《Chapter 46 Unlimited Credit》of the Count of Monte Cristo。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heather Duncan. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 46. About two o'clock the following day, a calash, drawn by a pair of magnificent English horses, stopped at the door of Monte Cristo, and a person, dressed in a blue coat, with buttons of a similar color, a white waistcoat, over which was displayed a massive gold chain, brown trousers, and a quantity of black hair descending so low over his eyebrows as to leave it doubtful whether it were not artificial, so little did its jetty glossiness assimilate with the deep wrinkles stamped on his features. A person, in a word, who, although evidently past fifty, desired to be taken for not more than forty, bent forwards from the carriage door, on the panels of which were emblazoned the armorial bearings of a baron, and directed his groom to inquire at the porter's lodge whether the Count of Monte Cristo resided there, and if he were within. While waiting, the occupant of the carriage surveyed the house, the garden as far as he could distinguish it, and the livery of servants who passed to and fro, with an attention so close as to be somewhat impertinent. His glance was keen, but showed cunning rather than intelligence. His lips were straight, and so thin that as they closed, they were drawn in over the teeth. His cheekbones were broad and projecting, a never-failing proof of audacity and craftiness, while the flatness of his forehead, and the enlargement of the back of his skull, which rose much higher than his large and coarsely shaped ears, combined to form a physiognomy anything but prepossessing, save in the eyes of such as considered that the owner of so splendid an equipage must needs be all that was admirable and enviable, more especially when they gazed on the enormous diamond that glittered in his shirt, and the red ribbon that depended from his buttonhole. The groom, in obedience to his orders, tapped at the window of the porter's lodge, saying, Pray, does not the Count of Monte Cristo live here? His Excellency does reside here, replied the concierge, but, added he, glancing an inquiring look at Ali, Ali returned a sign in the negative. But what? asked the groom. His Excellency does not receive visitors today. Then here is my master's card the Baron Danglers. You will take it to the Count, and say that, although in haste to attend the chamber, my master came out of his way to have the honor of calling upon him. I never speak to his excellency, replied the concierge. The valet de chambre will carry your message. The groom returned to the carriage. Well, asked Danglers. The man, somewhat crestfallen by the rebuke he had received, repeated what the concierge had said. "'Bless me,' murmured Baron Danglers. "'This must surely be a prince, instead of a count, "'by their styling him Excellency, "'and only venturing to address him "'by the medium of his valet de chambre. "'However, it does not signify. "'He has a letter of credit on me, "'so I must see him when he requires his money. "'Then, throwing himself back in his carriage, "'Danglers called out to his coachman, "'in a voice that might be heard across the road, "'To the Chamber of Deputies!' Apprised in time of the visit paid him, Monte Cristo had, from behind the blinds of his pavilion, as minutely observed the baron, by means of an excellent lorgnette, as Danglers himself had scrutinized the house, garden, and servants. "'That fellow has a decidedly bad countenance,' said the Count, in a tone of disgust, as he shut up his glass into its ivory case. "'How comes it that all do not retreat in aversion at sight of that flat, receding, serpent-like forehead, round, vulture-shaped head, and sharp-hooked nose like the beak of a buzzard. "'Ali!' cried he. 
striking at the same time on the brazen gong. Ali appeared. Summon Bertuccio, said the count. Almost immediately, Bertuccio entered the apartment. Did your excellency desire to see me? inquired he. I did, replied the count. You no doubt observed the horses standing a few minutes since at the door. Certainly, your excellency, I noticed them for their remarkable beauty. Then how comes it, said Monte Cristo with a frown, that when I desired you to purchase for me the finest pair of horses to be found in Paris, there is another pair, fully as fine as mine, not in my stables. At the look of displeasure, added to the angry tone in which the Count spoke, Ali turned pale and held down his head. It is not your fault, my good Ali, said the Count in the Arabic language, and with a gentleness none would have thought him capable of showing, either in voice or face. It is not your fault. You do not understand the points of English horses. The countenance of poor Ali recovered its serenity. Permit me to assure your excellency, said Brutuccio, that the horses you speak of were not to be sold when I purchased yours. Monte Cristo shrugged his shoulders. It seems, Sir Steward, said he, that you have yet to learn that all things are to be sold to such as care to pay the price. His Excellency is not perhaps aware that Mr. Danglers gave sixteen thousand francs for his horses? Very well, then offer him double that sum. A banker never loses an opportunity of doubling his capital. Is your Excellency really in earnest? inquired the steward. Monte Cristo regarded the person who durst presume to doubt his words with the look of one equally surprised and displeased. I have to pay a visit this evening, replied he. I desire that these horses, with completely new harness, may be at the door with my carriage. Bertuccio bowed and was about to retire, but when he reached the door, he paused and then said, At what o'clock does your excellency wish the carriage and horses to be ready? At five o'clock, replied the count. I beg your excellency's pardon, interposed the steward in a deprecating manner, for venturing to observe that it is already two o'clock. I am perfectly aware of that fact, answered Monte Cristo calmly. Then, turning towards Ali, he said, let all the horses in my stables be led before the windows of your young lady, that she may select those she prefers for her carriage. Request her also to oblige me by saying whether it is her pleasure to dine with me. If so, let dinner be served in her apartments. Now, leave me and desire my valet de chambre to come hither. Scarcely had Ali disappeared when the valet entered the chamber. Monsieur Baptistin, said the Count, you have been in my service one year, the time I generally give myself to judge of the merits or demerits of those about me. You suit me very well. Baptistin bowed low. It only remains for me to know whether I also suit you. Oh, your excellency, exclaimed Baptistin eagerly. Listen, if you please, till I have finished speaking, replied Monte Cristo. You receive fifteen hundred francs per annum for your services here more than many a brave subaltern who continually risks his life for his country obtains. You live in a manner far superior to many clerks who work ten times harder than you do for their money. Then, though yourself a servant, you have other servants to wait upon you, take care of your clothes, and see that your linen is duly prepared for you. Again, you make a profit upon each article you purchase for my toilet, amounting in the course of a year to a sum equaling your wages. Nay, indeed, your excellency. I am not condemning you for this, Monsieur Baptistin, but let your profits end here. It would be long indeed ere you would find so lucrative a post as that you have now the good fortune to fill. I neither ill use nor ill treat my servants by word or action. An error I readily forgive, but willful negligence or forgetfulness never. My commands are ordinarily short clear and precise, and I would rather be obliged to repeat my words twice, or even three times, than should be misunderstood. I am rich enough to know whatever I desire to know, and I can promise you I am not wanting in curiosity. If then I should learn that you had taken upon yourself to speak of me to any one favorably or unfavorably, to comment on my actions or watch my conduct, that very instant you would quit my service. 
you may now retire. I never caution my servants a second time. Remember that. Baptiston bowed and was proceeding towards the door. I forgot to mention to you, said the Count, that I lay yearly aside a certain sum for each servant in my establishment. Those whom I am compelled to dismiss lose, as a matter of course, all participation in this money, while their portion goes to the fund accumulating for those domestics who remain with me, and among whom it will be divided at my death. You have been in my service a year. Your fund has already begun to accumulate. Let it continue to do so. This address, delivered in the presence of Ali, who, not understanding one word of the language in which it was spoken, stood wholly unmoved, produced an effect on M. Baptistin only to be conceived by such as have occasion to study the character and disposition of French domestics. I assure your excellency, said he, that at least it shall be my study to merit your approbation in all things, and I will take M. Ali as my model. By no means, replied the Count in the most frigid tones. Ali has many faults mixed with most excellent qualities. He cannot possibly serve you as a pattern for your conduct, not being, as you are, a paid servant, but a mere slave, a dog, who, should he fail in his duty towards me, I should not discharge from my service, but kill. Baptistin opened his eyes with astonishment. You seem incredulous, said Monte Cristo, who repeated to Ali, in the Arabic language, what he had just been saying to Baptistin in French. The Nubian smiled assentingly to his master's words, then, kneeling on one knee, respectfully kissed the hand of the Count. This corroboration of the lesson he had just received put the finishing stroke to the wonder and stupefaction of M. Baptistin. The Count then motioned the valet de chambre to retire, and to Ali to follow to his study, where they conversed long and earnestly together. As the hand of the clock pointed to five, the Count struck thrice upon his gong. When Ali was wanted, one stroke was given. Two summoned Baptistin, and three Bertuccio. The steward entered. "'My horses,' said Monte Cristo. "'They are at the door, harnessed to the carriage as your Excellency desired. Does your Excellency wish me to accompany him?' "'No. The coachman, Ali, and Baptistin will go.' The Count descended to the door of his mansion, and beheld his carriage drawn by the very pair of horses he had so much admired in the morning as the property of Danglars. As he passed them, he said, They are extremely handsome, certainly, and you have done well to purchase them, although you were somewhat remiss not to have procured them sooner. Indeed, Your Excellency, I had very considerable difficulty in obtaining them, and, as it is, they have cost an enormous price. Does the sum you gave for them make the animals less beautiful? inquired the Count, shrugging his shoulders. Nay, if your Excellency is satisfied, it is all that I could wish. Whither does your Excellency desire to be driven? To the residence of Baron Danglers, Rue de la Chustantin. This conversation had passed as they stood upon the terrace, from which a flight of stone steps led to the carriage drive. As Bertuccio, with a respectful bow, was moving away, the Count called him back. I have another commission for you, Mr. Bertuccio, said he. I am desirous of having an estate by the seaside in Normandy, for instance, between Havre and Boulogne. You see, I give you a wide range. It will be absolutely necessary that the place you may select have a small harbor, creek, or bay, into which my corvette can enter and remain at anchor. She draws only fifteen feet. She must be kept in constant readiness to sail immediately, I think, proper to give the signal. Make the requisite inquiries for a place of this description, and when you have met with an eligible spot, visit it, and if it possesses the advantages desired, purchase it at once in your own name. The corvette must now, I think, be on her way to Fecamp, must she not? Certainly, Your Excellency. I saw her put to sea the same evening we quitted Marseilles. And the yacht? Was ordered to remain at Martigues. Tis well. I wish you to write from time to time to the captains in charge of the two vessels, so as to keep them on the alert. And the steamboat? She is at Chalon? Yes. The same orders for her as the two sailing vessels. Very good. 
When you have purchased the estate I desire, I want constant relays of horses at ten leagues apart along the northern and southern road. Your Excellency may depend upon me. The Count made a gesture of satisfaction, descended the terrace steps, and sprang into his carriage, which was whirled along swiftly to the banker's house. Danglers was engaged at the moment, presiding over a railroad committee, but the meeting was nearly concluded when the name of his visitor was announced. As the Count's title sounded on his ear, he rose, and addressing his colleagues, who were members of one or the other chamber, he said, "'Gentlemen, pardon me for leaving you so abruptly, but a most ridiculous circumstance has occurred, which is this. Thompson and French, the Roman bankers, have sent to me a certain person calling himself the Count of Monte Cristo, and have given him an unlimited credit with me. I confess this is the drollest thing I have ever met with in the course of my extensive foreign transactions, and you may readily suppose it has greatly roused my curiosity. I took the trouble this morning to call on the pretended Count. If he were a real Count, he wouldn't be so rich. But, would you believe it, he was not receiving! So the master of Monte Cristo gives himself airs befitting a great millionaire or a capricious beauty. I made inquiries and found that the house is in the Champs-Élysées is his own property, and certainly it was very decently kept up. But, pursued Danglers with one of his sinister smiles, an order for unlimited credit calls for something like caution on the part of the banker to whom that order is given. I am very anxious to see this man. I suspect a hoax is intended, but with the instigators of it little knew whom they had to deal with. They laughed best who laughed last. Having delivered himself of this pompous address, uttered with a degree of energy that left the baron almost out of breath, he bowed to the assembled party, and withdrew to his drawing-room, whose sumptuous furnishings of white and gold had caused a great sensation in the Chaux-Stantin. It was to this apartment he had desired his guest to be shown, with the purpose of overwhelming him at the sight of so much luxury. He found the Count standing before some copies of Albano and Fator that had been passed off to the banker as originals, but which, mere copies as they were, seemed to feel their degradation in being brought into juxtaposition with the gaudy colors that covered the ceiling. The Count turned round as he heard the entrance of Danglars into the room. With a slight inclination of the head, Danglars signed to the Count to be seated, pointing significantly to a gilded armchair covered with white satin embroidered with gold. The Count sat down. I have the honor, I presume, of addressing Monsieur de Monte Cristo. The Count bowed. And I, of speaking to Baron Danglars, Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, and member of the Chamber of Deputies? Monte Cristo repeated all the titles he had read on the Baron's card. Danglars felt the irony and compressed his lips. "'You will, I trust, excuse me, monsieur, for not calling you by your title when I first addressed you,' he said. "'But you are aware that we are living under a popular form of government, and that I myself a representative of the liberties of the people.' "'So much so,' replied Monte Cristo, "'that while you call yourself baron, you are not willing to call anybody else count.' "'Upon my word, monsieur,' said Danglars with affected carelessness, "'I attach no sort of value to such empty distinctions.' But the fact is, I was made baron, and also chevalier of the Legion of Honor, in return for services rendered, but— But you have discarded your titles after the example set you by Messieurs de Montrency and Lafayette. That was a noble example to follow, monsieur. Why, replied Danglars, not entirely so. With the servants, you understand. I see, to your domestics you are, my lord. The journalists style you monsieur, while your constituents call you citizen. These are distinctions very suitable under a constitutional government. I understand perfectly. Again Danglars bit his lips. He saw that he was no match for Monte Cristo in an argument of this sort, and he therefore hastened to turn to subjects more congenial. Permit me to inform you, Count, said he, bowing, that I have received a letter of advice from Thompson in French, of Rome. I am glad to hear it, Baron, for I must claim the privilege of addressing you after the manner of your servants. I have acquired the bad habit of calling persons by their titles, from living in a country where barons are still barons by right of birth. But as regards the letter of advice, I am charmed to find that it has reached you, 
That will spare me the troublesome and disagreeable task of coming to you for money myself. You have received a regular letter of advice? Yes, said Danglers, but I confess I didn't quite comprehend its meaning. Indeed? And for that reason I did myself the honor of calling upon you, in order to beg for an explanation. Go on, monsieur. Here I am, ready to give you any explanation you desire. Why, said Danglers, in the letter, I believe I have it about me. Here he felt in his breast pocket. Yes, here it is. Well, this letter gives the Count of Monte Cristo unlimited credit on our house. Well, Baron, what is there difficult to understand about that? Merely the term unlimited. Nothing else, certainly. Is not that word known in France? The people who wrote are Anglo-Germans, you know. Oh, as for the composition of the letter, there is nothing to be said. But as regards the competency of the document, I certainly have doubts. Is it possible, asked the Count, assuming all air and tone of the utmost simplicity and candor, is it possible that Thompson and French are not looked upon as safe and solvent bankers? Pray tell me what you think, Baron, for I feel uneasy, I can assure you, having some considerable property in their hands. Thompson and French are perfectly solvent, replied Danglers, with an almost mocking smile, but the word unlimited in financial affairs is so extremely vague. Is, in fact, unlimited, said Monte Cristo. Precisely what I was about to say, cried Danglers. Now what is vague is doubtful, and it was a wise man who said, when in doubt, keep out. Meaning to say, rejoined Monte Cristo, that however Thompson and French may be inclined to commit acts of imprudence and folly, the Baron Danglers is not disposed to follow their example. Not at all. Plainly enough, Messieurs Thompson and French set no bounds to their engagements while those of Monsieur Danglers have their limits. He is a wise man, according to his own showing. Monsieur, replied the banker, drawing himself up with a haughty air, the extent of my resources has never yet been questioned. Well, it seems then reserved for me, said Monte Cristo coldly, to be the first to do so. By what right, sir? By right of the objections you have raised and the explanations you have demanded, which certainly must have some motive. Once more Danglars bit his lips. It was the second time he had been worsted, and this time on his own ground. His forced politeness sat awkwardly upon him, and approached almost to impertinence. Monte Cristo, on the contrary, preserved a graceful suavity of demeanor, aided by a certain degree of simplicity he could assume at pleasure, and thus possessed the advantage. "'Well, sir,' resumed Danglers, after a brief silence, I will endeavor to make myself understood by requesting you to inform me for what sum you propose to draw upon me. Why truly, replied Monte Cristo, determined not to lose an inch of the ground he had gained, my reason for desiring an unlimited credit was precisely because I did not know how much money I might need. The banker thought the time had come for him to take the upper hand, so throwing himself back in his armchair, he said, with an arrogant and purse-proud air, Let me beg of you not to hesitate in naming your wishes. You will then be convinced that the resources of the House of Danglers, however limited, are still equal to meeting the largest demands, and were you even to require a million— I beg your pardon, imposed Monte Cristo. I said a million, replied Danglers, with the confidence of ignorance. But could I do with a million, retorted the Count. My dear sir, if a trifle like that could suffice me, I should never have given myself the trouble of opening an account. A million? Excuse my smiling when you speak of a sum I am in the habit of carrying in my pocket book or dressing case. And with these words, Monte Cristo took from his pocket a small case containing his visiting cards and drew forth two orders on the treasury for 500,000 francs each, payable at sight to the bearer. A man like Danglers was wholly inaccessible to any gentler method of correction. The effect of the present revelation was stunning. He trembled and was on the verge of apoplexy. The pupils of his eyes, as he gazed at Monte Cristo, dilated horribly. Come, come, said Monte Cristo, 
confess honestly that you have not perfect confidence in Thompson and French. I understand, and foreseen that such might be the case, I took, in spite of my ignorance of affairs, certain precautions. See, here are two similar letters to that you have re yourself received, one from the received, one from the house of Arstein and Eskelis of Vienna, to Baron Rothschild, the other drawn by Baron of London upon Monsieur Lafitte. Now, sir, you have but to say the word, and I will spare you all uneasiness by presenting my letter of credit to one or other of these two firms. The blow had struck home, and Danglars was entirely vanquished. With a trembling hand he took the two letters from the Count, who held them carelessly between finger and thumb, and proceeded to scrutinize the signatures, with a minuteness that the Count might have regarded as insulting, had it not suited his present purpose to mislead the banker. "'Oh, sir,' said Danglars, after he had convinced himself of the authenticity of the documents he held, and rising as if to salute the power of gold personified in the man before him, three letters of unlimited credit! I can be no longer mistrustful, but you must pardon me, my dear Count, for confessing to some degree of astonishment.' Nay, answered Monte Cristo, with the most gentlemanly air, tis not for such trifling sums as these that your banking house is to be incommoded. Then you can let me have some money, can you not? Whatever you say, my dear Count, I am at your orders. Why, replied Monte Cristo, since we mutually understand each other, for such I presume is the case? Danglars bowed assentingly. You are quite sure that not a lurking doubt or suspicion lingers in your mind? Oh, my dear Count, exclaimed Anglers, I never for an instant entertained such a feeling towards you. No, you merely wish to be convinced, nothing more. But now that we have come to so clear an understanding, and that all distrust and suspicion are laid at rest, we may as well fix a sum as the probable expenditure of the first year. Suppose we say six millions to six millions, gasped Danglars. So be it. Then, if I should require more, continued Monte Cristo in a careless manner, why, of course, I should draw upon you. But my present intention is not to remain in France more than a year, and during that period I scarcely think I shall exceed the sum I mentioned. However, we shall see. Be kind enough, then, to send me five hundred thousand francs to-morrow. I shall be at home till midday, or, if not, I will leave a receipt with my steward. The money you desire shall be at your house by ten o'clock to-morrow morning, my dear Count, replied Danglars. How would you like to have it? In gold, silver, or notes? Half in gold, and the other half in bank notes, if you please, said the Count, rising from his seat. I must confess to you, Count, said Danglars, that I have hitherto imagined myself acquainted with the degree of all the great fortunes of Europe, and still wealth such as yours has been wholly unknown to me. May I presume to ask whether you have long possessed it? It has been in the family a very long while, returned Monte Cristo, a sort of treasure expressly forbidden to be touched for a certain period of years, during which the accumulated interest has doubled the capital. The period appointed by the Trestator for the disposal of these riches occurred only a short time ago, and they have only been employed by me within the last few years. Your ignorance on the subject, therefore, is easily accounted for. However, you will be better informed as to me and my possessions ere long. And the Count, while pronouncing these latter words, accompanied them with one of those ghastly smiles that used to strike terror into poor Franz de Penny. With your tastes and means of gratifying them, continued Danglars, you will exhibit a splendor that must effectually put us poor miserable millionaires quite in the shade. If I mistake not, you are an admirer of paintings. At least I judged so from the attention you appeared to be bestowing on mine when I entered the room. If you will permit me, I shall be happy to show you my picture gallery, composed entirely of works by the ancient masters, warranted as such. Not a modern picture among them. I cannot endure the modern school of painting. You are perfectly right in objecting to them for this one great fault, that they have not yet had time to become old. 
Or will you allow me to show you several fine statues by Thorwaldsen, Bartoloni, and Canova? All foreign artists, for as you may perceive, I think but very indifferently of our French sculptors. You have a right to be unjust to them, monsieur. They are your compatriots. But all this may come later, when we shall be better known to each other. For the present, I will confine myself, if perfectly agreeable to you, to introducing you to the Baroness Danglers. Excuse my impatience, my dear Count, but a client like you is almost like a member of the family. Monte Cristo bowed, in sign that he had accepted the proffered honor. Danglers rang, and was answered by a servant in a showy livery. Is the Baroness at home? inquired Danglers. Yes, my lord, answered the man. And alone? No, my lord, madame has visitors. Have you any objection to meet any persons who may be with madame, or do you desire to preserve a strict incognito? No, indeed, replied Monte Cristo with a smile. I do not arrogate to myself the right of so doing. And who is with madame? Monsieur de Bray? inquired Danglars, with an air of indulgence and good nature that made Monte Cristo smile, acquainted as he was with the secrets of the banker's domestic life. Yes, my lord, replied the servant, Monsieur de Bray is with madame. Danglars nodded his head, then, turning to Monte Cristo, said, Monsieur Lucien de Bray is an old friend of ours, and private secretary to the Minister of the Interior. As for my wife, I must tell you, she lowered herself by marrying me, for she belongs to one of the most ancient families in France. Her maiden name was de Sèvres, and her first husband was Colonel the Marquis of Nargon. I have not the honor of knowing Madame Danglars, but I have already met Monsieur Lucien de Bray. Ah, indeed, said Danglars, and where was that? At the house of Monsieur de Morcerf. Aha! You are acquainted with the young Viscount, are you? We were together a good deal during the carnival at Rome. True, true, cried Danglars. Let me see. Have I not heard talk of some strange adventure with bandits or thieves, hidden ruins, and of his having had a miraculous escape? I forget how, but I know he used to amuse my wife and daughter by telling them about it after his return from Italy. Her ladyship is waiting to receive you, gentlemen, said the servant, who had gone to inquire the pleasure of his mistress. With your permission, said Danglars, bowing, I will precede you to show you the way. By all means, replied Monte Cristo, I follow you. End of chapter 46. Recorded by Heather Duncan, Indian River, Michigan, March 18th, 2007. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Caitlin Sticko, Madison, Wisconsin, 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 47 The Dappled Greys. The baron, followed by the count, traversed a long series of apartments in which the prevailing characteristics were heavy magnificence and the gaudiness of ostentatious wealth, until he reached the boudoir of Madame Danglars, a small, octagonal-shaped room, hung with pink satin, covered with white Indian muslin. The chairs were of ancient workmanship and materials. Over the doors were painted sketches of shepherds and shepherdesses, after the style and manner of Boucher, and at each side pretty medallions and crayons, harmonizing well with the furnishings of this charming apartment, the only one throughout the great mansion in which any distinctive taste prevailed. The truth was it had been entirely overlooked in the plan arranged and followed out by Monsieur Danglars and his architect who had been selected to aid the baron in the great work of improvement solely because he was the most fashionable and celebrated decorator of the day. The decorations of the boudoir had then been left entirely to Madame Danglars and Lucien de Bray. Monsieur Danglars, however, while possessing a great admiration for the antique, as it was understood during the time of the directory, 
entertained the most sovereign contempt for the simple elegance of his wife's favorite sitting-room, where, by the way, he was never permitted to intrude, unless, indeed, he excused his own appearance by ushering in some more agreeable visitor than himself, and even then he had rather the air and manner of a person who was himself introduced than that of being the presenter of another, his reception being cordial and frigid, in proportion as the person who accompanied him chanced to please or displease the baroness. Madame Danglars, who, although past the first bloom of youth, was still strikingly handsome, was now seated at the piano, a most elaborate piece of cabinet and inlaid work, while Lucien de Bray, standing before a small work-table, was turning over the pages of an album. Lucien had found time, preparatory to the Count's arrival, to relate many particulars respecting him to Madame Danglars. It will be remembered that Monte Cristo had made a lively impression on the minds of all the party assembled at the breakfast given by Albert de Morcerf, and although de Bray was not in the habit of yielding to such feelings, he had never been able to shake off the powerful influence excited in his mind by the impressive look and manner of the Count. Consequently, the description given by Lucien to the Baroness bore the highly coloured tinge of his own heated imagination. Already excited by the wonderful stories related of the Count by de Morcerf, it is no wonder that Madame Danglars eagerly listened to, and fully credited, all the additional circumstances detailed by de Bray. This posing at the piano and over the album was only a little ruse adopted by way of precaution. A most gracious welcome and unusual smile were bestowed on Monsieur Danglars. The Count, in return for his gentlemanly bow, received a formal though graceful curtsy, while Lucien exchanged with the Count a sort of distant recognition, and with Danglars a free and easy nod. "'Baroness,' said Danglars, "'give me leave to present to you the Count of Monte Cristo, who has been most warmly recommended to me by my correspondence at Rome. I need but mention one fact to make all the ladies in Paris court his notice, and that is, that he has come to take up his abode in Paris for a year, during which brief period he proposes to spend six millions of money. That means balls, dinners, and lawn parties without end, in all of which I trust the Count will remember us, as he may depend upon it we shall him, in our own humble entertainments. In spite of the gross flattery and coarseness of this address, Madame Danglars could not forbear gazing with considerable interest on a man capable of expending six millions in twelve months, and who had selected Paris for the scene of his princely extravagance. "'And when did you arrive here?' inquired she. "'Yesterday morning, madam. "'Coming, as usual, I presume, from the extreme end of the globe? "'Pardon me, at least such I have heard is your custom.' "'Nay, madam, this time I have merely come from Cadiz. "'You have selected a most unfavourable moment for your first visit. "'Paris is a horrible place in the summer. "'Balls, parties, and fêtes are over.' The Italian opera is in London, the French opera everywhere except in Paris. As for the Théâtre Francais, you know, of course, that it is nowhere. The only amusements left us are the indifferent races at the Champ de Mars and Satory. Do you propose entering any horses at either of these races, Count? I shall do whatever they do at Paris, madam, if I have the good fortune to find someone who will initiate me into the prevalent ideas of amusement. Are you fond of horses, Count? I have passed a considerable part of my life in the East, madam, and you are doubtless aware that the Orientals value only two things, the fine breeding of their horses, and the beauty of their women. Nay, Count, said the Baroness, it would have been somewhat more gallant to have placed the ladies first. You see, madam, how rightly I spoke when I said I required a preceptor to guide me in all my sayings and doings here. At this instant the favourite attendant of Madame Danglars entered the boudoir, approached her mistress, and spoke some words in an undertone. Madame Danglars turned very pale, then exclaimed, "'I cannot believe it. The thing is impossible.' "'I assure you, madam,' replied the woman, "'it is as I have said.' 
turning impatiently toward her husband, Madame Danglars demanded, "'Is this true?' "'Is what true, madame?' inquired Danglars, visibly agitated. "'What my maid tells me.' "'But what does she tell you?' that when my coachman was about to harness the horses to my carriage, he discovered that they had been removed from the stables without his knowledge. I desire to know what is the meaning of this. "'Be kind enough, madam, to listen to me,' said Danglars. "'Oh, yes, I will listen, monsieur, for I am most curious to hear what explanation you will give. These two gentlemen shall decide between us. But first I will state the case to them.' "'Gentlemen,' continued the baroness, among the ten horses in the stables of Baron Danglars are two that belong exclusively to me, a pair of the handsomest and most spirited creatures to be found in Paris. But to you, at least, Monsieur de Bray, I need not give a further description, because to you my beautiful pair of dappled greys are well known. Well, I had promised Madame de Villefort the loan of my carriage to drive to-morrow to the Bois, but when my coachman goes to fetch the greys from the stables, they are gone, positively gone. No doubt Monsieur Danglars has sacrificed them to the selfish consideration of gaining some thousands of paltry francs. Oh, what a detestable crew they are, these mercenary speculators! Madame, replied Danglars, the horses were not sufficiently quiet for you. They were scarcely four years old and they made me extremely uneasy on your account. "'Nonsense,' retorted the baroness. "'You could not have entertained any alarm on the subject, because you are perfectly well aware that I have had for a month in my service the very best coachman in Paris. But perhaps you have disposed of the coachman as well as the horses.' "'My dear love, pray do not say any more about them, and I promise you another pair exactly like them in appearance, only more quiet and steady.' The baroness shrugged her shoulders with an air of ineffable contempt, while her husband, affecting not to observe this unconjugal gesture, turned toward Monte Cristo and said, "'Upon my word, Count, I am quite sorry not to have met you sooner. You are setting up an establishment, of course.' "'Why, yes,' replied the Count. "'I should have liked to have made you an offer of these horses. I have almost given them away, as it is, but, as I said before, I was anxious to get rid of them upon any terms. They were only fit for a young man.' "'I am much obliged by your kind intentions towards me,' said Monte Cristo. "'But this morning I purchased a very excellent pair of carriage-horses, and I do not think they were dear. There they are. Come, Monsieur de Bray, you are a connoisseur, I believe. Let me have your opinion upon them.' As de Bray walked toward the window, Danglars approached his wife. "'I could not tell you before the others,' he said in a low tone, "'the reason of my parting with the horses. But a most enormous price was offered me this morning for them. Some madman or fool, bent upon ruining himself as fast as he can, actually sent his steward to me to purchase them at any cost, and the fact is I have gained sixteen thousand francs by the sale of them. Come, don't look so angry.' You shall have four thousand francs of the money to do with what you like, and Eugenie shall have two thousand. There, what do you think now of the affair? Wasn't I right to part with the horses? Madame Danglars surveyed her husband with a look of withering contempt. Great heavens! suddenly exclaimed Bray. What is it? asked the baroness. I cannot be mistaken. There are your horses, the very animals we were speaking of, harnessed to the Count's carriage. "'My dappled greys?' demanded the baroness, springing to the window. "'Tis indeed they,' said she. Danglars looked absolutely stupefied. "'How very singular!' cried Monte Cristo, with well-feigned astonishment. "'I cannot believe it,' murmured the banker. Madame Danglars whispered a few words in the ear of Debray, who approached Monte Cristo, saying, "'The baroness wishes to know what you paid her husband for the horses.' "'I scarcely know,' replied the Count. "'It was a little surprise prepared for me by my steward, and cost me, well, somewhere about thirty thousand francs.' De Bray conveyed the Count's reply to the Baroness. Poor Danglars looked so crestfallen and discomfited that Monte Cristo assumed a pitying air towards him. "'See,' said the Count, "'how very ungrateful women are.' Your kind attention in providing for the safety of the baroness by disposing of the horses does not seem to have made the least impression on her. But so it is, a woman will often, from mere wilfulness, prefer that which is dangerous to that which is safe. 
Therefore, in my opinion, my dear Baron, the best and easiest way is to leave them to their fancies, and allow them to act as they please, and then, if any mischief follows, why, at least, they have no one to blame but themselves. Danglars made no reply. He was occupied in anticipation of the coming scene between himself and the Baroness, whose frowning brow, like that of Olympic Jove, predicted a storm. De Bray, who perceived the gathering clouds, and felt no desire to witness the explosion of Madame Danglars' rage, suddenly recollected an appointment which compelled him to take his leave, while Monte Cristo, unwilling by prolonging his stay to destroy the advantages which he hoped to obtain, made a farewell bow and departed, leaving Danglars to endure the angry reproaches of his wife. Excellent, murmured Monte Cristo to himself as he came away. All has gone according to my wishes. The domestic peace of this family is henceforth in my hands. Now then, to play another master stroke, by which I shall gain the heart of both husband and wife. Delightful! Still, added he, amid all this, I have not yet been presented to Mademoiselle Eugénie Danglars, whose acquaintance I should have been glad to make. But, he went on with his peculiar smile, I am here in Paris, and have plenty of time before me. By and by will do for that." With these reflections he entered his carriage and returned home. Two hours afterward Madame Danglars received a most flattering epistle from the Count, in which he entreated her to receive back her favourite dappled greys, protesting that he could not endure the idea of making his entry into the Parisian world of fashion with the knowledge that his splendid equipage had been obtained at the price of a lovely woman's regrets. The horses were sent back wearing the same harness she had seen on them in the morning, only, by the Count's orders, in the centre of each rosette that adorned either side of their heads had been fastened a large diamond. To Danglars Monte Cristo also wrote, requesting him to excuse the whimsical gift of a capricious millionaire, and to beg the Baroness to pardon the Eastern fashion adopted in the return of the horses. During the evening Monte Cristo quitted Paris for Auteuil, accompanied by Ali. The following day, about three o'clock, a single blow struck on the gong summoned Ali to the presence of the Count. Ali, observed his master, as the Nubian entered the chamber, you have frequently explained to me how more than commonly skilful you are in throwing the lasso, have you not? Ali drew himself up proudly, and then returned the sign in the affirmative. I thought I did not mistake. With your lasso you could stop an ox. Again Ali repeated his affirmative gesture. Or a tiger. Ali bowed his head in a token of assent. A lion, even. Ali sprung forward, imitating the action of one throwing the lasso, then of a strangled lion. "'I understand,' said Monte Cristo. "'You wish to tell me you have hunted the lion?' Ali smiled with triumphant pride, as he signified that he had indeed both chased and captured many lions. "'But do you believe that you could arrest the progress of two horses rushing forward with ungovernable fury?' The Nubian smiled. It is well, said Monte Cristo. Then listen to me. Ere long a carriage will dash past here, drawn by the pair of dappled grey horses you saw me with yesterday. Now, at the risk of your own life, you must manage to stop these horses before my door. Ali descended to the street, and marked a straight line on the pavement immediately at the entrance of the house, and then pointed out the line he had traced to the Count, who was watching him. The Count patted him gently on the shoulder, his usual mode of praising Ali, who, pleased and gratified with the commission assigned him, walked calmly towards a projecting stone forming an angle of the street and house, began to smoke his shibuk, while Monte Cristo re-entered his dwelling, perfectly assured of the success of his plan. Still, as five o'clock approached, and the carriage was momentarily expected by the Count, the indication of more than common impatience and uneasiness might be observed in his manner. He stationed himself in a room commanding a view of the street, pacing the chamber with restless steps, stopping merely to listen from time to time for the sound of approaching wheels, then to cast an anxious glance on Ali. 
but the regularity with which the Nubian puffed forth the smoke of his chibok proved that he at least was wholly absorbed in the enjoyment of his favourite occupation. Suddenly a distant sound of rapidly advancing wheels was heard, and almost immediately a carriage appeared, drawn by a pair of wild, ungovernable horses, while the terrified coachmen strove in vain to restrain their furious speed. In the vehicle was a young woman and a child of about seven or eight clasped in each other's arms. Terror seemed to have deprived them of even the power of uttering a cry. The carriage creaked and rattled as it flew over the rough stones, and the slightest obstacle under the wheels would have caused disaster. But it kept on in the middle of the road, and those who saw it pass uttered cries of terror. Ali suddenly cast aside his shibuk drew the lasso from his pocket, threw it so skilfully as to catch the forelegs of the near horses in its triple fold, and suffered himself to be dragged on for a few steps by the violence of his shock. The animal then fell over on the pole, which snapped, and therefore prevented the other horse from pursuing its way. Gladly availing himself of this opportunity, the coachman leaped from his box, but Ali had promptly seized the nostrils of the second horse, and held them in his iron grasp, till the beast, snorting with pain, sunk beside his companion. All this was achieved in much less time than is occupied in the recital. The brief space had, however, been sufficient for a man, followed by a number of servants, to rush from the house before which the accident had occurred, and as the coachman opened the door of the carriage to take from it a lady who was convulsively grasping the cushions with one hand, while with the other she pressed to the bosom the young boy, who had lost consciousness. Monte Cristo carried them both to the salon, and deposited them on a sofa. "'Compose yourself, madam,' said he. "'All danger is over.' The woman looked up at these words, and with a glance far more expressive than any entreaties could have been, pointed to her child, who still continued insensible. "'I understand the nature of your alarms, madam,' said the Count, carefully examining the child but I assure you there is not the slightest occasion for uneasiness. Your little charge has not received the least injury. His insensibility is merely the effects of terror, and will soon pass. Are you quite sure you do not say so to tranquillize my fears? See how deadly pale he is. My child, my darling Edward, speak to your mother. Open your dear eyes, and look on me once again. Oh, sir, in pity send for a physician. My whole fortune shall not be thought too much for the recovery of my boy. With a calm smile and a gentle wave of the hand, Monte Cristo signed to the distracted mother to lay aside her apprehensions. Then, opening a casket that stood near, he drew forth a vial of bohemian glass, encrusted with gold, containing a liquid the color of blood, of which he let fall a single drop on the child's lips. Scarcely had it reached them ere the boy, though still pale as marble, opened his eyes, and eagerly gazed around him. At this the delight of the mother was almost frantic. "'Where am I?' exclaimed she. "'And to whom am I indebted for so happy a termination of my late dreadful alarm?' "'Madam,' answered the Count, "'you are under the roof of one who esteems himself most fortunate in having been able to save you from a further continuance of your sufferings.' "'My wretched curiosity has brought all this about,' pursued the lady. "'All Paris rung with the praises of Madame Danglars' beautiful horses, and I had the folly to desire to know whether they really merited the high praise given to them.' "'Is it possible,' exclaimed the Count, with well-feigned astonishment, "'that these horses belong to the Baroness?' "'They do, indeed. May I inquire if you are acquainted with Madame Danglars?' "'I have that honour and my happiness at your escape from danger that threatened you is redoubled by the consciousness that I have been the unwilling and unintentional cause of all the peril that you have incurred. I yesterday purchased these horses of the Baron, but as the Baroness evidently regretted parting with them, I ventured to send them back to her, with a request that she would gratify me by accepting them from my hands. "'You are, then, doubtless the Count of Monte Cristo, of whom Hermine has talked to me so much.' "'You have rightly guessed, madam,' replied the Count. "'And I am Madame Heloise de Villefort.' The Count bowed with the air of a person who hears a name for the first time. 
How grateful will Monsieur de Villefort be for all your goodness! How thankfully will he acknowledge that to you alone he owes the existence of his wife and child! Most certainly, but for the prompt assistance of your intrepid servant, this dear child and myself must both have perished. Indeed, I still shudder at the fearful danger you were placed in. I trust you will allow me to recompense worthily the devotion of your man. I beseech you, madam, replied Monte Cristo, not to spoil Ali, either by too great praise or rewards. I cannot allow him to acquire the habit of expecting to be recompensed for every trifling service he may render. Ali is my slave, and in saving your life he was but discharging his duty to me. Nay, hey, interposed Madame de Villefort, on whom the authoritative style adopted by the Count made a deep impression. Nay, but consider that to preserve my life he has risked his own. His life, madam, belongs not to him. It is mine, in return for my having myself saved him from death. Madame de Villefort made no further reply. Her mind was utterly absorbed in the contemplation of the person who from the first instant she saw him had made so powerful an impression on her. During the evident preoccupation of Madame de Villefort, Monte Cristo scrutinized the features and appearance of the boy she kept folded in her arms, lavishing on him the most tender endearments. The child was small for his age, and unnaturally pale. A mass of straight black hair, defying all attempts to train or curl it, fell over his projecting forehead, and hung down to his shoulders, giving increased vivacity to eyes already sparkling with a youthful love of mischief and fondness for every forbidden enjoyment. His mouth was large, and the lips, which had not yet regained their colour, were particularly thin. In fact, the deep and crafty look, giving a predominant expression to the child's face, belonged rather to a boy of twelve or fourteen than to one so young. His first movement was to free himself by a violent push from the encircling arms of his mother, and to rush forward to the casket from whence the Count had taken the vial of elixir. Then, without asking permission of any one, he proceeded, in all the willfulness of a spoiled child unaccustomed to restrain either whims or caprices, to pull the corks out of all the bottles. "'Touch nothing, my little friend!' cried the Count eagerly. "'Some of those liquids are not only dangerous to taste, but even to inhale.' Madame de Villefort became very pale, and, seizing her son's arm, drew him anxiously towards her. But once satisfied of his safety, she also cast a brief but expressive glance on the casket, which was not lost upon the Count. At this moment Ali entered. At sight of him Madame de Villefort uttered an exclamation of pleasure, and holding the child still closer towards her, she said, "'Edward, dearest, do you see that good man? He has shown very great courage and resolution, for he exposed his own life to stop the horses that were running away with us, and would certainly have dashed the carriage to pieces. Thank him, then, my child, in your very best manner, for had he not come to our aid, neither you nor I would have been alive to speak our thanks.' The child stuck out his lips, and turned away his head in a disdainful manner, saying— He's too ugly. The Count smiled, as if the child bade fair to realize his hopes, while Madame de Villefort reprimanded her son with a gentleness and moderation very far from conveying the least idea of a fault having been committed. This lady, said the Count, speaking to Ali in the Arabic language, is desirous that her son should thank you for saving both their lives, but the boy refuses, saying you are too ugly. Ali turned his intelligent countenance towards the boy, on whom he gazed without any apparent emotion, but the spasmodic workings of his nostrils showed to the practised eye of Monte Cristo that the Arab had been wounded to the heart. "'Will you permit me to inquire, said Madame de Villefort, as she arose to take her leave, whether you usually reside here?' "'No, I do not,' replied Monte Cristo. "'It is a small place I have purchased quite lately.' My place of abode is number 30, Avenue de Champs-Élysées. But I see you have quite recovered from your fright, and are no doubt desirous of returning home. Anticipating your wishes, I have desired the same horses you came with to be put to one of my carriages, and Ali, he whom you think so very ugly, continued he, addressing the boy with a smiling air, 
will have the honour of driving you home, while your coachman remains here to attend to the necessary repairs of your calash. As soon as that important business is concluded, I will have a pair of my own horses harnessed to convey it directly to Madame Danglars. "'I dare not return with those dreadful horses,' said Madame de Villefort. "'You will see,' replied Monte Cristo, "'that they will be as different as possible in the hands of Ali. "'With him they will be as gentle and docile as lambs.' Ali had, indeed, given the proof of this, for approaching the animals, who had been got upon their legs with considerable difficulty, he rubbed their foreheads and nostrils with a sponge soaked in aromatic vinegar, and wiped off the sweat and foam that covered their mouths. Then, commencing a loud whistling noise, he rubbed them well all over their bodies for several minutes. Then, undisturbed by the noisy crowd collected round the broken carriage, Ali quietly harnessed the pacified animals to the Count's chariot, took the reins in his hands, and mounted the box, when to the utter astonishment of those who had witnessed the ungovernable spirit and maddened speed of the same horses, he was actually compelled to apply his whip in no very gentle manner before he could induce them to start and even then all that could be obtained from the celebrated dappled greys now changed into a couple of dull sluggish stupid brutes was a slow pottering pace kept up with so much difficulty that madame de villefort was more than two hours returning to her residence in the faubourg saint honore Scarcely had the first congratulations upon her marvellous escape been gone through when she wrote the following letter to madame danglars Dear Hermine, I have just had a wonderful escape from the most imminent danger, and I owe my safety to the very Count of Monte Cristo we were talking about yesterday, but whom I little expected to see to-day. I remember how unmercifully I laughed at what I considered your eulogistic and exaggerated praises of him. But I have now ample cause to admit that your enthusiastic description of this wonderful man fell far short of his merits. Your horses got as far as Ranelagh, when they darted forward like mad things, and galloped away at so fearful a rate that there seemed no other prospect for myself and my poor Edward but that of being dashed to pieces against the first object that impeded their progress, when a strange-looking man, an Arab, a Negro, or a Nubian, at least a black of some nation or other, at a signal from the Count, whose domestic he is, suddenly seized and stopped the infuriated animals, even at the risk of being trampled to death himself. And certainly he must have had a most wonderful escape. The Count then hastened to us, and took us into his house, where he speedily recalled my poor Edward to life. He sent us home in his own carriage. Yours will be returned to you to-morrow. You will find your horses in bad condition from the results of this accident. They seem thoroughly stupefied, as if sulky and vexed at having been conquered by man. The Count, however, has commissioned me to assure you that two or three days' rest, with plenty of barley for their sole food during that time, will bring them back to as fine, that is, as terrifying, a condition as they were in yesterday. Adieu! I cannot return you many thanks for the drive of yesterday, but after all I ought not to blame you for the misconduct of your horses, more especially as it procured me the pleasure of an introduction to the Count of Monte Cristo, and certainly that illustrious personage, apart from the millions he is said to be very anxious to dispose of, seemed to me one of those curiously interesting problems I, for one, delight in solving at any risk even if it were to necessitate another drive to the bois behind your horses. Edward endured the accident with miraculous courage. He did not utter a single cry, but fell lifeless into my arms, nor did a tear fall from his eyes after it was over. I doubt not you will consider these praises the result of blind maternal affection, but there is a soul of iron in that delicate, fragile body. Valentine sends many affectionate remembrances to your dear Eugenie. I embrace you with all my heart. Heloise de Villefort. P.S. Please, do pray contrive some means for me to meet the Count of Monte Cristo at your house. I must and will see him again. I have just made Monsieur de Villefort promise to call on him, and I hope the visit will be returned. That night the adventure at Auteuil was talked of everywhere. Albert related it to his mother. Chateau Renaud related it at the Jockey Club, 
and de Bray detailed it at length in the salons of the minister. Even Beauchamp accorded twenty lines in his journal to the relation of the Count's courage and gallantry, thereby celebrating him as the greatest hero of the day in the eyes of all the feminine members of the aristocracy. Vast was the crowd of visitors and inquiring friends who left their names at the residence of Madame de Villefort, with the design of renewing their visit at the right moment, of hearing from her lips all the interesting circumstances of this most romantic adventure. As for Monsieur de Villefort, he fulfilled the predictions of Heloise to the letter, donned his dress-suit, drew on a pair of white gloves, ordered the servants to attend the carriage dressed in their full livery, and drove that same night to number 30 in the Avenue de Champs-Élysées. End of chapter 47「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Recorded by Christine The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 48 Ideology If the Count of Monte Cristo had been for a long time familiar, with the ways of Parisian society, he would have appreciated better the significance of the step which Mr. de Villefort had taken. Standing well at court, whether the king regnant was of the older or younger branch, whether the government was doctrinal, liberal, or conservative, looked upon by all as a man of talent, since those who have never experienced a political check are generally so regarded. Hated by many, but warmly supported by others, without being really liked by anybody. Mr. de Villefort held a high position in the magistracy, and maintained his eminence like a Harley or a mole. His drawing-room, under the regenerating influence of a young wife and a daughter by his first marriage, scarcely eighteen, was still one of the well-regulated Paris salons, where the worship of traditional customs and the observance of rigid etiquette were carefully maintained. A freezing politeness, a strict fidelity to government principles, a profound contempt for theories and theorists, a deep-seated hatred of ideality. These were the elements of private and public life displayed by Mr. de Villefort. He was not only a magistrate, he was almost a diplomatist. His relations with the former court, of which he always spoke with dignity and respect, made him respected by the new one, and he knew so many things that not only was he always carefully considered, but sometimes consulted. Perhaps this would not have been so, had it been possible to get rid of Mr. de Villefort. But, like the feudal barons, who rebelled against their sovereign, he dwelt in an impregnable fortress. This fortress was his post as king's attorney, all the advantages of which he exploited with marvellous skill, and which he would not have resigned but to be made deputy, and thus to replace neutrality by opposition. Ordinarily, Mr. de Villefort made and returned very few visits. His wife visited for him, and this was the received thing in the world, where the weighty and multifarious occupations of the magistrate were accepted as an excuse for what was really only calculated pride, a manifestation of professed superiority. In fact, the application of the axiom pretend to think well of yourself, and the world will think well of you, an axiom a hundred times more useful in society nowadays than that of the Greeks, know thyself, a knowledge for which, in our days, we have substituted the less difficult and more advantageous science of knowing others. To his friends, Mr. de Villefort was a powerful protector, to his enemies he was a silent but bitter opponent. For those who were neither the one nor the other, he was a statue of the law-made man. He had a haughty bearing, a look either steady and impenetrable, or insolently piercing and inquisitorial. Four successive revolutions had built and cemented the pedestal upon which his fortune was based. Mr. de Villefort had the reputation of being the least curious and the least wearisome man in France. He gave a ball every year, at which he appeared for a quarter of an hour only, 
that is to say five and forty minutes less than the king is visible at his balls. He was never seen at the theatres, at concerts, or in any place of public resort. Occasionally but seldom he played at whist, and then care was taken to select partners worthy of him. Sometimes they were ambassadors, sometimes archbishops, or sometimes a prince or a president, or some dowager duchess. Such was the man whose carriage had just now stopped before the Count of Monte Cristo's door. The valet de chambre announced Mr. de Villefort at the moment when the Count, leaning over a large table, was tracing on a map the route from St. Petersburg to China. The procurer entered with the same grave and measured step he would have employed in entering a court of justice. He was the same man, or rather the development of the same man, whom we have heretofore seen and as assistant attorney at Marseilles. Nature, according to her way, had made no deviation in the path he had marked out of for himself. From being slender he had now become meagre, once pale he was now yellow. His deep-set eyes were hollow, and the gold spectacle shielding his eyes seemed to be an integral portion of his face. He dressed entirely in black, with the exception of his white tee, and his funeral appearance was only mitigated by the slight line of red ribbon, which passed almost imperceptibly through his buttonhole, and appeared like a streak of blood traced with a delicate brush. Although master of himself, Monte Cristo scrutinized with irrepressible curiosity the magistrate whose salute he returned, and who, distrustful by habit and especially incredulous as to social prodigies, was much more despised to look upon the noble stranger, as Monte Cristo was already called, as an adventurer in search of new fields, or an escaped criminal, rather than as a prince of the Holy See, or a sultan of the Thousand and One Nights. Sir, said Villefort, in the squeaky tone assumed by magistrates in their oratorical periods, and of which they cannot, or will not, divest themselves in society. Sir, the signal service which you yesterday rendered to my wife and son has made it a duty for me to offer you my thanks. I have come, therefore, to discharge this duty, and to express to you my overwhelming gratitude. And as he said this, the eye severe of the magistrate had lost nothing of its habitual arrogance. He spoke in a voice of the procurer-general, with the rigid inflexibility of neck and shoulders which caused his flatterers to say, as we have before observed, that he was the living statue of the law. Monsieur, replied the Count with a chilling air, I am very happy to have been the means of preserving a son to his mother, for they say that the sentiment of maternity is the most holy of all, and the good fortune which occurred to me, Monsieur, might have enabled you to dispense with a duty which, in its discharge, confers an undoubtedly great honour, for I am aware that Mr. de Villefort is not usually lavish of the favour which he now bestows on me, a favour which, however estimable, is unequal to the satisfaction which I have in my own consciousness. Villefort, astonished at this reply, which he by no means expected, started like a soldier who feels the blow levelled at him over the armour he wears, and a curl of his disdainful lip indicated that from that moment he noted in the tablets of his brain that the Count of Monte Cristo was by no means a highly bred gentleman. He glanced around in order to seize on something on which the conversation might turn, and seemed to fall easily on a topic. He saw the map which Monte Cristo had been examining when he entered, and said, "'You seem geographically engaged, sir. It is a rich study for you, who, as I learn, have seen as many lands as are delineated on this map.' "'Yes, sir,' replied the Count. "'I have thought to make of the human race, taken in the mass, what you practice every day on individuals, a physiological study.' I have believed it was much easier to descend from the whole to a part than to ascend from a part to the whole. It is an algebraic axiom which makes us proceed from a known to an unknown quantity, and not from an unknown to a known. But sit down, sir, I beg of you. Monte Cristo pointed to a chair, which the procurer was obliged to take the trouble to move forwards himself, 
while the count merely fell back into his own, on which he had been kneeling when Mr. Villefort entered. Thus the count was halfway turned towards his visitor, having his back towards the window, his elbow resting on the geographical chart which furnished the theme of conversation for the moment, a conversation which assumed, as in the case of the interviews with Danglars and Morcerf, a turn analogous to the persons, if not to the situation. "'Ah, you philosophize,' replied Villefort, after a moment's silence, during which, like a wrestler who encounters a powerful opponent, he took breath. "'Well, sir, really, if, like you, I had nothing else to do, I should seek a more amusing occupation.' "'Why, in truth, sir,' was Monte Cristo's reply, "'man is but an ugly caterpillar for him who studies him through a solar microscope. But you said, I think, that I had nothing else to do.' Now, really, let me ask, sir, have you? Do you believe you have anything to do? Or, to speak in plain terms, do you really think that what you do deserves being called anything? Villefort's astonishment redoubled at the second thrust so forcibly made by his strange adversary. It was a long time since the magistrate had heard a paradox so strong, or rather, to say the truth more exactly, it was the first time he had ever heard of it. The procureur exerted himself to reply. Sir, he responded, you are a stranger, and I believe you say yourself that a portion of your life has been spent in oriental countries, so you are not aware how human justice, so expeditions in barbarous countries, takes with us a prudent and well-studied course. Oh, yes, yes, I do, sir. It is the pide claudo of the ancients. I know all that, for it is with the justice of all countries, especially, that I have occupied myself. It is with the criminal procedure of all nations that I have compared natural justice, and I must say, sir, that it is the law of primitive nations, that is, the law of retaliation, that I have most frequently found to be according to the law of God. If this law were adopted, sir, said the procureur, it would greatly simplify our legal codes and in that case the magistrates would not, as you just observed, have much to do. It may, perhaps, come to this in time, observed Monte Cristo. You know that human inventions march from the complex to the simple, and simplicity is always perfection. In the meanwhile, continued the magistrate, our codes are in full force, with all their contradictory enactments derived from Gallic customs, Roman laws, and frank usages, the knowledge of all which, you will agree, is not to be acquired without extended labor. It needs tedious study to acquire this knowledge, and, when acquired, a strong power of brain to retain it. I agree with you entirely, sir, but all that even you know with respect to the French code, I know, not only in reference to that code, but as regards the codes of all nations, the English, Turkish, Japanese, Hindu laws, are as familiar to me as the French laws, and thus I was right when I said to you that relatively, you know that everything is relative, sir, that relatively to what I have done you have very little to do, but that relatively to all I have learned you have yet a great deal to learn. But with what motive have you learned all this? inquired Villefort in astonishment. Monte Cristo smiled. Really, sir, he observed, I see that in spite of the reputation which you have acquired as a superior man, you look at everything from the material and vulgar view of society, beginning with man and ending with man, that is to say, in the most restricted, most narrow view which it is possible for human understanding to embrace. Pray, sir, explain yourself, said Villefort, more and more astonished. I really do not understand you perfectly. I say, sir, that with the eyes fixed on the social organization of nations, you see only the springs of the machine, and lose sight of the sublime and lose sight of the sublime workmen who makes them act. I say that you do not recognize before you and around you any but those office holders whose commissions have been signed by a minister or king, and that the men whom God has put above those office holders, ministers, and kings, by giving them a mission to follow out, instead of a post to fill, 
I say that they escape your narrow, limited field of, of observation. It is thus that human weakness fails, from its debilitated and imperfect organs. Tobias took the angel, who restored him to light for an ordinary young man. The nations took Attila, who was doomed to destroy them for a conqueror similar to other conquerors, and it was necessary for both to reveal their missions, that they might be known and acknowledged. One was compelled to say, I am the angel of the Lord, and the other, I am the hammer of God, in order that the divine essence in both might be revealed. Then, said Villefort, more and more amazed, and really supposing he was speaking to a mystic or a madman, you consider yourself as one of those extraordinary beings whom you have mentioned? And why not? said Monte Cristo coldly. Your pardon, sir, replied Villefort, quite astounded. But you will excuse me if, when I presented myself to you, I was unaware that I should meet with a person whose knowledge and understanding so far surpass the usual knowledge and understanding of man. It is not usual with us corrupted wretches of civilization to find gentlemen like yourself, possessors, as you are, of immense fortune, at least so it is said, and I beg you to observe that I do not inquire, I merely repeat. It is not usual, I say, for such privileged and wealthy beings to waste their time in speculations on the state of society, in philosophical reveries intended at best to console those whom fate has disinherited from the goods of this world. Really, sir, retorted the count, have you attained the eminent situation in which you are without having admitted or even without having met with exceptions? And do you never use your eyes, which must have acquired so much finesse and certainty, to divine at a glance the kind of man by whom you are confronted? Should not a magistrate be not merely the best administrator of the law, but the most crafty expounder of the chicanery of his profession, a steel probe to search hearts, a touchstone to try the gold, which in each soul is mingled with more or less of alloy. Sir, said Villefort, upon my word you overcome me. I really never heard a person speak as you do. Because you remain eternally encircled in a round of general conditions, and have never dared to raise your wings into those upper spheres which God has peopled with invisible or exceptional beings. And you allow then, sir, that spheres exist, and that these marked and invisible beings mingle amongst us. Why should they not? Can you see the air you breathe, and yet without which you could not for a moment exist? Then we do not see those beings to whom you allude. Yes, we do. You see them whenever God pleases to allow them to assume a material form. You touch them, come in contact with them, speak to them, and they reply to you. Ah, said Villefort, smiling, I confess I should like to be warned when one of those beings is in contact with me. You have been served as you desire, monsieur, for you were warned just now, and I now again warn you. Then you yourself are one of those marked beings? Yes, monsieur, I believe so, for until now no man has found himself in a position similar to mine. The dominions of kings are limited either by mountains or rivers, or a change of manners, or an alteration of language. My kingdom is bound only by the world, for I am not an Italian, or a Frenchman, or a Hindu, or an American, or a Spaniard. I am a cosmopolite. No country can say it saw my birth. God alone knows what country will see me die. I adapt all customs, speak all languages. You believe me to be a Frenchman, for I speak French with the same facility and purity as yourself. Well, Ali, my Nubian, believes me to be an Arab. Bertuccio, my steward, takes me for a Roman. Haiti, my slave, thinks me a Greek. You may, therefore, comprehend that being of no country, asking no protection from any government, acknowledging no man as my brother, not one of the scruples that arrest the powerful, or the obstacles which paralyze the weak, paralyzes or arrests me. I have only two adversaries. I will not say two conquerors, for with perseverance I subdue even them. They are time and distance. 
There is a third, and the most terrible, that is my condition as a mortal being. This alone can stop me in my onward career, before I have attained the goal at which I aim, for all the rest I have reduced to mathematical terms. What men call the chances of fate, namely, ruin, change, circumstances, I have fully anticipated, and if any of these should overtake me, yet it will not overwhelm me. Unless I die, I shall always be what I am, and therefore it is that I utter the things you have never heard, even from the mouth of kings. For kings have need, and other persons have fear of you. For who is there who does not say to himself, in a society as incongruously organized as ours, perhaps some day I shall have to do with the king's attorney? But can you not say that, sir? The moment you become an inhabitant of France, you are naturally subjected to the French law. I know it, sir, replied Monte Cristo, but when I visit a country I begin to study, by all the means which are available, the men from whom I may have anything to hope or to fear, till I know them as well as, perhaps, better than, they know themselves. It follows from this, that the king's attorney, be he who he may, with whom I should have to deal, would assuredly be more embarrassed than I should. That is to say, replied Villefort with hesitation, that human nature being weak, every man, according to your creed, has committed faults. Faults or crimes, responded Monte Cristo with a negligent air. And that you alone, amongst the men whom you do not recognize as your brothers, for you have said so, observed Villefort in a tone that faltered somewhat, you alone are perfect. No, not perfect was the Count's reply. Only impenetrable, that's all. But let us leave off this strain, sir, if the tone of it is displeasing to you. I am no more disturbed by your justice than are you by my second sight. No, no, by no means, said Villefort, who was afraid of seeming to abandon his grounds. No, by your brilliant and almost sublime conversation you have elevated me above the ordinary level. We no longer talk, we rise to dissertation. But you know how the theologians, in their collegiate chairs, and philosophers in their controversies, occasionally say cruel truth. Let us suppose for the moment that we are theologizing in a social way, or even philosophically, and I will say to you, rude as it may seem, my brother, you sacrifice greatly to pride. You may be above others, but above you there is God. Above us all, sir, was Monte Cristo's response, in a tone and with an emphasis so deep that Villefort involuntarily shuddered. I have my pride for man, serpents always ready to threaten everyone who would pass without crushing them underfoot. But I lay aside that pride before God, who has taken me from nothing to make me what I am. Then, Count, I admire you said Villefort, who, for the first time in this strange conversation, used the aristocratic form to the unknown personage whom until now he had only called Monsieur. Yes, and I say to you, if you are really strong, really superior, really pious or impenetrable, which you were right in saying amounts to the same thing, then be proud, sir, for that is the characteristic of predominance. Yet, you have unquestionably some ambition. I have, sir. And what may it be? I too, as happens to every man once in his life, have been taken by Saturn into the highest mountain in the earth, and when there he showed me all the kingdoms of the world, and as he said before, so said he to me, Child of earth, what wouldst thou have to make thee adore me? I reflected long, for a gnaving ambition had long preyed upon me, and then I replied, Listen, I have always heard of Providence, and yet I have never seen him, or anything that resembles him, or which can make me believe that he exists. I wish to be Providence myself, for I feel that the most beautiful, noblest, most sublime thing in the world is to recompense and punish. Saturn bowed his head and groaned. You mistake, he said. 
Providence does exist. Only you have never seen him, because the child of God is as invisible as the parent. You have seen nothing that resembles him, because he works by secret springs, and moves by hidden ways. All I can do for you is to make you one of the agents of that providence. The bargain was concluded. I may sacrifice my soul. But what matters it? added Monte Cristo. If the thing were to do again, I would again do it. Villefort looked at Monte Cristo with extreme amazement. Count, he inquired, have you any relations? No, sir, I am alone in the world. So much the worse. Why? asked Monte Cristo. Because then you might witness a spectacle calculated to break down your pride. You say you fear nothing but death? I did not say that I feared it. I only said that death alone could check the execution of my plans. And old age? My end will be achieved before I grow old. And madness? I have been nearly mad, and you know the axiom, non bis in idem. It is an axiom of criminal law, and, consequently, you understand its full application. Sir, continued Villefort, there is something to fear besides death, old age, and madness. For instance, there is apoplexy, that lightning stroke which strikes but does not destroy you, and yet which brings everything to an end. You are still yourself as now, and yet you are yourself no longer. You who, like Ariel, verge on the angelic, are but an inert mass, which, like Caliban, verges on the brutal. And this is called, in human tongues, as I tell you, neither more nor less than apoplexy. Come, if so you will, Count, and continue this conversation at my house, any day you may be willing to see an adversary capable of understanding and anxious to refute you, and I will show you my father, Mr. Noirtier de Villefort, one of the most fiery Jacobins of the French Revolution, that is to say, he had the most remarkable audacity, seconded by a most powerful organization, a man who has not, perhaps, like yourself, seen all the kingdoms of the earth, but who has helped to overturn one of the greatest, in fact, a man who believed himself, like you, one of the envoys, not of God, but of a supreme being, not of providence, but of fate. Well, sir, the rupture of a blood vessel on the lobe of the brains has destroyed all this, not in a day, not in an hour, but in a second. Mr. Noirtier, who, on the previous night, was the old Jacobin, the old senator, the old Carbonero, laughing at the guillotine, the cannon, and the dagger, Mr. Noirtier, playing with revolutions, Mr. Noirtier, for whom France was a vast chessboard, from which pawns, rooks, knights, and queens were to disappear, so that the king was checkmated. Mr. Noirtier, the redoubtable, was the next morning poor Mr. Noirtier, the helpless old man, at the tender mercies of the weakest creature in the household, that is, his grandchild, Valentine. A damp and frozen carcass, in fact, living painlessly on, that time may be given for his frame to decompose without his consciousness of its decay. Alas, sir, said Monte Cristo, this spectacle is neither strange to my eye nor my thought. I am something of the physician, and have, like my fellows, thought more than once for the soul in living and in dead matter. Yet, like providence, it has remained invisible to my eyes, although present to my heart. A hundred writers since Socrates, Seneca, St. Augustine, and Gaul, have made, in verse and prose, the comparison you have made, and yet I can well understand that a father's sufferings may effect great changes in the mind of a son. I will call on you, sir, since you bid me contemplate, for the advantage of my pride, this terrible spectacle, which must have been so great a source of sorrow to your family. It would have been so unquestionably, had not God given me so large a compensation. In contrast with the old man, who is dragging his way to the tomb, are two children just entering into life. Valentine, the daughter by my first wife, Mademoiselle René de saint Meran, and Edward, the boy whose life you have this day saved. And what is your deduction from this compensation, sir? inquired Monte Cristo. My deduction is, replied Villefort, that my father, led away by his passions, 
has committed some fault unknown to human justice, but marked by the justice of God, that God, desirous in his mercy, to punish but one person, has visited this justice on him alone. Monte Cristo, with a smile on his lips, uttered in the depths of his soul a groan, which would have made Villefort fly had he but heard it. Adieu, sir, said the magistrate, who had risen from his seat. I leave you, bearing a remembrance of you, a remembrance of esteem, which I hope will not be disagreeable to you when you know me better, for I am not a man to bore my friends, as you will learn. Besides, you have made an eternal friend of Madame de Villefort. The Count bowed and contented himself with seeing Villefort to the door of his cabinet, the procureur being escorted to his carriage by two footmen, who, on a signal from their master, followed him with every mark of attention. When he had gone, Monte Cristo breathed a profound sigh, and said, Enough of this poison, let me now seek the antidote. Then, sounding his bell, he said to Ali, who entered, I am going to Madame's chamber. Have the carriage ready at one o'clock. End of chapter 48「私は LibriVox のことを知っているのです。私は 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 LibriVox or rather old acquaintances of the Count of Monte Cristo, residing in the Rue Meslay, were no other than Maximilian, Julie, and Emmanuel, the very anticipations of delight to be enjoyed in his forthcoming visits, the bright, pure gleam of heavenly happiness it diffused over the almost deadly warfare in which he had voluntarily engaged, illumined his whole countenance with a look of ineffable joy and calmness. As, immediately after Villefort's departure, his thoughts flew back to the cheering prospect before him, of tasting at least a brief respite from the fierce and stormy passions of his mind. Even Ali, who had hastened to obey the Count's summons, went forth from his master's presence in charmed amazement at the unusual animation and pleasure depicted on features ordinarily so stern and cold. while, as though dreading to put to flight the agreeable ideas hovering over his patron's meditations, whatever they were, the faithful Nubian walked on tiptoe toward the door, holding his breath, lest its faintest sound should dissipate his master's happy revelry. It was noon, and Monte Cristo had set apart one hour to be passed in the apartments of Haiti. as though his oppressed spirit could not all at once admit the feeling of pure and unmixed joy, but required a gradual succession of calm and gentle emotions to prepare his mind to receive full and perfect happiness, in the same manner as ordinary natures demand to be inured by degrees to the reception of strong or violent sensations. The young Greek, as we have already said, occupied apartments wholly unconnected with those of the Count. The rooms had been fitted up in strict accordance with Oriental ideas. The floors were covered with the richest carpets Turkey could produce. The halls hung with brocaded silk of the most magnificent designs and texture, while around each chamber luxurious divans were placed with piles of soft and yielding cushions that needed only to be arranged at the pleasure or convenience of such as sought repose, Haiti, and three French maids, and one who was a Greek. The first three remained constantly in a small waiting room, ready to obey the summons of a small golden bell, or to receive the orders of the Romaic slave. who knew just enough French to be able to transmit her mistress's wishes to the three other waiting women. The latter had received most peremptory instructions from Monte Cristo to treat Haiti with all the deference they would observe to a queen. 
The young girl herself generally passed her time in the chamber at the farther end of her apartments. This was a sort of boudoir, circular, and lighted only from the roof, which consisted of rose-colored glass. Haiti was reclining upon soft downy cushions covered with blue satin, spotted with silver. Her head, supported by one of her exquisitely molded arms, rested on the divan immediately behind her, while the other was employed in adjusting to her lips the coral tube of a rich nargyle, through whose flexible pipe she drew the smoke fragrant by its passage through perfumed water. Her attitude, though perfectly natural for an Eastern woman, would, in a European, have been deemed too full of coquettish straining after effect. Her dress, which was that of the woman of Epirus, consisted of a pair of white satin trousers embroidered with pink roses, displaying feet so exquisitely formed and so delicately fair that they might well have been taken for Parian marble, had not the eye been undeceived by their movements as they constantly shifted in and out of a pair of little slippers with upturned toes, beautifully ornamented with gold and pearls. She wore a blue and white striped vest with long open sleeves, trimmed with silver loops and buttons of pearls, and a sort of bodice which, closing only from the center to the waist, exhibited the whole of the ivory throat and upper part of the bosom. It was fastened with three magnificent diamond clasps. The junction of the bodice and drawers was entirely concealed by one of the many colored scarves whose brilliant hues and rich silken fringe have rendered them so precious in the eyes of the Parisian belles. Tilted on one side of her head, she had a small cap of gold-colored silk, embroidered with pearls, while on the other a purple rose mingled its glowing colors with the luxuriant masses of her hair, of which the blackness was so intense that it was tinged with blue. The extreme beauty of the countenance that shone forth in loveliness that mocked the vain attempts of dress to augment it was particularly and purely Grecian. There were the large, dark, melting eyes, the finely formed nose, the coral lips, the pearly teeth that belonged to her race and country. And, to complete the whole, Haiti was in the very springtide and fullness of youthful charms. She had not yet numbered more than twenty summers. Monte Cristo summoned the Greek attendant, and bade her inquire whether it would be agreeable to her mistress to receive his visit. Hades' only reply was to direct her servant by a sign to withdraw the tapestried curtain that hung before the door of her boudoir. The framework of the opening thus made serving as a sort of border to the graceful tableau presented by the young girl's picturesque attitude and appearance. As Monte Cristo approached, she leaned upon the elbow of the arm that held the nargyle, and extended to him her other hand, said, with a smile of captivating sweetness, in the sonorous language spoken by the women of Athens and Sparta, Why demand permission ere you enter? Are you no longer my master? Or have I ceased to be your slave? Monte Cristo returned her smile. Haiti, he said, you well know. Why do you address me so coldly, so distantly? asked the young Greek. Have I by any means displeased you? Oh, if so, punish me as you will. But do not, do not speak to me in tones and manners so formal and constrained. Haiti, replied the Count, you know that you are now in France, and are free. Free to do what? asked the young girl. Free to leave me. Leave you? Why should I leave you? That is not for me to say, but we are now about to mix in society, to visit and be visited. I don't wish to see anybody but you. And should you see one whom you could prefer, I would not be so unjust. I have never seen any one I prefer to you, and I have never loved any one but you and my father. 
"'My poor child,' replied Monte Cristo, "'that is merely because your father and myself are the only men who have ever talked to you. "'I don't want anybody else to talk to me. "'My father said I was his joy. "'You style me as your love, and both of you have called me my child.' "'Do you remember your father, Haiti?' the young Greek smiled. "'He is here and here.' said she, touching her eyes and her heart. "'And where am I?' inquired Monte Cristo laughingly. "'You!' she cried, with tones of thrilling tenderness. "'You are everywhere!' Monte Cristo took the delicate hand of the young girl in his, and was about to raise it to his lips, when the simple child of nature hastily withdrew it, and presented her cheek. "'You now understand, Haiti," said the Count, "'that from this moment... You are absolutely free, that here you exercise unlimited sway, and are at liberty to lay aside or continue the custom of your country, as it may suit your inclination. Within this mansion you are absolute mistress of your actions, and may go abroad or remain in your apartments as may seem most agreeable to you. A carriage waits your orders, and Ali and Mithro will accompany you wheresoever you desire to go. There is but one favor I would entreat of you. Speak. Guard carefully the secret of your birth. Make no allusion to the past, nor upon any occasion be induced to pronounce the names of your illustrious father or ill-fated mother. I have already told you, my lord, that I shall see no one. It is possible, Haiti, that so perfect a seclusion though comfortable with the habits and customs of the East, may not be practicable in Paris. Endeavor, then, to accustom yourself to our manner of living in these northern climes, as you did to those of Rome, Florence, Milan, and Madrid. It may be useful to you, one of these days, whether you remain here or return to the East. The young girl raised her tearful eyes towards Monte Cristo, as she said with touching earnestness, "'Whether we return to the East, you mean to say, my lord, do you not?' "'My child,' returned Monte Cristo, "'you know full well that whenever we part, it will be no fault or wish of mine. The tree forsakes not the flower, the flower falls from the tree.' "'My lord,' replied Haiti, I never will leave you, for I am sure I cannot exist without you. My poor girl, in ten years I shall be old, and you will be still young. My father had a long white beard, but I loved him. He was sixty years old, but to me he was handsomer than all the fine youths I saw. Then tell me, Haiti, do you believe you shall be able to accustom yourself to our present mode of life? Shall I see you? Every day. Then what do you fear, my lord? You might find it dull. No, my lord. In the morning I shall rejoice in the prospect of your coming, and in the evening dwell with delight on the happiness I have enjoyed in your presence. Then, too, when alone, I can call forth mighty pictures of the past, see vast horizons bounded only by the towering mountains of Pindas and Olympus. Oh, believe me, that when three great passions, such as sorrow, love, and gratitude, fill the heart, Inouye can find no place. You are a worthy daughter of Epirus, Haiti, and your charming and poetical ideas prove well your descent from the race of goddesses who claim your country as their birthplace. Depend on my care to see that your youth is not blighted, or suffered to pass away in ungenial solitude, and of this be well assured that if you love me as a father, I love you as a child. You are wrong, my lord. The love I have for you is very different from the love I had for my father. My father died, but I did not die. If you were to die, I should die too. The Count, with a smile of profound tenderness, extended his hand, and she carried it to her lips. Monte Cristo thus attuned to the interview he proposed to hold with Morel and his family, departed, murmuring as he went these lines of Pindar. 
Youth is a flower of which love is the fruit. Happy is he who, after having watched its silent growth, is permitted to gather and call it his own. The carriage was prepared according to orders, and stepping lightly into it, the Count drove off at his usual rapid pace. End of chapter 49 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, Chapter 50, The Moral Family. In a very few minutes, the Count reached number seven in the Rue Meslay. The house was of white stone, and in a small court before it were two small beds full of beautiful flowers. In the concierge that opened the gate, the Count recognized Cockles. But as he had but one eye, and that eye had become somewhat dim in the course of nine years, Cockles did not recognize the Count. The carriages that drove up to the door were compelled to turn, to avoid a fountain that played in a basin of rockwork, an ornament that had excited the jealousy of the whole quarter, and had gained for the place the appellation of the Little Versailles. It is needless to add that there were gold and silver fish in the basin. The house, with kitchens and cellars below, had above the ground floor two stories and attics. The whole of the property, consisting of an immense workshop, two pavilions at the bottom of the garden, and the garden itself, had been purchased by Emmanuel, who had seen at a glance that he could make of it a profitable speculation. He had reserved the house and half the garden, and building a wall between the garden and the workshops, had let them upon lease with the pavilions at the bottom of the garden so that for a trifling sum he was as well lodged and as perfectly shut out from observation as the inhabitants of the finest mansion in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. The breakfast room was finished in oak, the salon in mahogany, and the furnishings were of blue velvet. The bedroom was in citron wood and green damask. There was a study for Emmanuel, who never studied, and a music room for Julie, who never played. The whole of the second story was set apart for Maximilian. It was precisely similar to his sister's apartments, except that for the breakfast parlor he had a billiard room, where he received his friends. He was superintending the grooming of his horse, and smoking his cigar at the entrance of the garden, when the Count's carriage stopped at the gate. Cockles opened the gate, and Baptistine, springing from the box, inquired whether Monsieur and Madame Herbeau and Monsieur Maximilian Morel would see His Excellency the Count of Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo, cried Morel, throwing away his cigar and hastening to the carriage. I should think we would see him. Ah, a thousand thanks, Count, for not having forgotten your promise. And the young officer shook the Count's hand so warmly that Monte Cristo could not be mistaken as to the sincerity of his joy, and he saw that he had been expected with impatience and was received with pleasure. Come, come, said Maximilian, I will serve as your guide. Such a man as you are ought not to be introduced by a servant. My sister is in the garden plucking the dead roses. My brother is reading his two papers, the press and the debats, within six steps of her. For wherever you see Madame Herbeau, you have only to look within a circle of four yards and you will find Monsieur Emmanuel, and reciprocally, as they say at the Polytechnic School. At the sound of their steps, a young woman of twenty to five and twenty, dressed in a silk morning gown, and busily engaged in plucking the dead leaves off a noisette rose tree, raised her head. This was Julie, who had become, as the clerk of the house of Thompson and French had predicted, Madame Emmanuel Herbeau. She uttered a cry of surprise at the sight of a stranger, and Maximilian began to laugh. "'Don't disturb yourself, Julie,' said he. "'The Count has only been two or three days in Paris, but he already knows what a fashionable woman of the Marais is, and if he does not, you will show him.' "'Ah, monsieur,' returned Julie, "'it is treason in my brother to bring you thus, but he never has any regard for his poor sister. Penelon. Penelon, an old man who was digging busily at one of the beds, stuck his spade in the earth, and approached, cap in hand, striving to conceal a quid of tobacco he had just thrust into his cheek. A few locks of grey mingled with his hair, which was still thick and matted, while his bronzed features and determined glance well suited an old sailor who had braved the heat of the equator and the storms of the tropics. "'I think you hailed me, Mademoiselle Julie,' said he. Penelon had still preserved the habit of calling his master's daughter Mademoiselle Julie, and had never been able to change the name to Madame Herbeau. Penelon replied Julie, go and inform Monsieur Emmanuel of this gentleman's visit, and Maximilian will conduct him to the salon. Then, turning to Monte Cristo, 
I hope you will permit me to leave you for a few minutes, continued she, and without awaiting any reply, disappeared behind a clump of trees, and escaped to the house by a lateral alley. I am sorry to see, observed Monte Cristo to Moro, that I cause no small disturbance in your house. Look there, said Maximilian, laughing. There is her husband changing his jacket for a coat. I assure you, you are well known in the room, Esle. Your family appears to be a very happy one, said the Count, as if speaking to himself. Oh, yes, I assure you, Count, they want nothing that can render them happy. They are young and cheerful, they are tenderly attached to each other, and with twenty-five thousand francs a year, they fancy themselves as rich as Rothschild. Five and twenty thousand francs is not a large sum, however, replied Monte Cristo, with a tone so sweet and gentle that it went to Maximilian's heart like the voice of a father. But they will not be content with that. Your brother-in-law is a barrister, a doctor. He was a merchant, monsieur, and had succeeded to the business of my poor father. Monsieur Morel, at his death, left five hundred thousand francs, which were divided between my sister and myself, for we were his only children. Her husband, who when he married her had no other patrimony than his noble property, his first-rate ability, and his spotless reputation, wished to possess as much as his wife. He labored and toiled until he had amassed two hundred fifty thousand francs. Six years sufficed to achieve this object. Oh, I assure you, sir, it was a touching spectacle to see these young creatures, destined by their talents for higher stations, toiling together, and through their unwillingness to change any of the customs of their paternal house, taking six years to accomplish what less scrupulous people would have effected in two or three. Marseilles resounded with their well-earned praises. At last, one day, Emmanuel came to his wife, who had just finished making up the accounts. Julie, said he to her, Cockles has just given me the last rouleau of a hundred francs. That completes the two hundred fifty thousand francs we had fixed as the limits of our gains. Can you content yourself with the small fortune which we possess for the future? Listen to me. Our house transacts business to the amount of a million a year, from which we derive an income of forty thousand francs. We can dispose of the business, if we please, in an hour, for I have received a letter from Monsieur Delaunay, in which he offers to purchase the good will of the house to unite with his own for three hundred thousand francs. Advise me what I had better do. Emmanuel, returned my sister, the house of Morel can only be carried on by a Morel. Is it not worth three hundred thousand francs to save our father's name from the chances of evil fortune and failure? I thought so, replied Emmanuel, but I wish to have your advice. This is my counsel. Our accounts are made up and our bills paid. All we have to do is to stop the issue of any more and close our office. This was done instantly. It was three o'clock. At a quarter past, a merchant presented himself to insure two ships. It was a clear profit of fifteen thousand francs. Monsieur, said Emmanuel, have the goodness to address yourself to Monsieur Delaunay. We have quitted business. How long? inquired the astonished merchant. A quarter of an hour, was the reply. And this is the reason, monsieur, continued Maximilian, of my sister and brother-in-law having only twenty-five thousand francs a year. Maximilian had scarcely finished his story, during which the Count's heart had swelled within him, when Emmanuel entered wearing a hat and coat. He saluted the Count with the air of a man who was aware of the rank of his guest. Then, after having led Monte Cristo around the little garden, he returned to the house. A large vase of Japan porcelain, filled with flowers that loaded the air with their perfume, stood in the salon. Julie, suitably dressed and her hair arranged, she had accomplished this feat in less than ten minutes, received the Count on his entrance. The songs of the birds were heard in an aviary hard by, and the branches of laburnums and rose acacias formed an exquisite framework to the blue velvet curtains. Everything in this charming retreat, from the warble of the birds to the smile of the mistress, breathed tranquility and repose. The Count had felt the influence of this happiness from the moment he entered the house, and he remained silent and pensive, forgetting that he was expected to renew the conversation, which had ceased after the first salutations had been exchanged. The silence became almost painful when, by a violent effort, tearing himself from his pleasing reverie, Madame, he said at length, I pray you to excuse my emotion, which must astonish you who are only accustomed to the happiness I meet here. But contentment is so new a sight to me, that I could never be weary of looking at yourself and your husband. We are very happy, monsieur, replied Julie, but we have also known unhappiness, and few have ever undergone more bitter sufferings than ourselves. The Count's features displayed an expression of the most intense curiosity. Oh, all this is a family history, as Chateau Renaud told you the other day, observed Maximilian. 
This humble picture would have but little interest for you, accustomed as you are to behold the pleasures and the misfortunes of the wealthy and industrious. But such as we are, we have experienced bitter sorrows. And God has poured balm into your wounds, as he does into those of all who are in affliction, said Monte Cristo inquiringly. Yes, Count, returned Julie, we may indeed say he has, for he has done for us what he grants only to his chosen. He sent us one of his angels. The Count's cheeks became scarlet, and he coughed in order to have an excuse for putting his handkerchief to his mouth. Those born to wealth, and who have the means of gratifying every wish, said Emmanuel, know not what is the real happiness of life, just as those who have been tossed on the stormy waters of the ocean, on a few frail planks, can alone realize the blessings of fair weather. Monte Cristo rose, and without making any answer, for the tremulousness of his voice would have betrayed his emotion, walked up and down the apartment with a slow step. Our magnificence makes you smile, Count, said Maximilian, who had followed him with his eyes. No, no, returned Monte Cristo, pale as death, pressing one hand on his heart to still its throbbings, while with the other he pointed to a crystal cover, beneath which a silken purse lay on a black velvet cushion. I was wondering what could be the significance of this purse, with a paper at one end and the large diamond at the other. Count, replied Maximilian, with an air of gravity, those are our most precious family treasures. The stone seems very brilliant, answered the Count. Oh, my brother does not allude to its value, although it has been estimated at a hundred thousand francs. He means that the articles contained in this purse are the relics of the angel I spoke of just now. This I do not comprehend, and yet I may not ask for an explanation, madame, replied Monte Cristo, bowing. Pardon me, I had no intention of committing an indiscretion. Indiscretion? Oh, you make us happy by giving us an excuse for expatiating on this subject. If we wanted to conceal the noble action this purse commemorates, we should not expose it thus to view. Oh, would we could relate it everywhere, and to every one, so that the emotion of our unknown benefactor might reveal his presence. Ah, really, said Monte Cristo in a half-stifled voice. Monsieur, returned Maximilian, raising the glass cover, and respectfully kissing the silken purse, this has touched the hand of a man who saved my father from suicide, us from ruin, and our name from shame and disgrace. A man by whose matchless benevolence we poor children, doomed to want and wretchedness, can at present hear every one envying our happy lot. This letter, as he spoke, Maximilian drew a letter from the purse and gave it to the Count. This letter was written by him the day that my father had taken a desperate resolution, and this diamond was given by the generous unknown to my sister as her dowry. Monte Cristo opened the letter and read it with an indescribable feeling of delight. It was the letter written, as our readers know, to Julie, and signed Sinbad the Sailor. Unknown, you say, is the man who rendered you this service, unknown to you? Yes, we have never had the happiness of pressing his hand, continued Maximilian. We have supplicated heaven in vain to grant us this favor, but the whole affair has had a mysterious meaning that we cannot comprehend. We have been guided by an invisible hand, a hand as powerful as that of an enchanter. Oh, cried Julie, I have not lost all hope of some day kissing that hand, as I now kiss the purse which he has touched. Four years ago, Penelon was at Trieste. Penelon, Count, is the old sailor you saw in the garden, and who, from quartermaster, has become gardener. Penelon, when he was at Trieste, saw in the quay an Englishman, who was on the point of embarking on board a yacht, and he recognized him as the person who called on my father the 5th of June, 1829, and who wrote me this letter on the 5th of September. He felt convinced of his identity, but he did not venture to address him. An Englishman, said Monte Cristo, who grew uneasy at the attention with which Julie looked at him. An Englishman, you say? Yes, replied Maximilian, an Englishman who represented himself as the confidential clerk of the House of Thompson and French at Rome. It was this that made me start when you said the other day, at Monsieur de Morcerf's, that Messieurs Thompson and French were your bankers. That happened, as I told you, in 1829. For God's sake, tell me, did you know this Englishman? But you tell me also that the House of Thompson and French have constantly denied having rendered you this service. Yes. Then is it not probable that this Englishman may be someone who, grateful for a kindness your father had shown him, and which he himself had forgotten, has taken this method of requiting the obligation? Everything is possible in this affair, even a miracle. What was his name? asked Monte Cristo. He gave no other name, answered Julie, looking earnestly at the Count, than that at the end of his letter, Sinbad the Sailor. 
which is evidently not his real name, but a fictitious one. Then, noticing that Julie was struck with the sound of his voice, "'Tell me,' continued he, "'was he not about my height, perhaps a little taller, with his chin imprisoned, as it were, in a high cravat, his coat closely buttoned up, and constantly taking out his pencil?' "'Oh, do you know him, then?' cried Julie, whose eyes sparkled with joy. "'No,' returned Monte Cristo, "'I only guessed. I knew a Lord Wilmore who was constantly doing actions of this kind.' "'Without revealing himself? He was an eccentric being, and did not believe in the existence of gratitude.' "'Oh, heaven!' exclaimed Julie, clasping her hands. "'In what did he believe, then?' "'He did not credit it at the period which I knew him,' said Monte Cristo, touched to the heart by the accents of Julie's voice. But perhaps since then he has had proofs that gratitude does exist. And do you know this gentleman, monsieur? inquired Emmanuel. Oh, if you do know him, cried Julie, can you tell us where he is? Where we can find him? Maximilian, Emmanuel, if we do but discover him, he must believe in the gratitude of the heart. Monte Cristo felt tears start into his eyes, and he again walked hastily up and down the room. In the name of heaven, said Maximilian, if you know anything of him, tell us what it is. Alas, cried Monte Cristo, striving to repress his emotion, if Lord Wilmore was your unknown benefactor, I fear you will never see him again. I parted from him two years ago at Palermo, and he was then on the point of setting out for the most remote regions, so that I fear he will never return. Oh, monsieur, this is cruel of you, said Julie, much affected, and the young lady's eyes swam with tears. Madame, replied Monte Cristo gravely, and gazing earnestly on the two liquid pearls that had trickled down Julie's cheeks, had Lord Wilmore seen what I now see, he would become attached to life, for the tears you shed would reconcile him to mankind. And he held out his hand to Julie, who gave him hers, carried away by the look and accent of the Count. But, continued she, Lord Wilmore had a family or friends. He must have known someone. Can we not— Oh, it is useless to inquire, returned the Count. Perhaps, after all, he was not the man you seek for. He was my friend, he had no secrets from me, and if this had been so, he would have confided in me. And he told you nothing? Not a word. Nothing that would lead you to suppose? Nothing. And yet you spoke of him at once. Ah, in such a case one supposes. Sister, sister, said Maximilian, coming to the Count's aid, Monsieur is quite right. Recollect what our excellent father so often told us. It was no Englishman that thus saved us. Monte Cristo started. What did your father tell you, Monsieur Morel? he said eagerly. My father thought that this action had been miraculously performed. He believed that a benefactor had arisen from the grave to save us. Oh, it was a touching superstition, monsieur, and although I did not myself believe it, I would not for the world have destroyed my father's faith. How often he did muse over it and pronounce the name of a dear friend, a friend lost to him forever, and on his deathbed, when the near approach of eternity seemed to have illumined his mind with supernatural light, this thought which had until then been but a doubt, became a conviction, and his last words were, Maximilian, it was Edmund Dante's. At these words the Count's paleness, which had for some time been increasing, became alarming. He could not speak. He looked at his watch like a man who has forgotten the hour, said a few hurried words to Madame Herbeau, and pressing the hands of Emmanuel and Maximilian, Madame, said he, I trust you will allow me to visit you occasionally. I value your friendship and feel grateful to you for your welcome, for this is the first time for many years that I have thus yielded to my feelings, and he hastily quitted the apartment. This Count of Monte Cristo is a strange man, said Emmanuel. Yes, answered Maximilian, but I feel sure he has an excellent heart, and that he likes us. His voice went to my heart, observed Julie, and two or three times I fancied that I had heard it before. End of chapter 50「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Jaquay, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 51. Pyramus and Thisbe. About two-thirds of the way along the Faubourg saint honore and in the rear of one of the most imposing mansions in this rich neighborhood, where the various houses vie with each other for elegance of design and magnificence of construction, extended a large garden, where the wide-spreading chestnut trees raised their heads high above the walls in a solid rampart, 
and with the coming of every spring scattered a shower of delicate pink and white blossoms into the large stone vases that stood upon the two square pilasters of a curiously wrought iron gate that dated from the time of Louis the Twelfth. This noble entrance, however, in spite of its striking appearance and the graceful effect of the geraniums planted in the two vases, as they waved their variegated leaves in the wind and charmed the eye with their scarlet bloom, had fallen into utter disuse. The proprietors of the mansion had many years before thought it best to confine themselves to the possession of the house itself, with its thickly planted courtyard, opening into the Faubourg Saint-Honor, and to the garden shut in by this gate, which formerly communicated with a fine kitchen garden of about an acre. For the demon of speculation drew a line, or in other words projected a street, at the farther side of the kitchen garden. The street was laid out, a name was chosen and posted up on an iron plate, but before construction was begun, it occurred to the possessor of the property that a handsome sum might be obtained for the ground then devoted to fruits and vegetables by building along the line of the proposed street, and so making it a branch of communication with the Faubourg saint Honore itself, one of the most important thoroughfares in the city of Paris. In matters of speculation, however, though man proposes, money disposes. From some such difficulty, the newly named street died almost in birth, and the purchaser of the kitchen garden, having paid a high price for it, and being quite unable to find anyone willing to take his bargain off his hands without a considerable loss, yet still clinging to the belief that at some future day he should obtain a sum for it that would repay him, not only for his past outlay, but also the interest upon the capital locked up in his new acquisition, contented himself with letting the ground temporarily to some market gardeners at a yearly rental of 500 francs. And so, as we have said, the iron gate leading into the kitchen garden had been closed up and left to the rust, which bade fair before long to eat off its hinges, while to prevent the ignoble glances of the diggers and delvers of the ground from presuming to sully the aristocratic enclosure belonging to the mansion, the gate had been boarded up to a height of six feet. True, the planks were not so closely adjusted but that a hasty peep might be obtained through their interstices but the strict decorum and rigid propriety of the inhabitants of the house left no grounds for apprehending that advantage would be taken of that circumstance. Horticulture seemed, however, to have been abandoned in the deserted kitchen garden, and where cabbages, carrots, radishes, peas, and melons had once flourished, a scanty crop of lucerne alone bore evidence of its being deemed worthy of cultivation. A small low door gave egress from the walled space we have been describing into the projected street, the ground having been abandoned as unproductive by its various renters, and had now fallen so completely in general estimation as to return not even the one-half percent it had originally paid. Towards the house the chestnut trees we have before mentioned rose high above the wall, without in any way affecting the growth of other luxuriant shrubs and flowers that eagerly dressed forward to fill up the vacant spaces, as though asserting their right to enjoy the boon of light and air. At one corner, where the foliage became so thick as almost to shut out day, a large stone bench and sundry rustic seats indicated that this sheltered spot was either in general favor or particular use by some inhabitant of the house, which was faintly discernible through the dense mass of verdure that partially concealed it though situated but a hundred paces off. Whoever had selected this retired portion of the grounds as the boundary of a walk, or as a place for meditation, was abundantly justified in the choice by the absence of all glare, the cool refreshing shade, the screen it afforded from the scorching rays of the sun, that found no entrance there even during the burning days of hottest summer, the incessant and melodious warbling of birds, and the entire removal from either the noise of the street or the bustle of the mansion. On the evening of one of the warmest days spring had yet bestowed on the inhabitants of Paris, might be seen negligently thrown upon the stone bench a book, a parasol, and a work basket, from which hung a partly embroidered cambric handkerchief, while at a little distance from these articles was a young woman, standing close to the iron gate endeavoring to discern something on the other side by means of the openings in the planks. 
the earnestness of her attitude and the fixed gaze with which she seemed to seek the object of her wishes, proving how much her feelings were interested in the matter. At that instant the little side gate leading from the waste ground to the street was noiselessly opened, and a tall, powerful young man appeared. He was dressed in a common gray blouse and velvet cap, but his carefully arranged hair, beard, and mustache, all of the richest and glossiest black, ill accorded with his plebeian attire. After casting a rapid glance around him, in order to assure himself that he was unobserved, he entered by the small gate and, carefully closing and securing it after him, proceeded with a hurried step towards the barrier. At the sight of him she expected, though probably not in such a costume, the young woman started in terror and was about to make a hasty retreat. But the eye of love had already seen, even through the narrow chinks of the wooden palisades, the movement of the white robe, and observed the fluttering of the blue sash. Pressing his lips close to the planks, he exclaimed, "'Don't be alarmed, Valentine. It is I.' Again the timid girl found courage to return to the gate, saying, as she did so, "'And why did you come so late today? It is almost dinner-time, and I had to use no little diplomacy to get rid of my watchful mother-in-law, my too devoted maid, and my troublesome brother, who is always teasing me about coming to work at my embroidery, which I am in a fair way never to get done. So pray excuse yourself as well as you can for having made me wait, and, after that, tell me why I see you in a dress so singular that at first I did not recognize you. Dearest Valentine, said the young man, the difference between our respective stations makes me fear to offend you by speaking of my love, but yet I cannot find myself in your presence without longing to pour forth my soul and tell you how fondly I adore you. If it be but to carry away with me the recollection of such sweet moments, I could even thank you for chiding me, for it leaves me a gleam of hope that if you did not expect me, and that indeed would be worse than vanity to suppose, at least I was in your thoughts. You asked me the cause of my being late, and why I come disguised. I will candidly explain the reason of both, and I trust to your goodness to pardon me. I have chosen a trade. A trade? Oh, Maximilian, how can you jest at a time when we have such deep cause for uneasiness? Heaven keep me from jesting with that which is far dearer to me than life itself. But listen to me, Valentine, and I will tell you all about it. I became weary of ranging fields and scaling walls, and seriously alarmed at the idea suggested by you, that if caught hovering about here your father would very likely have me sent to prison as a thief. That would compromise the honor of the French army, to say nothing of the fact that the continual presence of a captain of spice in a place where no warlike projects could be supposed to account for it might well create surprise. So I have become a gardener and, consequently, adopted the costume of my calling. What excessive nonsense you talk, Maximilian! Nonsense? Pray do not call what I consider the wisest action of my life by such a name. Consider, by becoming a gardener, I effectually screen our meetings from all suspicion or danger. I beseech of you, Maximilian, to cease trifling and tell me what you really mean. Simply, that having ascertained that the piece of ground on which I stand was to let, I made application for it, was readily accepted by the proprietor, and am now master of this fine crop of lucerne. Think of that, Valentine. There is nothing now to prevent my building myself a little hut on my plantation, and residing not twenty yards from you. Only imagine what happiness that would afford me. I can scarcely contain myself at the bare idea. Such felicity seems above all price, as a thing impossible and unattainable. But would you believe that I purchase all this delight, joy, and happiness, for which I would cheerfully have surrendered ten years of my life, at the small cost of five hundred francs per annum, paid quarterly? Henceforth we have nothing to fear. I am on my own ground, and have an undoubted right to place a ladder against the wall, and to look over when I please, without having any apprehensions of being taken off by the police as a suspicious character. I may also enjoy the precious privilege of assuring you of my fond, faithful, and unalterable affection whenever you visit your favorite bower, unless, indeed, it offends your pride to listen to professions of love from the lips of a poor workman, clad in a blouse and cap." A faint cry of mingled pleasure and surprise escaped from the lips of Valentine, who almost instantly said in a saddened tone, 
as though some envious cloud darkened the joy which illumined her heart. Alas, no, Maximilian, this must not be, for many reasons. We should presume too much on our own strength, and, like others, perhaps, be led astray by our blind confidence in each other's prudence. How can you for an instant entertain so unworthy a thought, dear Valentine? Have I not, from the first blessed hour of our acquaintance, schooled all my words and actions to your sentiments and ideas? And you have, I am sure, the fullest confidence in my honor. When you spoke to me of experiencing a vague and indefinite sense of coming danger, I placed myself blindly and devotedly at your service, asking no other reward than the pleasure of being useful to you. And have I ever since, by word or look, given you cause of regret for having selected me from the numbers that would willingly have sacrificed their lives for you? You told me, my dear Valentine, that you were engaged to Monsieur Depinay, and that your father was resolved upon completing the match, and that from his will there was no appeal, as Monsieur de Villefort was never known to change a determination once formed. I kept in the background as you wished, and waited, not for the decision of your heart or my own, but hoping that Providence would graciously interpose in our behalf, and order events in our favor. But what cared I for delays or difficulties, Valentine, as long as you confessed that you loved me and took pity on me? If you will only repeat that avowal now and then, I can endure anything. Ah, Maximilian, that is the very thing that makes you so bold, and which renders me at once so happy and unhappy, that I frequently ask myself whether it is better for me to endure the harshness of my mother-in-law and her blind preference for her own child, or to be, as I now am, insensible to any pleasure save such as I find in these meetings, so fraught with danger to both. I will not admit that word, returned the young man. It is at once cruel and unjust. Is it possible to find a more submissive slave than myself? You have permitted me to converse with you from time to time, Valentine, but forbidden my ever following you in your walks or elsewhere. Have I not obeyed? And since I found means to enter this enclosure, to exchange a few words with you through this gate, to be close to you without really seeing you, have I ever asked so much as to touch the hem of your gown, or tried to pass this barrier which is but a trifle to one of my youth and strength? Never has a complaint or a murmur escaped me. I have been bound by my promises as rigidly as any knight of olden times. Come, come, dearest Valentine, confess that what I say is true, lest I be tempted to call you unjust. It is true, said Valentine, as she passed the end of her slender fingers through a small opening in the planks, and permitted Maximilian to press his lips to them. And you are a true and faithful friend, but still you acted from motives of self-interest, my dear Maximilian. For you well knew that from the moment in which you had manifested an opposite spirit, all would have been ended between us. You promised to bestow on me the friendly affection of a brother. For I have no friend but yourself on earth, who am neglected and forgotten by my father, harassed and persecuted by my mother-in-law, and left to the sole companionship of a paralyzed and speechless old man, whose withered hand can no longer press mine, and who can speak to me with the eye alone although there still lingers in his heart the warmest tenderness for his poor grandchild. Oh, how bitter a fate is mine, to serve either as a victim or an enemy to all who are stronger than myself, while my only friend and supporter is a living corpse. Indeed, indeed, Maximilian, I am very miserable, and if you love me it must be out of pity. Valentine, replied the young man, deeply affected, I will not say you are all I love in the world, for I dearly prize my sister and brother-in-law, but my affection for them is calm and tranquil, in no manner resembling what I feel for you. When I think of you, my heart beats fast, the blood burns in my veins, and I can hardly breathe. But I solemnly promise you to restrain all this ardor, this fervor and intensity of feeling, until you yourself shall require me to render them available in serving or assisting you. Monsieur Franz is not expected to return home for a year to come, I am told. In that time many favorable and unforeseen chances may befriend us. Let us then hope for the best. Hope is so sweet a comforter. Meanwhile, Valentine, while reproaching me with selfishness, think a little what you have been to me, the beautiful but cold resemblance of a marble Venus. What promise of future reward have you made me for all the submission and obedience I have evinced? None whatever. What granted me? Scarcely more. 
You tell me of Monsieur Franz Stepinet, your betrothed lover, and you shrink from the idea of being his wife. But tell me, Valentine, is there no other sorrow in your heart? You see me devoted to you, body and soul, my life and each warm drop that circles round my heart are consecrated to your service. You know full well that my existence is bound up in yours, that were I to lose you, I would not outlive the hour of such crushing misery. Yet you speak with calmness of the prospect of your being the wife of another. O oh, Valentine, were I in your place, and did I feel conscious, as you do, of being worshipped, adored, with such a love as mine, a hundred times at least should I have passed my hand between these iron bars, and said, Take this hand, dearest Maximilian, and believe that, living or dead, I am yours, yours only and forever. The poor girl made no reply, but her lover could plainly hear her sobs and tears. A rapid change took place in the young man's feelings. Dearest, dearest Valentine, exclaimed he, forgive me if I have offended you, and forget the words I spoke if they have unwittingly caused you pain. No, Maximilian, I am not offended, answered she. But do you not see what a poor, helpless being I am, almost a stranger and an outcast in my father's house, where even he is seldom seen? whose will has been thwarted, and spirits broken from the age of ten years, beneath the iron rod so sternly held over me, oppressed, mortified, and persecuted day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. No person has cared for, even observed my sufferings, nor have I ever breathed one word on the subject save to yourself. Outwardly and in the eyes of the world I am surrounded by kindness and affection, but the reverse is the case. The general remark is, Oh, it cannot be expected that one of so stern a character as Monsieur Villefort could lavish the tenderness some fathers do on their daughters. What though she has lost her own mother at a tender age, she has had the happiness to find a second mother in Madame de Villefort. The world, however, is mistaken. My father abandons me from utter indifference, while my mother-in-law detests me with a hatred so much the more terrible because it is veiled beneath a continual smile. Hate you, sweet Valentine, exclaimed the young man. How is it possible for anyone to do that? Alas, replied the weeping girl, I am obliged to own that my mother-in-law's aversion to me arises from a very natural source, her overweening love for her own child, my brother Edward. But why should it? I do not know. But though unwilling to introduce money matters into our present conversation, I will just say this much that her extreme dislike to me has its origin there, and I much fear she envies me the fortune I enjoy right of my mother, and which will be more than doubled at the death of Monsieur and Madame de saint Marin, whose sole heiress I am. Madame de Villefort has nothing of her own, and hates me for being so richly endowed. Alas, how gladly would I exchange the half of this wealth for the happiness of at least sharing my father's love. God knows I would prefer sacrificing the whole so that it would obtain me a happy and affectionate home. Poor Valentine! I seem to myself as though living a life of bondage, yet at the same time am so conscious of my own weakness that I fear to break the restraint in which I am held, lest I fall utterly helpless. Then, too, my father is not a person whose orders may be infringed with impunity. Protected as he is by his high position and firmly established reputation for talent and unswerving integrity, no one could oppose him. He is all-powerful even with the king. He would crush you at a word. Dear Maximilian, believe me when I assure you that if I do not attempt to resist my father's commands, it is more on your account than my own. But why, Valentine, do you persist in anticipating the worst? Why picture so gloomy a future? because I judge it from the past. Still, consider that, although I may not be, strictly speaking, what is termed an illustrious match for you, I am, for many reasons, not altogether so much beneath your alliance. The days when such distinctions were so nicely weighed and considered no longer exist in France, and the first families of the monarchy have intermarried with those of the empire. The aristocracy of the lands has allied itself with the nobility of the canon. Now I belong to this last-named class, and certainly my prospects of military preferment are most encouraging as well as certain. My fortune, though small, is free and unfettered, 
and the memory of my late father is respected in our country, Valentine, as that of the most upright and honorable merchant of the city. I say our country because you were born not far from Marseilles. Don't speak of Marseilles. I beg of you, Maximilian. That one word brings back my mother to my recollection, my angel mother who died too soon for myself and all who knew her, but who, after watching over her child during the brief period allotted to her in this world, now, I fondly hope, watches from her home in heaven. Oh, if my mother were still living, there would be nothing to fear, Maximilian, for I would tell her that I loved you, and she would protect us. I fear, Valentine, replied the lover, that were she living, I should never have had the happiness of knowing you. You would then have been too happy to have stooped from your grandeur to bestow a thought on me. Now it is you who are unjust, Maximilian, cried Valentine. But there is one thing I wish to know. And what is that? inquired the young man, perceiving that Valentine hesitated. Tell me truly, Maximilian, whether in former days, when our fathers dwelt at Marseilles, there was ever any misunderstanding between them. Not that I am aware of, replied the young man, unless, indeed, any ill feeling might have arisen from their being of opposite parties. Your father was, as you know, a zealous partisan of the Bourbons, while mine was wholly devoted to the Emperor. There could not possibly be any other difference between them, but why do you ask? I will tell you, replied the young girl, for it is but right you should know. Well, on the day when your appointment as an officer of the Legion of Honor was announced in the papers, we were all sitting with my grandfather, Monsieur Nortier. Monsieur Danglars was there also. You recollect Monsieur Danglars, do you not, Maximilian, the banker, whose horses ran away with my mother-in-law and little brother and very nearly killed them? While the rest of the company were discussing the approaching marriage of Mademoiselle Danglars, I was reading the paper to my grandfather, but when I came to the paragraph about you, although I had done nothing else but read it over to myself all the morning, you know you had told me all about it the previous evening, I felt so happy and yet so nervous at the idea of speaking your name aloud, and before so many people, that I really think I should have passed it over, but for the fear that my doing so might create suspicions as to the cause of my silence. So I summoned up all my courage and read it as firmly and as steadily as I could. Dear Valentine, well, would you believe it? Directly my father caught the sound of your name, he turned round quite hastily, and, like a poor silly thing, I was so persuaded that everyone must be as much affected as myself by the utterance of your name, that I was not surprised to see my father start, and almost tremble, but I even thought, though that surely must have been a mistake, that Monsieur Danglars trembled too. Moral, moral, cried my father, stop a bit. Then knitting his brows into a deep frown, he added, Surely this cannot be one of the moral family who lived at Marseilles, and gave us so much trouble from their violent Bonapartism, I mean, about the year 1815. Yes, replied Monsieur Danglars, I believe he is the son of the old shipowner. Indeed, answered Maximilian, and what did your father say then, Valentine? Oh, such a dreadful thing that I don't dare to tell you. Always tell me everything, said Maximilian with a smile. Ah, continued my father, still frowning, their idolized emperor treated these madmen as they deserved. He called them food for powder, which was precisely all they were good for, and I am delighted to see that the present government have adopted this salutary principle with all its pristine vigor. If Algiers were good for nothing but to furnish the means of carrying so admirable an idea into practice, it would be an acquisition well worthy of struggling to obtain, though it certainly does cost France somewhat dear to assert her rights in that uncivilized country. Brutal politics, I must confess, said Maximilian, but don't attach any serious importance, dear, to what your father said. My father was not a bit behind yours in that sort of talk. Why, said he, does not the emperor, who has devised so many clever and efficient modes of improving the art of war, organize a regiment of lawyers, judges, and legal practitioners, sending them in the hottest fire the enemy could maintain, and using them to save better men? You see, my dear, that for picturesque expression and generosity of spirit there is not much to choose between the language of either party. But what did M. Dangler say to this outburst on the part of the procureur? Oh, he laughed, and in that singular manner so peculiar to himself, half malicious, half ferocious, he almost immediately got up and took his leave. 
Then, for the first time, I observed the agitation of my grandfather, and I must tell you, Maximilian, that I am the only person capable of discerning emotion in his paralyzed frame. And I suspected that the conversation that had been carried on in his presence, for they always say and do what they like before the dear old man without the smallest regard for his feelings, had made a strong impression on his mind, for, naturally enough, it must have pained him to hear the emperor he so devotedly loved and served spoken of in that depreciating manner. The name of Monsieur Nortier, interposed Maximilian, is celebrated throughout Europe. He was a statesman of high standing, and you may or may not know, Valentine, that he took a leading part in every Bonapartist conspiracy set on foot during the restoration of the Bourbons. Oh, I have often heard whispers of such things that seem to me most strange. The father a Bonapartist, the son a Royalist? What can have been the reason of so singular a difference in parties and politics? But, to resume my story, I turned towards my grandfather, as though to question him as to the cause of his emotion. He looked expressively at the newspaper I had been reading. What is the matter, dear grandfather? said I. Are you pleased? He gave me a sign in the affirmative. With what my father said just now, he returned a sign in the negative. Perhaps you liked what Monsieur Danglars said. Another sign in the negative. Oh, then you were glad to hear that Monsieur Morel, I didn't dare to say Maximilian, had been made an officer of the Legion of Honor? He signified assent. Only think of the poor old man's being so pleased to think that you, who were a perfect stranger to him, had been made an officer of the Legion of Honor. Perhaps it was a mere whim on his part, for he is falling, they say, into second childhood, but I love him for showing so much interest in you. How singular, murmured Maximilian. Your father hates me, while your grandfather, on the contrary? What strange feelings are aroused by politics? Hush! cried Valentine suddenly. Someone is coming. Maximilian leaped at one bound into his crop of lucerne, which he began to pull up in the most ruthless way, under the pretext of being occupied in weeding it. Mademoiselle! Mademoiselle! exclaimed a voice from behind the trees. Madame is searching for you everywhere. There is a visitor in the drawing-room. A visitor? inquired Valentine, much agitated. Who is it? Some grand personage, a prince, I believe they said, the Count of Monte Cristo. I will come directly, cried Valentine aloud. The name of Monte Cristo sent an electric shock through the young man on the other side of the iron gate, to whom Valentine's I am coming was the customary signal of farewell. Now then, said Maximilian, leading on the handle of his spade, I would give a good deal to know how it comes about that the Count of Monte Cristo is acquainted with Monsieur de Villefort. End of chapter 51